Book 4 40 With luck, Jimmy Dieters might still be let off. Even though he was nineteen now and had graduated from the family court to this dump, he looked a lot younger. There were places downtown where he got asked for his ID when he wanted to buy a pack of fucking cigarettes, and as for getting a drink in a bar outside his own neighborhood, forget it. But today, according to Weiner, the dipshit legal defense lawyer assigned to his case, it might turn out to be a plus that he didn't look his age. The dipshit thought the D.A. had messed up on Friday when he let the old lady with the bandaged foot be on the jury. She was a grandmother of five, and maybe she would take it in her head to hold out against a conviction, seeing as Jimmy was still basically a kid and shouldn't have to be sent up for two to five years, which was what he was facing, less for the snatch than for assaulting an officer and resisting arrest. So when he'd come into the court today, he didn't wear the camo he wore on Friday when they were picking the jury, but a twins t-shirt that belonged to his kid brother and a pair of chino pants. But the old lady had also come in wearing a different outfit. The bandage was off her foot, and she was dressed in a baggy black dress like she was coming to a funeral, which was not, Jimmy thought, a good sign, because whose funeral would that be but his? The old lady's sympathy was about all he had to bank on, because there was no way to deny that he'd done what he was charged with. The bitch he'd grabbed the purse from had been a police decoy, and she had two partners who witnessed the whole thing. He'd been set up, but it was all supposed to be legal, as the county prosecutor had explained to each person who was examined to be on the jury, and each one of them, including Granny, had to agree that they didn't see anything wrong with using decoys so really all he could hope for was sympathy on account of his looking like a slightly older Gary Coleman. He would have plea bargained if they'd let him, but because of his record they wouldn't. They were out to nail him and send him to Stillwater for two to five. His record was what would wreck him, even with the grandmother of five, but Weiner said they wouldn't be able to bring up all that shit if he didn't take the stand in his own defense. Anyhow, according to all the guys he'd talked to, that was almost never a good idea. But as it turned out, they got to read his whole family court arrest record to the jury anyhow, and Weiner only made it worse shouting out, Objection! each time. And each time the two lawyers would go up and whisper to the judge, and the judge would say, Objection overruled, in this real bored voice, and the other lawyer would smile this smile of his at the jury and read the shit on this sheet of paper the size of a fucking newspaper. February 2, 1976, second-degree arson. August 14, 1976, third-degree attempted burglary. November 20, 1976, attempted rape. Et fucking cetera. What Jimmy hated more than the look on the asshole's face when he was reading through the list was how almost everything was attempted, like he'd never actually been able to carry through on anything, which wasn't true. Those were just the times he was caught. But what could he say? Objection, Your Honor. I'm better than that. At a certain point, Jimmy got depressed and forgot what he'd been told by Weiner, always to try and look innocent which meant not to react to what was being said about him, but just to keep his eyes on the table in front of him like he was in school. Not an easy trick when everyone in the room was staring at him like he was a fucking werewolf. None of them were hiding the way they felt about him. They all wanted to nail him, even the grandmother of five. You could tell from the way her lips had got all squeezed together, the way she wouldn't look at him any more. Fuck looking innocent. Fuck the jury. Fuck them all. When the decoy started in on her testimony, Jimmy turned round in his plastic chair and looked at the people in the back of the courtroom. Weiner nudged him, and he told Weiner to fuck off. This might be his last act of freedom for two to five years. There were not many familiar faces. His own mother had taken off, and the only person he knew was Ms. Tough Titty, his old probation officer, who must have come for the sheer enjoyment of seeing him shafted. That's what was going to happen no doubt about it. This was not family court. This was the real thing. This was still water. And for what? For a fucking purse with nothing but fucking confetti in it. A courtroom, they called it. 
He'd seen courtrooms on TV, and he knew this was no fucking courtroom. This was just a waiting room where everyone had to sit on plastic chairs, everyone but the fucking judge. And the judge was no judge, just some kid out of college, still so young they wouldn't have let him on a golf course except as a caddy. Two to five years, because he'd been carrying a piece. He hadn't tried to use it, he hadn't even reached for it, even when he'd got loose from the decoy's first partner. So he was carrying a piece. What did they think? That some bitch was going to say, Oh, sure, honey, here's my purse, just help yourself to what's in it. He'd never used the fucking piece, and never meant to, but they were going to nail his ass anyhow. Unless someone on the jury agreed with Wiener that there was a reasonable doubt. Which there wasn't. Now it was the decoy's partner's turn to tell his story. He was some old Uncle Tom who didn't look like a cop at all. He might have been the twin brother of the grandmother of five. Jimmy wished he had used his piece, even if it had meant thirty to life, just so as not to have to listen to the bastard recite his answers to the D.A. Yes, he could point out the perpetrator. Yes, the perpetrator was here in the courtroom. Yes, that was the weapon he had removed from the defendant. But the absolutely worst part, and what made the whole thing seem like a nightmare, was that all the while they were setting him up for his two to five years, there was this goddamned little student sitting in the back row of plastic chairs, taking notes like he was in a fucking classroom, in a fucking Izod polo shirt. A school kid. Every time Jimmy turned round to look at him, he looked away but when he looked again, the kid would be staring at him with his lips squeezed tight like the old lady on the jury. Jesus Christ, wasn't there a law to keep kids out of courtrooms? The judge announced there was going to be a recess, which meant the jurors got a free lunch. For Jimmy it meant he could go to the toilet, which was down at the end of the hall on the right. On the left were the elevators and the stairs and the guard. Wiener, who had been full of talk up till now, suddenly didn't have anything to say. He sat at the table and avoided Jimmy's questions by working a crossword puzzle in the newspaper. Jimmy went out into the hall. The guard was there in front of the elevators where he always was, looking like he wished Jimmy would make a dash for it and give him a chance to lay into him. At the other end of the hall, the kid who'd been sitting in the back row of the courtroom with the notebook was standing in front of the men's room holding the door open, as though he couldn't make up his mind whether to go in or go out. When he saw Jimmy, he let go of the door and started walking toward the elevators, looking down at the rubber tiles, as though if he'd looked straight at Jimmy, he'd have caught some kind of disease. Jimmy moved out into the middle of the hallway, so the kid would have to walk around him and the kid, with his eyes glued to the floor, didn't even notice till he was just a few feet away. He stopped and said, Excuse me. And when Jimmy didn't move, he walked around him and went back in the courtroom. Jimmy thought of going after the kid, but if he did, what then? Wiener was in there. Fuck them all. Jimmy just wanted to be by himself. And the only way to do that, with the guard watching him like a hawk, was to go down the hall to the men's room. He figured he would take one last small revenge on Hennepin County by pissing on the floor. But as soon as he'd gone inside, he forgot all about what he'd meant to do, because lying on the tiled floor, just in front of the door to the first of the toilet stalls, was a small red change purse. He almost laughed out loud, because he knew that it must have fallen out of the kid's pocket when he'd come out of the crapper. Who else but a wimp like that would keep his money in a change purse? At least he hoped there was money in it. There was. A five-dollar bill and some change. He hadn't really expected more than that, not in a fucking change purse. He pocketed the money and threw the change purse into the waste bin. Then, feeling a little peculiar, he went into the toilet stall, locked the door behind him, and sat down on the toilet seat without even bothering to take down his pants. When the guard was dispatched, a few minutes later, to bring the defendant back to the courtroom for the conclusion of his trial, he was discovered in the locked toilet stall, dead. The county medical officer was summoned at once from his office two blocks away, and declared that the cause of death was apparently asphyxiation. As a drug overdose seemed to be the probable underlying cause, an autopsy was performed within hours, 
but there were no traces of any drug in his system. His asphyxiation seemed to have been entirely spontaneous. Mrs. Dieters was interviewed on the evening news and denounced her son's death as a clear case of police brutality. The Urban League backed her demand for an investigation, but really there could be no suspicion of foul play. There were no signs of a struggle, and the toilet stall had been locked from inside. Even Mrs. Dieters came to accept the fact that her son's death had been an act of God, and, very likely, a punishment for his sins. 41. The ambulance pulled up to the main entrance of the courthouse at 2.45, according to the clock on the tower of the building. William had been pacing back and forth alongside the wall of endlessly cascading water in the plaza of the government center across the street. The attendants wheeled a stretcher in through the courthouse's low, barrel-vaulted entrance. William was sure that Dieters was dead, but he wanted to see them bring the body out of the building. If they didn't turn the siren on when they drove away, that would mean Dieters had died right there in the bathroom as soon as he'd opened the purse. He hadn't expected it to happen so fast, and he was shaken up, not so much on account of what he'd done, but because it hadn't gone according to plan. From what he'd read in the medical book, he'd supposed that Dieters would continue breathing regularly until he fell asleep that night, probably in a jail cell. William had counted on being present to hear the jury deliver its verdict and the judge hand down his sentence and to see Dieters produce one final scowl. After Dieters's guilt had been officially recognized in that way, William's unofficial death sentence would have seemed less of an act of vigilante justice. But now that Dieters was dead, those scruples didn't disturb William's conscience. Dieters had been a dreadful person, and he would surely have gone on being a dreadful person for the rest of his life. A couple of years in prison wouldn't have changed that. Arson, burglary, rape, all before he'd turned eighteen and a look in his eyes all through the trial, like he'd have liked to add murder to the list of his accomplishments. The world would definitely be a better place, and Minneapolis a safer city, without James Dieters. But he shouldn't have died there in the courthouse, with William still in the vicinity. That had been a major error in judgment of William's, and that's what had set his heart to pounding, so that even now, an hour and a half after the courtroom had been cleared, he still couldn't trust himself to think clearly. What if the guard had noticed him coming out of the bathroom just before Dieters had gone in? What if someone remembered him being in the courtroom and simply tried to locate him as a witness? But a witness of what? He was being panicky about nothing. Still, it had been a mistake to be present in the courtroom, even with the excuse ready to hand, an excuse that was halfway true, that he was watching the trial as part of a report he had to make for a summer school civics class. As it turned out, no one had seemed even to notice his presence in the courtroom, except the defendant, who had scowled at him a couple times when he wasn't scowling at the D.A. or the witnesses. The reason he'd felt he should be at the trial was that he didn't want to zap anyone, even someone who was guilty as hell, who seemed to be basically a good person, which had turned out to be the situation at the first trial he'd started watching, on Thursday, a man who'd got drunk and stabbed his wife in the shoulder, and then threatened two policemen with a gun. Not a nice thing to do, but the man seemed sorry for it, and he was not someone who made his living preying on innocent people. Like Dieters. Dieters had deserved what he got. But why had it happened so soon? According to what he'd read in the textbook, apnea, which was the general condition that Andine's curse was just the most extreme example of, was always connected with sleep. The commonest kind of apnea, and what the textbook mostly discussed, was snoring. And from the definition of Andine's curse, it seemed logical to suppose that it was also connected with sleeping. Without even trying to, just by having studied it so carefully, William had memorized that definition. On Dean's curse, a primary insensitivity of the medulla's respiratory center of unknown origin, which impairs the reflex drive so that breathing becomes voluntary and no longer automatic. 
or in the simpler words of the Stranger Than Fiction column of the Green Magician comic book, where he'd first learned of the existence of Ondine's curse, the doomed victims of Ondine's curse never realize the danger they are in until it's too late. This rare disorder short-circuits the part of the brain that makes you go on breathing without having to think. With Ondine's curse, you can only keep breathing as long as you think about it. And when you finally can't keep from falling asleep, then it's lights out, forever. You stop breathing and die of asphyxiation. When William had first read that in Stranger Than Fiction almost a year ago, he dismissed it as a fabrication but he kept remembering the accompanying half-page drawing of a blue-faced corpse with one hand clutching at the collar of his pajamas. And then, on Tuesday, when the phone call had come from Rhoda Winklemeyer in Florida, and he realized that he would have to act quickly to help Judith, he'd recalled that picture again, and, on the hunch that Ondine's curse might be a real disease after all, he'd gone into his stepfather's study where he kept his medical books. Ben liked to claim that he had a better medical library than most doctors, and he subscribed to a dozen medical journals and had them bound in buckram bindings. It seemed a fair bet that if Ondine's curse was more than a comic book artist's fantasy, there would be something about it in one of these books. But a library without a librarian can be as useless as a computer without software. Tracking down a single rare disease among all those tomes had been like looking for a needle in a haystack, and William had almost given up the search when, in the index of a two-inch thick Introduction to Neurophysiology, he had spied the needle's glint. On Dean's Curse, see Apnea. Looking up Apnea, he was directed to page 465, where in a long paragraph about breathing disorders, for which apnea is the technical term, he found the short definition of Ondine's curse that proved that the disease existed. But the medical book had not said in so many words that someone with Ondine's curse only stopped breathing when he went to sleep. Even the comic book said you only went on breathing as long as you think of it. Dieters must not have realized what was happening to him. It was hard to believe that someone could be dying of asphyxiation and not start gasping for breath. It would be like drowning, a reflex. But a person with Ondine's curse didn't have that reflex anymore. Dieters must have died in the courthouse bathroom almost as soon as he'd opened the change purse William had cursed with the caduceus. Take the money from this purse, and you will suffer Ondine's curse. He drowned in the open air without even knowing he was drowning. At three o'clock, just as the bells of the tower began to ring the hour, the two medics wheeled the stretcher out of the courthouse. The body on the stretcher was covered with a sheet, and when the ambulance drove away, it did not sound its siren. Dieters was dead. He thought that being a murderer would have made more of a difference in the way he felt. He'd expected he'd have to contend with guilt or remorse or an urge to confess what he'd done but all he felt was relief that it was over, as though he'd been traveling for days and days on an endless bus ride. He took a long, lung-filling yawn, and then another deeper yawn, and even as he did so it came over him what a strange and wonderful mechanism the human body was. The heart pumping the blood round and round, and the lungs working like a microscopic filling station, fueling the red corpuscles with oxygen and the brain's mainframe firing off its strings of commands to all parts of the system. Was there anything else in the world so profoundly beautiful, so endlessly, intricately interesting? He stretched his arms up high over his head, and clenched his fists, and drew another deeper breath, bending back his head to feel the muscles in his neck, drawing his elbows down slowly, conscious of the flexions of his shoulders and his back. Out of nowhere came an intense urge to run, not away from anything, but from the sheer joy of inhabiting his flesh, or better still, to swim, to feel his muscles meshing together in a single smooth continuous effort, to feel cold water slide across his skin, defining its geometries. Suddenly the statue he had passed in the courthouse lobby, the statue of a naked bearded man sitting on top of an alligator, a sign had identified him as Mississippi, father of waters, 
instead of seeming ridiculous, seemed to make sense, completely and logically, though it was not a logic he could have explained. There was something in the whiteness and smoothness of the marble, and in the calmness and the strength and the size of the figure on the pedestal, that declared that the body in itself was like a god. The Greeks had understood that, and had filled all their temples with statues of naked bodies for that reason. He had to go back there. It was not really a matter of volition. He had to look at the statue again, to be in its presence and feel its power. Even as he passed between the low squat granite columns of the entrance, he realized that he was doing just what every murderer is supposed not to do, but inevitably does. He was returning to the scene of the crime. There it was, Mississippi, father of waters, and it was just another marble statue of a naked man, and even sillier than he'd first supposed. When he touched it, no power emanated from the stone, but from the other side of the lobby a guard called out, in a tone of routine prohibition, Hey, kid, get away from the statue. 42. When she heard the car pull up to the house, Sandra lighted one of the butts in the ashtray and blew puffs of smoke about the living room, as though it were air freshener. She was probably the only person in the world who had to pretend to be a smoker instead of the other way round, pretending to have quit. It still amazed her how easy it had been, once she'd had the motivation. All those years she'd agonized over being unable to kick the habit, and now all at once, because she was pregnant, stopping smoking had been as easy as falling off a log. She had no more craving than if she'd never smoked at all. The taste of cigarettes actually repelled her. The reason she lit cigarettes and left them burning in ashtrays was that she didn't want Ben to know she'd quit. Not yet, not till she was ready to tell him she was pregnant. She'd always said that was the only thing that would convince her to give up smoking, and if he noticed she'd quit, he might guess why. It was a false alarm. The car pulling into the driveway hadn't been Ben, but a pair of Judith's fellow crusaders against abortion stopping by to see if she would come along to the Willowville Mall to hand out leaflets. Sandra explained that Judith had extended her visit to Florida an extra week, but she didn't volunteer the information that Judith was in the hospital. When the car drove off, it was as though its bumper sticker, Abortion is Murder, had been dispatched to the house specially for Sandra's benefit. A sign from on high. Personally, Sandra did not share her stepdaughter's unconditional horror of abortion. She had had an abortion the first time Ben had got her pregnant, and though at the time she'd let Ben assume that she was doing it for his sake, and despite her own finer feelings, the fact was that the prospect of pregnancy and diaper pails had not been any more appealing to her than to him. But that was in 1970, when she'd been eager to make up for the time she'd lost by marrying Henry as soon as she was out of high school. This was 1980, and time had smoothed over the rougher edges of memory. Now it wasn't the morning sickness or the nights of infant colic that she remembered, but the mystery and the amusement of having made another human being out of her own body, a little burbling milk-mad mammal that slowly evolved into a genuine human being. It seemed once again worth the effort. More than that, she had a craving to be a mother again, a physical lust to feel her belly filling with another child, to nurse it at her breasts, to see it crawl about this barn of a house, smearing food on the furniture and crayoning the walls, and making it a home in those drastic ways that are the privilege and the genius of the very young. She didn't care about its sex. It could be a boy or a girl. She just wanted a baby and if she was to have one, it should be now. She wasn't too old yet, only thirty-four, but with every year she let slip by, the odds grew worse of some kind of irregularity. These were not feelings that Ben shared. Ben had no fond memories of fatherhood, and Sandra was sure he would want her to get an abortion. There would probably be fights, and almost certainly it would mean the end of the recent renaissance in their sex life. Ben had never been a great lover, certainly nothing like the beauty-rest gymnast Henry had been, but in the last few months since he'd been feeling his Cheerios again, Ben had actually advanced from beginner to intermediate. He'd even developed a taste for eating pussy, and if he was still a little tentative in the way he went about it, 
by comparison to the old days, it was a genuine sexual revolution. At first she had suspected he was taking drugs. You heard all this talk nowadays about cocaine in suburbia. And then she thought the old dog might have learned his new tricks as a result of having had a mistress. But the simplest explanation was that he was having his midlife crisis. He was forty-five, and the articles she'd read said that that was the age when men were most likely to have a midlife crisis and to take a fresh interest in sex. Whatever the cause, she enjoyed its effect and didn't want to put a damper on it prematurely. It was a beautiful day, unusually cool for midsummer, and Sandra decided she would take a walk. From the first days of her pregnancy, even before she'd realized what was happening, she had been brimming with physical energy. Before Judith had gone to Florida to visit her mother and William had started his summer school classes, she'd taken them almost every day to the pool at the country club, and when she no longer had that excuse for exercise, she'd begun jogging. But when the tests showed she was pregnant, her doctor had advised her to discontinue that. Instead, for an hour every morning, when there was no one else in the house, she did the stretching and breathing exercises recommended in the book on natural childbirth that she kept hidden among the paperback romances stacked sideways on the bookshelf in her bedroom. Ben couldn't make fun of the titles if he didn't see them. With William she had meant to have a natural delivery, but she'd got lazy about doing the exercises, and when the time had come she had funked out and let them give her an anesthetic. She'd always reproached herself for that. It was like flying over the Grand Canyon in broad daylight and being asleep. This time she was determined to do it right. Willowville was not a stroller's paradise. Few of the houses had smooth concrete sidewalks, the preference being for paths of gravel or crushed rock, and there was rarely anything to take special notice of. People did their flower gardening, if they did any at all, around their patios in their backyards, and the front lawns featured evergreen shrubberies and trees just out of the nursery. She walked the length of Pillsbury Road until it veered west into Willowville Drive, then up Willowville as far as the Sheehy House a center-hall colonial with a full acre of lawn and the tallest trees in the neighborhood, seven huge willows that surrounded the white clabbered house like a shimmering dusky green veil. Sandra envied the Sheehys their willows, but not their house, which was spacious only from the outside. Inside it was old-fashioned and boxy. Though, of course, it helped with that many children, the Sheehys had three, to have a good supply of bedrooms. When the new baby came, Judith would have to move upstairs and take the room next to William so the baby could have hers. And then there wouldn't be a guest room. Ben would object to that, but when did they ever have guests? She was tempted to cut across the Sheehy's lot to her own backyard, but, resisting the temptation, returned the way she'd come, and was rewarded by discovering, under one of the low junipers that bordered the gravel path in front of 1232, a lost frisbee. It was printed with the name of the company Mr. Sheehy worked for, Techno Controls, and with a motto in smaller letters, Designing Machines with Souls. Obviously, it was a promotional giveaway, and just as obviously belonged to the Sheehy boy, who was a few years younger than William. Properly, she ought to take the frisbee back to the Sheehy's house and leave it somewhere in plain sight on their lawn, but the heft of it in her hand, its lightness and its promise of effortless flight, made her reluctant to return it without sailing it a few times across her own backyard. She returned home, frisbee in hand, just as William was putting away his bicycle in the garage. William, she called out, and when he looked up, startled, she threw the frisbee toward him on a slow lofting arc that hooked in its last instant of flight right into the hand he lifted to receive it. Hey, nice, he said. Techno controls? Where'd you get this? I found it in some shrubberies. I think it belongs to the Sheehy boy. Do you want to play with it a while in the backyard? William seemed to take as much pleasure as she did in tossing it back and forth. As they gained confidence, they sailed the frisbee across wider and wider spans of lawn, but without either of them having to trespass beyond the invisible boundaries of their own backyard. It was wonderful all the different flight paths you could make it trace. She had no idea what twist of wrist or flick of the fingers made it follow one trajectory instead of another. 
It was all done unconsciously, but with such a strange precision. You'd almost think the plastic disc had a volition and intelligence of its own, as though it were some species of bird that had been fined down to this bare aeronautical minimum, a living discus skimming the lowest branches of the maple, whirling toward the patio and then veering away, settling down on the mown grass with a whoosh of deceleration like a waterfowl coming to rest on a lake. Before today she had only ever played frisbee with Henry, and that was years ago, on days when they'd taken William, still in a stroller, to Brosner Park. Now William was almost as tall as his father had been, and beginning to share his good looks. He'd be dating soon, possibly even off to college in another year. It was the hope of entering the U in the fall of 81, after only another year at St. Tom's, that had led him to take the summer school courses. Where did he get such ambition, at age thirteen? In that way he was much more like Ben than like Henry, but even Ben was in awe of the way the boy kept his nose to the grindstone. He was deliberately taking the very dullest course the school offered, civics, because he wanted to get it over with. And the teacher, Lila Gerhardt, was apparently a real pill. Judith had had her this last year, and she would come home at least once a week, infuriated with some new work of tyranny perpetrated by Miss Gerhardt. But William so far had not breathed a word against her. He just memorized all the dull facts and figures about city government and state government. And really, was there anything as dull as civics? And wrote his term papers and book reports, and generally behaved like a prisoner bent on earning time off for good behavior. She wished there was a way to explain to him that he didn't have to be so grim. High school, even one like St. Tom's, could be fun, if you didn't confuse it with getting an education. That could come later. But in the meantime, the boy should really learn to throw a frisbee better. A thirteen-year-old whose mother has better aim with the frisbee than he does should be taking an exercise class, not a course in civics. As though to confirm this judgment, William's next throw went wildly askew, and the frisbee came to rest, gracefully, high on the roof of the garage. Even standing on a lawn chair and reaching for it with a rake was no use. "'I'm sorry,' William said, though it occurred to her that perhaps his aim hadn't been wild at all, but perfectly accurate. Maybe he'd got bored with playing catch, but didn't want to say so. "'Do you want me to get the ladder?' No, leave it. It was fun, but I'm tired. The doctor says I shouldn't overexert myself now that— She caught herself, but not in time. William was no dunce. The doctor? His eyes had narrowed. The embryo of the idea was already there. She might as well be candid. She couldn't keep it a secret much longer in any case. She nodded. I'm pregnant. William grinned and sprinted across the lawn to hug her and spin her around in a little impromptu polka. Mom, that's wonderful. When is it going to be? Sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas, most likely. That's terrific. Can you feel it inside you yet? Is there a lump or something? She smiled. No, not yet. I'll let you know as soon as there is. Have you told Judith yet? She's going to be so tickled. She used to tell me how she kept hoping you'd have a baby so she would know what it was like to have a sister. She said she knew all she needed to know about brothers from me. So far, William, I haven't told anyone but you. And I hadn't intended to do that. It just slipped out. I suppose I'll have to tell Ben tonight. William crinkled his brow, and it was as clear to Sandra what he was thinking as if the thoughts had been printed out between the furrows on his brow. He understood what she feared and the reason she hadn't spoken with Ben. She kissed the crinkle. Don't worry. It'll work out. Ben may be a bit peeved at first. This wasn't an event we were planning on. But it is. What's the old expression? A blessed event. Every baby is a miracle. But a woman probably has an easier time accepting the idea of the miracle. For a man, it's probably like when the angel came to Joseph to tell him what was in the works. It's still a miracle, but it takes a while for the idea to sink in. It sounded nice. She hoped it was true. 43. 
When Ben finally came to bed at 10.30 after watching the local news on Channel 11, Sandra was there, sprawled on the bed, listening to a tape on her Walkman. Her eyes were closed, and her pedicured toes flexed in time to the music. Ben stood in the doorway, smiling, trying to imagine from the rhythm of her toes what she was listening to. It was never classical music. She had a reverse snobbery about that. But it wasn't rock, either. Her toes were moving too slowly. Her Zamphir tape, probably. She loved the sound of panpipes when she was feeling sexy. And so did he, for that matter. The problem was, he wasn't feeling all that sexy, not after the day he'd had today. Though with a little encouragement, he might get into the mood. For the last so long, he'd been in a state of perpetual rut. Something had happened to his testosterone level, and the feeling was mutual. Sandra was a bitch in heat. Pheromones? Was it as simple as that? She opened her eyes and turned off the Walkman and smiled. I was just thinking about you. I was just thinking about you. You looked upset when you got home. Did something happen at the office? Several things. When it rains, it pours. I finally got through to the attending physician at the hospital in St. Augustine, and it was like talking to a wall. According to him, Judith can't leave the hospital for another two weeks minimum. When I asked what treatment she was receiving, he tried to flim-flam me, and then, when I started to ask about his financial relation to the hospital, an emergency developed very suddenly. Then I got a call from Rhoda, who wanted to know if I remembered what day it was. What day was it? Our anniversary. Yours and hers? Apparently she still celebrates it. It's the source of all her alimony, after all. She was gloating. About your anniversary? About having Judith under her thumb. I'm probably going to have to fly down there myself and hire an attorney to spring her from that Blue Cross snake pit. I hope it's not as bad as that. I mean, all doctors are a little greedy or they wouldn't be doctors, but that doesn't mean the hospital is a snake pit. There's more. After the call from Rhoda, I finally got through to ATA. They've declined to fund the research on skin staining I wrote up last spring. Kearns wasn't there for the meeting when they made the decision, and when I asked why not, I couldn't get a straight answer from anyone. So I called him at home, and you know what I found out? He's gone to Mayo Clinic for a checkup. A checkup. No one flies halfway across the country for a checkup. Anyone who goes to Mayo has got a damned good reason. Well, I'm sorry your project didn't go through, but you said yourself it probably didn't stand much of a chance. You'll think of other ideas. You always do. But I'm more sorry to hear about Mr. Kearns. From the few times I met him, he always seemed the nicest person at ATA, the only actual human being. What do you suppose is the matter? Cancer is what I suppose. Oh, no, I hope not. Why immediately suppose the worst? Because everyone I talked to at ATA was so damned pussyfooting when I asked about him. They sounded worried. And what do you suppose the main worry is at ATA? The board members are all pushing sixty. They're all heavy smokers, and they know the odds. For getting lung cancer, you mean? Not Asian flu, honey. Well, it would certainly be ironic, but I hope you're wrong about Mr. Kearns. There's all sorts of things that can start going wrong at his age. Now, is that all the bad news? Isn't it enough? Because if it is, I've got some good news. She pushed herself up into a sitting position with her back against the headboard of the bed. I've given up smoking. You have? Since when? Over a month now. I didn't tell you before because I wanted to be sure I'd really quit. Over a month? Honey, that's terrific. Congratulations. Tell me your secret. She smiled in an odd way, lowering her eyes down to her hands, where they rested on her stomach, clasped together as though to cradle some small invisible animal. And when, after a long pause, she spoke, she seemed to address that animal and not Ben. I'm pregnant. Jesus! Closing his eyes and slumping back against the doorframe, admitting defeat before the fight was even underway. From the tone of her voice, he knew she would not be amenable to arguments or bribes. She meant to have the baby. 
the pregnancy had sprung some biochemical spring in her endocrine system, in some gland probably no bigger than a garden pea, and the result was a will enslaved to the needs of the fetus inside her, a faith as fervent and fanatic as any Shiite Muslims. Congratulations, he said dryly. I knew your first reaction would be dismay. So was mine. The idea takes a while to sink in. He agreed to this with a weak smile, thinking how the same might be said of the hook of a lure that a fish takes in its mouth. Perhaps, as in the fish's case, he would come round to her frame of mind more quickly if there was a fight, if he did reproach her for carelessness or deceit, for she was supposed to have been on the pill. If there were curses and tears, and the balm of a final reconciling embrace. It wasn't deliberate. I hadn't told you I'd stopped taking the pill, because it would have seemed like I was complaining about our sex life. And then, when all of a sudden we were going at it again, I did start back on the pill, but then it was too late. It must have been that very first morning that did the trick. Remember? The morning after William's birthday? He nodded. I remember. I don't want an abortion. Not this time. I want this child, and there's no reason we can't have another child. Money certainly isn't a problem. Compared to most people, we're rich. Sandra, I did not utter the word abortion. You're arguing with yourself. It's the word you were thinking. No, I was remembering Judith as an infant. She was a crier. For about six months she seemed to cry non-stop. Then she moderated to a whine, and whined till the age of four. Sandra laughed, for it was exactly what she would have imagined Judith to have been like as a baby. Well, maybe this one will take after William, she said softly. William was a darling baby, the kind other women coo over. At eight months he already had two teeth and was climbing the stairs. And the intelligence in his eyes, even at that age... It was like a lamp that never went out. He was only two when I left Henry. Two years, five months, and just starting to form sentences. You don't have to remind me of that, Sandra. I was a stranger to him during the years when children are at their most beautiful, when a mother can make the biggest difference in the kind of person the child will become. Madge Obstschmecker was William's mother more than me, and he loves her in some deeper way as a result. Maybe not deeper, but different. I don't blame him for that. He can't possibly help it. But I want a child who will be mine totally. It's like that word they use in church. A vessel. There's a kind of emptiness in me that has to be filled. Men don't feel that, do they? Ben shrugged. He did not want to be drawn into a discussion of the joys and wonders of procreation. I feel empty often enough. That's not gender-specific. But I can't entertain the same literal hope of filling that emptiness with an embryo. That is certainly a woman's prerogative. It made no difference that Ben refused to have an argument. Sandra had foreseen whatever objections he might raise, and she was determined to counter those objections, whether he spoke them aloud or not. It's not as though we led the kind of life where another child would represent a real inconvenience for either of us. I'm at home all the time, and I've no wish to have a career. We don't go out much. Judith graduates from high school next year, and will be going to college. And so may William if he gets approved for that accelerated studies program. More emptinesses to fill? No. In fact, William will probably be around the house more once he's in college but they will both be grown-ups before we know what's happened. We'll be less important to them. It's like early retirement. Sandra, you're arguing with yourself. Oh, you're being very tolerant and good-natured, and I appreciate that. But I want you to want the baby. I want you to feel good about it. When the time comes, when I can see it and feel it and talk to it, I probably will become a doting father. I'm only human. Sandra smiled. The mantle of complacent maternity already had enveloped her securely as a cocoon. All of creation seemed cozy and warm, and at the center of that coziness and warmth was herself, and, centered in herself, the sun that generated all this radiance 
was the seed of life in her womb. And what's wrong, she demanded, sliding forward in the bed, inviting him to her. With your being human, I never noticed it before, but I think it makes you kind of cute. He surrendered to the sheer biologic power of the event. He had always admired the salmon leaping up waterfall after waterfall, mad to spawn. Why should he be any different? I hope it's a girl, he told her, knowing it was what she was waiting to be told, and that she's just like you. 44. Ixie the witch was sitting in the middle of the misty clearing William had come to in his dream, a large black woman in a red cotton dress. He didn't recognize her at once, thinking her to be the mother of Jimmy Dieters, whom he'd seen only a little while earlier on the evening news, when she had accused the police of killing her son. And the woman's probably right, you know, Ben had commented in his John Chancellor tone of voice. Not that anyone else but his mother is likely to miss the little bastard by the sound of it. That boy was bad news. To which William had murmured a cautious, mm-hmm, not wanting to become involved in a discussion. He'd felt relieved when the brief account of Jimmy Dieters' mysterious death was followed by the latest news concerning the hostages in Iran. Ixie sat there, rocking back and forth woefully, and calling out her son's name in a tone sometimes of lamentation and sometimes shrill with accusation. The name she called out was not Jimmy, but Reinhardt, and that was how he knew that she was Ixy and not Mrs. Dieters. That, and by the color of her dress, which was the same bold red as the bowling pin who long ago had triumphed over Dundor and seen her son Reinhardt assume the crown of the decapitated king and reign over the kingdom of Wyomia. Why, then, was she grieving? As though he had spoken the question aloud, Ixie looked up and fixed her eyes on him, eyes glistening with tears and black with malevolence. Why do I grieve? You dare ask me that? You, his murderer? I never, William protested. Her laugh was like the cawing of her raven carn. Oh, no, you never, she mocked. And the train? The train that was wrecked just days after Christmas? You never did that either, I suppose. No, not an innocent child like Billy Michaels. And Dundor, impeached and beheaded, you had no hand in that, I'm sure. And his people enslaved and forced to worship false gods. That had nothing to do with you. They were your enemies, he protested. I did it for you, so that your son would be king. Some day, William Michaels, she prophesied darkly, some day your people will honor that king and make the day of his birth their holiday, and the name of his assassin will be reviled, and a nation shall mourn and not be comforted. Some day your own mother will bear a child, and that child shall have no name. And some day, William Michaels, mark my words, some day you shall be put in the balance and your crimes shall be judged, and your guilt made known. And your judge's name is... Enough. It was the voice of Mercury. William turned round to find the god standing just behind him. His right hand was raised against Ixy, and it bore the caduceus with its twining serpents, which hissed their own wordless confirmation of the god's command. I will speak. I will publish the name of the wicked and rejoice in his accuser's glory. I say you will be silent, for you are nothing but a piece of painted wood, a bowling pin, a child's toy. The god had only to step forward, and it was true. On the boulder where she had sat, there was nothing but the red bowling pin that William had used in his childhood games of make-believe. Mercury picked it up and tossed it underhand to William, who caught it and put it in his pocket. "'I'm glad to see you,' William said eagerly. "'There are some things I wanted to ask you.' Mercury looked amused. "'Do you suppose curiosity is one of the charms of youth? On the contrary, William, it's what the young don't know and can't imagine that beguiles their elders. But ask your questions. Three is the usual allotment.' 
and then we'll go down to my surgery for some practical hands-on instruction. I was going to ask why you visit me at certain times, but not at others. But if I only get three questions... What a bargain hunter you are. Very well, that answer won't count toward the three. I visit you as a gardener might visit the garden he has planted, to observe your growth and foster it. Sometimes I come and find you're not available. Last week, for instance, I dropped by and found your spirit closed to my approach. What's this? I asked myself. Has he come to disbelieve in me so soon? Has he been able to dismiss all the memories that I've restored? Can he hold the caduceus in his hand, and feel its power, and deny its source? William was abashed. He'd hoped his crisis of faith might have passed unnoticed by the god. He felt obliged to offer an explanation, though the god seemed to understand him in many ways better than he understood himself. I didn't really ever disbelieve in you. I doubted you. A subtle distinction. What physical proof did I have? A stick with a dead bird tied to it. I would take the thing out of the box of comics where I had hidden it, and it seemed as silly and childish to believe it could do all the things I seemed to remember it did as to believe the stories in those comic books. I could remember it vibrating with some kind of invisible energy, but it wasn't doing that any more. Of course there was Ned and Grandma O going bald and the rest, but all those things could have happened naturally. Mercury accorded William a disdainful look. The gods of Olympus have never dealt in overt miracles. When we visit mortals, we assume familiar forms. The arrows with which Apollo slaughtered the children of Niobe took the form, to human apprehension, of a plague. This is tedious. Ask your questions. Okay. Why wasn't there any power in the Caduceus? Why didn't the curse I'd put on Turnage's lighter have any effect? Those are two separate questions. The answer to the first is that you had simply drained the caduceus by putting too large a demand on it. Unqualified good health for five people. Do you have any idea what that costs in terms of an equal and opposite reaction? Evidently you don't. It will take more than the death of a Jimmy Dieters to pay that medical bill. Your account is heavily overdrawn. Meanwhile, just as with the debts you owe elsewhere, interest accrues. There is even the possibility, if the debt isn't paid within a reasonable amount of time, that you may forfeit your credit privileges altogether, so to speak. You mean? William began, and then realizing this would constitute a third question, stopped short, for it was quite clear what Mercury meant. If William did not work some further harm with the caduceus, it would stop functioning for good or ill. Yes, you were about to ask. I understand what you mean. As to your second question, many things might account for the curse and the lighter not yet having taken effect. Cancer can be like the bulbs that gardeners plant in the fall. They may lie dormant many months before the first leaves spring from the thawed ground. Or it may be that Turnage hasn't used the lighter since the curse was put on it. It may still be in the pocket of the suit he wore that night, and the suit may have been hanging ever since in the back of his closet, or the flint may have fallen from the lighter and not been replaced. William felt cheated. He'd thought of those possibilities himself. Your third question? My mother is pregnant. I am aware of that. I want the baby to be healthy. Naturally. Can I do that while it's still inside her? Yes, once the caduceus's power is fully restored, and within the wee thing's constitutional limits. What do you mean by that? Properly, that is another question. But my meaning's plain enough. I mean the primal event that determines the structure of a human embryo is beyond the power of the caduceus to alter or correct. In that, even the gods must be fatalists. What will be, will be. Are you saying there's something already gone wrong? I am only declaring the limits of the caduceus's power, the chromosomes twined together as fate determines. Were it otherwise, men would have become gods long ago, for anyone possessing such power would see to it that his offspring and his offspring's offspring were all genetic paragons. 
even great Jupiter had a gimpy son. Now, come along, the bell is tolling, and there is something you must see in order to believe. Mercury smiled a knowing smile, as though he'd said something clever, but clever in an obscure way only he could appreciate. Then he pushed aside the boulder on which Ixy had been seated to reveal a rough-hewn stairway that descended into the earth. Down this way, he bade William, and take care. These steps can be slippery. As they went down the stairs, the god's luminescing body cast a pale light on the curving stone walls. William strained to hear the bell that Mercury had spoken of, but the only sound he could make out was a muffled drumbeat that seemed to come from far below. It was the beating, he realized, of his own heart. Echo, said Mercury, as the staircase opened out into a vaulted chamber. Echoes of the Latin words skittered about the darkness like bats, and there directly before him, on a raised slab of polished white stone, was the object William had been commanded to behold. The corpse of a well-proportioned young man, his toothless mouth gaping wide and bleeding at the gums, the hollow eye sockets stuffed with fleecy balls of cotton batting. A tray of surgical instruments had been placed on a stainless steel trolley beside the stone slab. After a single glance at the naked body on the slab, William had to look away. Come, come, Mercury chided. Doctors must be made of sterner stuff. Afraid of your first cadaver? You won't get far in medical school at that rate. He lifted the corpse's hand and let it fall back limply to the stone. You see, quite harmless. Though you should, as a precaution, be wearing gloves. There's a pair there on the cart. Reluctantly, William put on the surgical gloves. They were made of a thick, translucent plastic, and it took a good deal of wiggling and coaxing to get each finger snugged into place. Why don't we begin by exploring the abdominal cavity? A right paramedian incision should do the job. Start here. He placed his finger just below the cadaver's lowest rib. William placed the scalpel on the spot indicated, but could not bring himself to exert the least pressure against the dead flesh. Mercury wrapped the back of his hand, and the flesh parted. There was no blood. The tissue beneath the skin was a pale pinkish gray. Continue, Mercury said, to about here. He touched the cadaver's crotch just above its penis, where the pubic hair had been shaved away, all but a faint stubble that had sprouted up in the time since the cadaver had been prepared for dissection. William continued the incision, trying to take an intelligent, dispassionate interest in the procedure. Mercury helped by calling attention to various features revealed by the opening of the abdominal cavity. Note the filmy adhesions over the ascending colon and the dilation of the bowel. There would also seem to be gas within the transverse colon and into the sigmoid colon area. As the incision lengthened, the dermal tissues seemed to spread a part of their own volition, like a too tightly packed suitcase that has come unlatched. The viscera began to slip loose from the abdominal cavity and spill out onto the stone slab. William replaced the scalpel on the trolley. I'm sorry. I can't go on. Nonsense. You're doing fine. Only a few more inches, and the incision will be done. William made himself look again at the cadaver and saw that its penis had become erect and that a thick clotted white fluid was being discharged from the urethra in irregular spurts. The initial shock of horror quickly yielded to an intense morbid fascination. As the discharge continued, it came to have the color and consistency of small curd cottage cheese. Jesus, William whispered, what is it? Mercury laughed. That, my boy, is a question you will have to answer yourself. 45. William? William, are you in there? William woke with a start. The room was dark and the phone was ringing, and his mother was rapping at the door. William, would you please answer your phone? It's been ringing the longest time. I got it, he called out and picked up the phone. Thank you, Sandra said, and will you point out to your friend, whoever he is, that it's almost 1 a.m.? I have a collect call, an operator announced in a strange accent. 
for William Michaels, from Winky Meyer. She pronounced the name with a precision denoting disapproval. Will you accept the charges? Uh. The receiver of the phone was covered with some kind of glop. William switched the phone to his left hand and wiped his right hand on the bedspread. As he did so, he realized that the glop had not been on the phone, but had been on his hand before he'd picked up the receiver. Just a second, operator. He used the corner of his bedsheet to wipe both hands clean and then wiped off the receiver, but it was still sticky when he picked it up again. Are you there, Mr. Michaels? the operator inquired. Yes, operator. I'll accept the charges. Go ahead, Miss Meyer. William? It was Judith. Why had he thought it was Ben? Because the operator had said Winky Meyer. He was still half asleep, and he could feel the dream fading, and there were things he'd been told in the dream that he had to remember. And it wasn't just on his hand. His pajamas were a mess, too. It dawned on him that he'd been having a wet dream, the first he'd ever had, and the stuff on the phone and in his pajamas was sperm, the first genuine sperm he'd ever produced, though he'd been jerking off pretty systematically for more than a year. But the dream hadn't been anything like wet dreams were supposed to be. It wasn't about sex at all. And now Judith was on the phone. Judith? I'm sorry, did I wake you up? It's an hour earlier there. I thought you might still be up. Is something wrong? Where are you? I'm in the Greyhound station in Miami. But don't tell father, not for another half an hour, anyhow. By then I'll be on a bus. I'm coming home. But Ben just talked to your doctor today. He said you'd be in the hospital another two weeks. I left the hospital right after lunch. My mother always comes in the afternoon, and I couldn't face another one of her visits. She does nothing but complain about her health. I'm the one in the hospital, though it's really more of a mental institution, but she spends the whole time whining about her health and not having money for her own hot tub. She was always like that, but she's worse now. It was such a dumb thing to do coming down here. But, Judith, don't be angry, and don't worry about me. I'm really quite well. In fact, I've never been better. That's one of the reasons I had to call you. I couldn't call from the hospital. There was never any privacy. And the food. It was just like everyone says about hospital food. It was so unwholesome. And I was starving. But even so, when the meals came, I would just look at the little shreds of meat and cold, gluey gravy and cry from hunger. And the food at my mother's was almost as bad in its own way. Microwave junk food with the same awful gravy, only piping hot, and endless pints of ice cream. Rhoda can eat a whole pint of ice cream while she's watching a game show. And breakfast? Breakfast is sugar-coated cereal and croissants. It would have made anyone bulimic to be with her for a week. I mean, Burger King would look like a health spa in comparison. Unconsciously, I think that's why I came down here, because I knew I'd get sick. But I'm not sick anymore, not really. I was making myself throw up. That night when you said you cured me, you really did but I refused to accept the fact. She paused for breath and added, I must sound hysterical. You sound wrought up, William agreed. Do you know what it was? What what was? The problem, the anorexia. It's just what all the books about anorexia said it was. Sex. I refused to accept the idea that I was becoming a woman, that I was going to have breasts and boyfriends and all the rest of it. I didn't want to have a woman's body, and I starved myself so I wouldn't. Judith, you haven't been drinking, have you? Judith laughed. Is that what I sound like? I sound drunk? Maybe I am, but not on alcohol. I'm drunk on movies. That's all I've been doing today. When I walked out of the hospital, I took the bus downtown, but I still didn't have any idea what I was going to do. So I went to see Romeo and Juliet. Oh, William, it was so beautiful. Not just beautiful, but, I don't know, I can't describe it. About fifteen minutes into the movie I started crying, and I didn't really stop crying till it was over, and then I stayed to see it a second time, and it was just the same. I couldn't stop crying. It made me realize that I'm not in touch with my own deepest feelings. 
Anyhow, at that point it was seven o'clock, and I was famished. So I went to the restaurant nearest to the theater, which was a Cuban restaurant, but not at all lower class, though my mother goes into a panic if she sees a word of Spanish anywhere. I don't know why she lives here, but the people in the restaurant were all very well dressed, and I ordered the first thing I saw on the menu on the wall, which was arroz con pollo, which turned out to be half a boiled chicken with a great heap of beans and rice. And all the while I was wolfing the stuff down, I kept remembering scenes in the movie, and I would start crying all over again, right into my beans and rice. And at the same time I was enjoying the meal like no other meal I've ever eaten. I'm sure the waiter thought I must be crazy. You probably think I'm crazy. No, but it sounds like it must have been a great movie. Oh, William, it is. As soon as I'm back, I want to take you to see it, if it's still playing somewhere. I never understood what all the fuss was about Shakespeare. When we had to read Julius Caesar, and even when they showed us the movie, it was like being taken to a museum to look at all those battered old statues. I don't know. Maybe I'm growing up. Maybe I should go back and look at the statues again. For just a moment William thought he might try and stem the flood of Judith's monologue by telling her about the statue of Mississippi, father of the waters, he'd seen at the courthouse, and the similar but less lasting impression it had made on him. But really he was more interested in hearing Judith rattle on than in trying to calm her down. So then what happened? he prompted. Then I went to another movie, though first I thought to call the hospital and explain that my mother had taken me out to dinner and I would be spending the night at her house. The hospital is really very lax, since you pay for the room you're in, whether you're in it or not. And then I called my mother, who wasn't home as usual, she's always out at a bar drinking. So I left a message on her machine saying I had a headache and please not to call till late in the morning. And then I went to see Greece. Have you seen Greece? It's another movie? He knew it was, but it was easier to ask leading questions than to spoil her story by explaining that he'd seen the last fifteen minutes of Greece on a double feature, but hadn't stayed to see the beginning. William, what century are you living in? I thought everyone at St. Tom's but me had seen Greece. It's a musical comedy with John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John, who are both so wonderful. But then I started crying again. It was as though it was the same movie, but everyone was dressed in different costumes. They were singing these beautiful songs, rock and roll songs, which ordinarily don't have much effect on me. But tonight, for the first time in my life, I understood them. William was completely outside his own dream at this point, but it was as though he'd entered Judith's. What she was saying was so classic it was hard to take her seriously. I didn't think rock and roll was supposed to be difficult to understand. No, of course not. Not for anyone in the world but me and Olivia Newton-John. God, did I identify. Judith, I'm sure Greece is an unappreciated masterpiece, and when it's showing on a double feature with Romeo and Juliet, we can see them together and compare notes. But I still don't understand why you're at a Greyhound bus station. I didn't have enough actual cash for an airplane ticket unless I went standby, and I thought if my mother had found out I wasn't at the hospital, she might have them check the airports, but not the bus station. Who would ever take a bus from Florida to Minneapolis? No one, and maybe you shouldn't either. Oh, I guess I should have explained all that part right at the beginning. The thing is, my mother and this doctor, who I think she must have had an affair with at some point, are keeping me here as some kind of hostage. Isn't that awful? like those poor captives in Iran. The thing is, when I got here, I was determined not to let go of my anorexia. When you touched me that night and said I was cured, I got very upset and angry. But I gradually did start to feel different about eating. I wanted to eat. All sorts of things I wouldn't have touched before that. Hamburgers. One day I went to Burger King and ate a Whopper, and I liked it, and didn't throw up afterward. But I did not want to give in. So when my mother phoned and said, why didn't I come down for a visit, it seemed like a perfect excuse. I mean, I really do hate the way my mother eats, which is a classic anorexic syndrome. But I would get so hungry that I would eat all the same things she did, which did make me feel genuinely sick, but even at that I wouldn't have been vomiting after every meal if I hadn't made myself do it, which is the next stage for most anorexics, bulimia. 
So she took me to the sinister doctor who's a friend of hers, and he incarcerated me in his dreadful clinic, and I was stuck. Either I admitted there was nothing wrong with me, which I was still too stubborn to do, or I stayed on at the clinic and had to eat their terrible food. And all the while my mother was just gloating, because she figured she could keep me a hostage in Florida and get who knows how much money in child support. So you just up and left the hospital? Finally, today, yes. Good for you. I don't know how you did what you did, William, but I am so grateful. Hey, listen, you did it. It would be silly for us to argue about it. How is summer school going? Terrible. You were right about old Lila Gearhart. She's a lunatic. But I think civics would be a pain even if Joan Rivers taught it. The Minnesota State Constitution is inherently dull. The German class is dull, too, but only because I have to keep memorizing new vocabulary. You're going to grow up to be the world's most hard-working workaholic. Oh, it's not all nose to the grindstone. Today, Mom and I had a grueling workout with a Frisbee that she'd found under somebody's shrubbery. And after I'd declared myself too tired to go on by sailing the Frisbee onto the roof of the garage, she let it be known that she's going to have a baby sometime before Christmas. How wonderful! Tell her how thrilled I am for her. But don't tell her till tomorrow morning. William, they're announcing the Nashville bus. I've got to go. Nashville? That's where I transfer. I just thought, there's no reason you have to tell them I'm on a bus at all. Just say I called to tell you about the movies, okay? Yeah, but when Rhoda calls up to say you're a missing person, they'll start to worry. I'll phone them myself from Nashville. William, I've got to go. I love you. I love you, too. Judith hung up. It was true, then. All of it. Not that there had been any doubt after what had happened today to Jimmy Dieters. The only thing, really, that had given him to doubt at all had been the way that Judith's anorexia had seemed to get worse ever since his birthday, and then her being put into a hospital. That and the fact that the caduceus had seemed inert. But in his dream, Mercury had explained about that. What had he said? Listening to Judith on the phone, the dream had got all hazy. He could remember the last part, having to dissect the corpse that was laid out on some kind of tomb or altar, and the corpse's penis shooting off the sperm, and then his embarrassment waking up and finding out that that much of the dream had not been a dream at all. He got out of bed and went to the bathroom to wash his crotch, but he did it in the dark so as not to dispel any fragment of the dream he could still get hold of. A bowling pin. Mercury had thrown it to him, and he'd put it in his pocket. Then it all came back, the three questions he'd asked and the answers Mercury had given. His account was overdrawn, and interest charges were accruing. He would have to find another Jimmy Dieters, or the Caduceus would lose its power. And he had to do it soon if he wanted to give his unborn baby brother, for some reason he was certain it was going to be a boy, the birthday present of a clean slate of health. The prospect of finding new victims made him uneasy. When he'd seen Jimmy Dieters' mother on the evening news, he'd begun to feel guilty about what he'd done. And maybe the death penalty was too drastic a punishment for Jimmy's crimes. Blindness would have kept him from becoming a career criminal as effectively as death. In the future he would do well to temper his justice with a little more mercy. Also, he shouldn't use his power on strangers. Perhaps there had been a worthwhile side to Jimmy Dieters that his court record would not have revealed. Maybe he had musical talent. Maybe he'd have joined the army in a year or so and turned all his aggressions to some constructive purpose. From now on, he vowed, he'd be more responsible in the ways he exercised his power. By the time he'd arrived at this laudable conclusion, he'd toweled himself dry and had changed into a fresh pair of pajamas. Then he got back between the bedsheets and dove effortlessly into the pool of a deep and dreamless sleep. 46. Lila Gerhardt was not vain about her appearance, but she was aware that her good looks were a professional asset and tried to dress accordingly. Adolescent children could be merciless toward the teachers they considered dowdy. Today, though she had no teaching duties per se, she'd worn her best summer dress, a striking cotton print with gigantic red flowers exploding on a field of white. 
Her lipstick precisely echoed the red of the flowers, as did the barrette that secured her jet black hair in place above her left ear. Miss Gerhardt's features were inherently dramatic. Strong cheekbones, a firm chin, and a Roman nose, and she emphasized that drama quite consciously with makeup and a hairstyle that commanded attention. Teaching was a form of theater, and in the theater there is no place for reticence or false modesty. Summer school had been over for a week, but she had agreed to come into the office and help Mr. Paley, the new principal, prepare the schedule for the next school year. She had also agreed, reluctantly, to speak with the insufferable Michaels boy about the grade he'd received in civics. The boy's stepfather had had the nerve to go directly to Mr. Paley with his complaint, but Mr. Paley had been quite firm and insisted that the matter properly was the concern of the teacher and the student, not of the principal and the parent. And so the appointment had been set up. Of course, it was not the grade in itself that was at issue, but the boy's preposterous ambition of skipping from freshman to senior year and graduating from St. Tom's at the unheard-of age of fourteen. A C-plus in civics did not automatically doom the possibility of his entering the early admissions program, but in combination with Miss Gerhardt's strongly worded advisory note, she was the senior member of St. Tom's early admissions program committee, the boy could count on at least two more years before graduation. At least two. At five minutes to ten, Miss Gerhardt, who was always punctual herself, since she expected the same consideration from others, locked up the principal's office. Mr. Paley had not arrived yet. He evidently did not practice the courtesy of kings, and went down the hall to the counseling office. The Michaels boy was already there, waiting outside the door. Good morning, William. She said cheerfully, Have you begun to enjoy what's left of the vacation now that summer school is over? Not a whole lot, Miss Gerhardt. Not after I got my grade from you. Yes, I understand that you're not used to receiving anything less than an A, but I can assure you some of your fellow classmates would envy you your C+. Plus. Dick Larson, for one. The hockey team is going to have to find another goaltender this year, I'm afraid. But I don't consider myself to blame for that, or for your C+, plus, for that matter. A student's grades are based on his or her performance. I performed well enough on the final. And that's why your grade is as high as it is. But I would trust a bright young fellow like you to do well on any multiple-choice test. Personally, I think such tests have little place in a humanistic discipline like civics. Fortunately for you, that is not how the State Board of Education views the matter. You mean you'd have flunked me if you could? What you speak of as flunking can also be regarded as an opportunity for growth. And yes, I would have liked to give you that opportunity. One of the essential tasks of secondary education, and in particular of the study of civics, is to prepare the nation's young people to become concerned, responsible citizens. On the evidence of your term paper, I feel I've failed at that task, while you have passed the course. I won't have another opportunity to correct my failure, and I regret that, for I think that if I could have had you again in my class for an entire school year, I might have begun to get through. Civics really ought not to be squeezed into two months of hard cramming, but again the State Board has other views. However, I'm not the only teacher here at St. Tom's. Perhaps Mr. Robb or Miss Millman will be able to succeed where I've failed. I hope so. And that's the reason you gave why I shouldn't be admitted to the early admissions program? So Rob and Millman could have a chance at me? Have a chance at you? That's a rather self-centered way to put it, isn't it? In any case, my note to the committee is a confidential matter. Yet the gist of it is easily summed up. I don't think you are either socially or intellectually mature enough to meet the challenges of an unstructured environment like the university. What about my SAT math scores? They look pretty intellectually mature, I'd say. They're better than the average grade that's required to get into Harvard. My, what a lot of research you seem to have done on the subject. She pushed back the half of her hair that was not held in place by the barrette, a gesture that commonly precluded her more definitive statements. Obviously, you're gifted in the area of math. 
but there are enrichment programs available right here at St. Tom's for our math prodigies. You're not the only one, you know. In any case, William, I did not agree to meet you to discuss my confidential recommendation to the program committee. I understood that you wished a fuller explanation of your grade in civics. William glared at her. His hostility was barely under control, and Miss Gerhardt had to make a conscious effort not to tease him or to seem amused by his futile effort to adopt her own tone of implacable objectivity. She, after all, had had years to practice that tone. For someone so young and so aggrieved, he really was handling himself rather well. I would like to know why I got an F on my term paper. He took the term paper in question from his knapsack and placed it on the desk before Miss Gerhardt. Miss Gerhardt placed her fingertips symmetrically at the back of her jawbone and craned forward in her chair to look at the term paper with an expression of polite curiosity tinged with repulsion as though she'd been asked to examine a collection of insect specimens. I can see that I've written comments just beside the grade. In what way do you find them unclear? For one thing, the comment on the front seems to contradict the shorter ones at the end of the paper. On the front you say, I refuse to take a moral position. But on page 7, where I talk about triage, you say, repugnant. And on the last page you wrote, this is cynicism pure and simple. It sounds to me like I took a moral position, but you don't happen to agree with it. She could see that she would have to be careful. The real reason for his F was that all but the last two pages of his paper had been copied verbatim from a reference book. She had seen too many such plagiarisms over the years to be mistaken about that, and the topic William had chosen to write on, the population explosion, was one well calculated to expose such deceits, since the writers of children's reference books became more than usually bland and euphemistic on subjects with a potential for controversy. She'd spent an hour in the library trying to track down his source, but he'd had the foresight to copy from a book the school didn't possess, which meant that she had only her suspicions to go by. Had she been able to prove him a cheat, the boy would have had a lot more to regret than his C+. Lacking such proof, she'd had to content herself by giving the paper a failing grade. Her grounds for that grade were not indefensible, but she had been distinctly relieved when Mr. Paley had rejected the boy's stepfather's suggestion that he read the paper and judge its merits for himself. If there seems to be a contradiction, William, it is in your paper. The first several pages in which you define the problem struck me as simplistic and not at all up to the level an exceptional student like yourself ought to be aiming for. You go to great lengths to explain the difference between an arithmetic and a geometric progression, but when it comes to the actual social issues involved, you get very fuzzy and vague. What were your principal sources for your paper, by the way? There are no footnotes and no bibliography. I used the Encyclopedia Britannica mostly, though I didn't just copy it out. I put it into my own words. Did you indeed? She smiled knowingly, as though inviting him to share her amusement at his lie, but he was not that easy a nut to crack. Well, you'll remember, when I spoke in class of what I expected in your term papers, I emphasized the need to deal with the ethical dimensions of the topics you chose. And through most of your paper, you seem to be exerting all your intelligence to do just the opposite. But then, when you begin to talk about triage, and you suggest that medical assistance be withdrawn from third world countries that don't achieve zero population growth at once, it's as though another writer had taken over. And that is where my first response was simply to say, repugnant. That doesn't mean, however, that your paper constitutes a moral position. If anything, it's amoral, and it doesn't represent a position at all, since your conclusions don't follow logically from your first statement of the case. But they do, William asserted loftily. I'm not saying anything Malthus didn't say almost two hundred years ago. If famine doesn't get them, then epidemics will. 
or they'll kill each other fighting for dwindling resources. All that is already happening. Would Malthus have got an F, too? If Malthus had written this paper, she dipped her head toward the offending document, he would have. You simply didn't work hard enough, William, and you know it. When your first project for a report on the operation of the Hennepin County Courthouse proved to be too much for you to handle, and there were only two weeks left till your term paper was due, you changed horses in the middle of the stream, thinking that you could recycle someone else's prose through your word processor and add a few paragraphs of cheap cynicism and that I wouldn't know the difference. But I'm not that dumb, William. I've been teaching a long time, and I know when a pre-adolescent Machiavelli is trying to pull the wool over my eyes. She concluded this peroration with a triumphant smile, leaned back in the swivel chair as far as its spring permitted, and waited for one of two possibilities, his surrender or his retreat. I don't think there's another teacher in this school who would have read this paper and given it an F. Thank you, William. I consider that a compliment. But in fact, I think there may be a few others who can detect a rotten egg when it's put right under their noses. I expect you'll have ample opportunity in the next two or three years to discover for yourself whether or not that's so. You really have it in for me, don't you, Miss Gearhart? I think our discussion is over, William. I'm not obliged to sit here and listen to childish epithets. You can go now. When he was halfway to the door, she said, Aren't you forgetting something? He turned around. Am I? What? This. She picked up the term paper between thumb and forefinger and held it out at arm's length, as though it were a source of contagion. You seem to value this much more than I do. I think you should keep it for future reference. William took the paper and hesitated a moment, as though expecting her to say more. When she did not, he left the room. There was a strange tingling sensation in her hand, the kind of pins and needles feeling one gets when a limb goes to sleep from being held too long in an awkward position. She flexed her fingers until the sensation went away. Pig piss, she exclaimed with a vehemence that coated the desktop with a fine spray of spittle. She pursed her lips with distaste and looked about for her purse, in which there was always a packet of Kleenexes, but of course her purse was back in the principal's office. She got up from the desk, pulled at the seams of her dress to smooth away any wrinkles, and stuck out her tongue at the framed photograph of John Dewey, the great philosopher of education. Then she went back to the principal's office, where Mr. Paley had just begun to perform the ritual pencil sharpening with which he began his day's work. Good morning, Miss Gerhardt. I see that, as usual, you've got a head start on me. Good morning, Mr. Paley. Eat shit and die. Mr. Paley put down the pencils beside the pencil sharpener and regarded Miss Gerhardt with alarm. She could not have said what he thought she had said. It was simply not in her nature. He tried to imagine what she could possibly have said that could be confused with such an obscenity. She had sat down at the work table, on which she had already spread out an array of three-by-five cards, each representing a particular schoolroom and period of the day. She had explained her system, but Mr. Paley had not given the explanation much attention at the time. As she sat there, studying the cards, her thin red lips suddenly retracted from her teeth, and the muscles about her nose and eyes convulsed. The effect was uncannily like the snarling of a dog, except that it was soundless. She became aware of his attention and looked up with a sunny smile. Yes, Mr. Paley, do you have a question? I was wondering if you were feeling entirely all right. She sighed. In fact, I have just had a rather trying encounter with the Michaels boy, who I was telling you about yesterday. Poopy pot. Or I should say, whom, shouldn't I? About whom, I was telling you. I'm afraid he became rather rude. Mr. Paley did not know what to make of Miss Gerhardt's behavior. He'd been warned by the assistant principal, and by his predecessor as well, to expect a certain amount of eccentricity from Miss Gerhardt, but surely this went beyond the bounds of eccentricity. My colleague Miss Millman has a saying, Hell hath no fury like a straight-A student the first time he gets a C. 
That's so true, isn't it? Mr. Paley nodded. Then Lila Gerhardt leaned forward, clutching the sides of the desk, and began to bark. It was a high-pitched, yapping bark, like a terrier's. She continued barking for a little after Mr. Paley had turned his back on her and hastened from the room, at which point it finally struck her what she had been doing. She had been barking at the principal. He must have thought she'd lost her mind. But she knew that was not the case. Her mind was as lucid as ever. She had had a nervous breakdown four years ago, but that had been nothing but a case of frayed nerves, and after a few weeks and less stressful circumstances, she'd been fine. This was not the same thing. She had always had an extraordinary memory for any phone number she'd called more than a few times, and she was able to dial the number of her old psychotherapist without having to consult the address book in her purse. After three rings, a receptionist answered and said, Dr. Helbrin's office, can I help you? Miss Gerhardt took a deep breath and said, This is Miss Motherfucker Piscunt. I seem to be having some kind of speech problem, and I'd like to... But the receptionist, who had never before had to deal with a patient suffering from Tourette's syndrome, had already hung up in indignation. 47. When school began again the Wednesday after Labor Day, Miss Gerhardt was no longer on the teaching staff. Her last action as a faculty member had been to revise the memorandum she'd written for William's file, urging much more earnestly that he not be allowed into the early admissions program. The language of the memo was so intemperate that the remaining two members of the early admissions program committee had to wonder if it were not a further symptom of her disorder. One of the members, Mr. Thorson, who had tutored William in math and seen him accomplish four years' work in one without any apparent strain, was so incensed by the tone of Miss Gerhardt's memo that he became William's champion. He obtained a fresh printout of the term paper. The original, with Miss Gerhardt's comments on it, had been used as kindling, William confessed, to start a fire in the backyard barbecue, and insisted that Mr. Paley read it. Mr. Paley was cautious in such matters, slow to move, and being moved, not likely to move far. He had a strong conviction that a principal should never override a teacher's decision, especially in regard to grades. Inevitably, some teachers would abuse their power, but so long as their actions did not inspire insurrection, it was better not to challenge them. The alternative, in his view, was anarchy and a return to the sixties. However, there were reasons why this case could be considered an exception. Miss Gerhardt no longer taught at St. Tom's, and so would not feel the slight to her authority, while Mr. Thorson's advocacy ought to be accommodated before it got any fiercer. He'd known other men of Thorson's apparently mild disposition to get some such bee in their bonnets and become perfect fanatics. The boy was obviously bright enough, and while the loss of even a single student's tuition was not to be regarded lightly, St. Tom's had a very tight budget, there was the possibility for some discreet publicity that would suggest St. Tom's was a breeding ground for young overachievers. Mr. Paley allowed himself to be persuaded. The disputed civics grade was quietly amended to a B, and William was allowed to enter the early admissions program. William could not have been happier, not on a regular day-to-day -day basis. His classes were much more interesting as a senior than when he was a freshman. He wasn't in over his head, but it wasn't so much like waiting at the kitty end of the pool. American history, with Miss Gerhardt's old crony, Mr. Robb, was the only class he felt any real aversion for, and even that wasn't as bad as civics had been, since he was able to keep a low profile and not become one of Robb's preferred sparring partners and the butt of his sarcasms against Mondale Me Too liberals. That had become Judith's destiny, but she actually seemed to enjoy the little Socratic dialogues that Robb engineered, and to do Rob credit, her grades didn't suffer for her services as straw man and scapegoat. At the end of the first six weeks, she had an A, while William's careful neutrality got him only a B. At home, everything seemed as bright and cheery as if they all were auditioning to appear as the average happy family of four, featured in an ad for absolutely anything. 
Sandra had spent a small fortune on maternity clothes and glided around the house looking like a medieval fashion show, while Judith had filled out with the same almost overnight blossoms on the bow suddenness to become a hypothetical candidate for St. Tom's homecoming queen. Hypothetical because St. Tom's didn't have a football team whose coming home could be celebrated with a dance. She looked terrific, but beyond looking terrific, she radiated good feelings, high spirits, and, in her own account of it, joie de vivre. I feel just like Cinderella, she confided to William one night after a game of fast but non-competitive ping-pong. The only difference is the clock never strikes twelve. Even Ben was swept away by these spring tides, to the degree at least that he too stopped smoking. Lacking Sandra's powers of self-command and her sense of decorum, Ben's battle against the weed was conducted at center stage of the family theater, with much moaning and groaning, and momentous falls from grace when a late-night brandy would tip the scales of willpower and send him out of the house in a panic to find a cigarette vending machine, forays from which he would return repentant and crestfallen. Gradually, however, the crises became rarer, and the lamentations diminished to ordinary kvetching and self-deprecation. Ben even began to use the exercise bicycle in Sandra's bedroom and to partner her in the exercises recommended in the book on natural childbirth. However, Judith proved to be a better partner, as Ben had no knack for relaxing. Through it all, William experienced the delight, all the keener for having to be kept secret, of knowing himself to be their benefactor. When he saw his mother sitting cross-legged on the living room's white carpet rocking back and forth in time to puff the magic dragon, it was as though he were singing the tune that had enchanted her. And when he came upon Judith whirling about the house in a black leotard augmented with a red tablecloth while the rite of spring blared at top volume from all three sets of downstairs speakers, it was as though he'd been conducting the music and summoning with flicks and jabs of his baton all her contortions and dashings about. When Judith saw William in the doorway, she didn't interrupt her gyrations. The music had come to the evocation of the ancestors and had momentarily calmed down, but gestured for him to join her on the floor where she was spinning around alternately on her knees and on her behind. He declined on the grounds that he had homework to do, but really because he would have been embarrassed to make such a fool of himself, even though it did look like fun. He'd never been able to cut loose that way, even with rock music. I'm too inhibited, he shouted out over the music, and Judith just nodded and paid him no more attention, flicking her sweat-drenched hair about like the mane of a horse, then bending backwards slowly and flailing her arms convulsively when there was a bleat of brasses or a cymbal crash. William himself could never predict just when these explosions would come, but Judith connected with almost every one and seldom got faked out. William was impressed, since even though The Rite of Spring was one of his favorite pieces of music, he was always going blip when Stravinsky was going blat and vice versa. This was all the more remarkable since Judith had never been known to dance so much as a two-step until this fall when she'd started taking a course in interpretive movement in order to meet St. Tom's phys ed requirement. The overall change in Judith since she'd returned from Florida was almost spooky. She seemed another person. It wasn't just that her face and figure had filled out, but the animating spirit within this new and ampler flesh had changed too. She moved differently. There was still something abrupt and bird-like about her, but the bird you might be put in mind of was more likely now to be a swan than a stork. She had started wearing makeup and doing inventive things with her hair. Gone were the Peter Pan blouses, the droopy pastel cardigans, the pleated tartan skirts. In their place was an array of clothing that seemed to present a different hypothesis of the essential Judith Winklemeyer every day. Sandra's drawers and closets were filled with years of impulse buying, clothes that had been worn once or twice, or never at all, and then retired to mothball status. Shirts and sweaters in all the colors fashion had ever thought to decree. Pounds of bracelets, bangles, pins and beads. The jeans of all major designers. Mini skirts and maxi skirts, and skirts that formed spiraling, caressing draperies as you walked. 
Sandra tended to buy off the rack, and many of these old purchases, when they were exhumed from their mothballs, proved to fit the new Judith better than they'd ever fit the old Sandra. Without having to spend a cent of her father's money, Judith had a wardrobe to rival any at St. Tom's, and she'd taken to it like a duck or a swan to water. Meanwhile, since some time in mid-September, the caduceus had begun to regain its former power. Each time William took it from its hiding place in a box of saran-wrapped comic books, the tingle he felt on touching it seemed perceptibly greater. Though he could not measure this increase, he knew that the power involved was more than the power of suggestion, and that somewhere out beyond William's ken the caduceus was doing its work. Turnage, with each flick of his twenty-four carat Cartier lighter, had been planting seeds of carcinoma in some smoker's lungs, and those seeds were growing. The effect of this impending harvest on the caduceus had not become apparent until, as Mercury had explained, the outstanding debt for Turnage's and William's family's health insurance had been paid in full. Now at last the shifting balance of plus and minus had been restored, and soon, as further seedlings ripened to mature cancers, it would be possible to bring William's unborn sibling within the charmed circle inscribed by the caduceus about the Winklemeyer household. On the whole, William was glad that the office of the American Tobacco Alliance was so far away, and that his victims, however deserving they might be of their fate, were not known to him personally. Whatever their sufferings, they had only themselves to blame. The warning was there on every pack of cigarettes they'd bought. Smoking causes lung cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and may complicate pregnancy. They had not only defied that warning, but those who worked at ATA had denied it as well. William had only accelerated the process of justice. He felt no guilt, but neither did he feel any curiosity, except for the effect all this might be having on Turnage himself. Had he become aware yet of the shadows gathering round him? How long could he maintain his bluff facade before the TV cameras, staring down the truth and spitting tobacco juice at his accusers? The question was answered on the same evening that William had come upon Judith performing the rite of spring. Ben called from his office, saying that he would be home late, and urging them all to watch and to make a tape of a TV program called the Good News Hour, which was broadcast on a cable channel at 7.30. He wouldn't say why, only that they were certain to be astonished. The Good News Hour was sponsored by the Son of Man Foundation of Wilmington, Delaware, and was devoted, in the words of its hostess and the co-president of the foundation, Bess McKinley, to all the news you'll never see on NBC. For the first fifteen minutes of the program, this news consisted of strange portents prefiguring the soon approaching end of the world. A tornado, or very nearly a tornado, in Delaware's Kent County, where no tornado had ever been reported before. And strange red stains that had appeared overnight on the screen of a drive-in movie theater outside of Macon, Georgia, that showed X-rated movies and of the wonderful cures affected by faith in Jesus through the healing ministry of his servant and Bess's husband, Hal McKinley. There was also an inspirational story about a Girl Scout troop in Wilmington that had tied over a thousand yellow ribbons to their neighborhood trees by way of demonstrating the nation's concern for the hostages in Iran, and this was followed by a personal, off-the-cuff declaration by Bess concerning her own lack of confidence in the leadership of President Carter. Are you sure, Judith asked Sandra, that this is the program that Father wanted us to tape? This is it. I wrote it down. Sandra seemed just as puzzled. There must be a reason. Be patient. After a brief but earnest appeal for contributions to the Son of Man Foundation, Bess McKinley patted the blonde beehive of her hair and smiled intently at the camera. Tonight's special guest on the Good News Hour is a man who needs no introduction to any sports fans who are watching. He is none other than Dan Turnage, longtime second baseman for the Minnesota Twins. Welcome to the Good News Hour, Dan. The camera shifted to the right to show Dan Turnage, who said something that his lapel mic did not pick up. Bess leaned forward carefully to help him adjust the mic. 
Turnage seemed much less self-assured and brassy with Bess McKinley than he'd been during his infamous appearance on 60 Minutes, a clip from which was shown by way of illustrating the work he'd undertaken since leaving the baseball diamond, acting as a spokesman for ATA. When the clip was over, Bess smiled at Turnage and asked, Well, Dan, do you still feel the same about smoking now? The camera moved in until Turnage's face filled the whole screen. May God forgive me, Bess. May God forgive me for all my lies. Do you mean to say, Dan, that there really is a link between smoking and cancer, and that you knew it at the time of your appearance on 60 Minutes? Is there anyone who doesn't know it in his heart of hearts, Bess? I only denied it because I was paid a large salary to do so by the tobacco industry. I figured every smoker knows what he's doing, and so the fact that I was saying, Hey, kid, smoking is okay, didn't really fool anyone. Well, maybe it didn't fool them exactly, but it did something just as bad. It showed them how to harden their hearts, how to defy the judgment of the Lord. I can see that now, because I've been born again, but I couldn't see that then. Sin made me blind. Praise the Lord. That's quite a turnaround for you, Dan. It certainly is, Bess, and I'll tell you how I came to it. It wasn't the Surgeon General's report, and it wasn't any so-called scientific experiments on mice and rats. It was the living hand of God. He plucked my friends from me one by one, the men I worked with and played golf with and dined with at expensive restaurants. All of a sudden, Bess, they started to come down with lung cancer, one after another, like ducks in a shooting gallery. Could you tell us who some of those men were, Dan? I can tell you three that have died in just the past two months. The first was Sid Kearns, who was one of three top men at ATA. Sid used to smoke like a chimney. Then there was my secretary, Rita Baker, who was also a heavy smoker and the mother of three kids. Finally, just the Monday before last, the president of ATA himself, Maurice Myers, died. His obituaries just said, due to natural causes. ATA doesn't want any of this getting into the newspapers, and the names I've mentioned are only the tip of the iceberg. They're doing all they can to hush it up, and so far they've succeeded. I happen to know the whole story, because I personally know the persons involved. Best nodded and turned to the camera. I guess I should have explained right at the start of our talk that Dan is no longer working for the tobacco industry. He left the American Tobacco Alliance three weeks ago, and from now on, I'm happy to say he'll be putting his talent to work for the Son of Man Foundation. And that's one reason why the Good News Hour has been able to bring you this important news story before any of the national networks. And the other reason, Dan put in, with some of his former feistiness, is that none of the networks dares to touch it. And why do you think that is? It's because they are smokers, and they refuse to see the sign the Lord is showing us. They are the same as I was before the scales were lifted from my eyes. Oh, it's a coincidence, they'll say. Or they'll say, well, they were all old men, they had to die of something. Or they'll say, so you know three people who've died from lung cancer. So what? There's thousands more dying from the effects of smoking every day. Only a ATA would that be considered news? And they laughed at me, Bess. Behind my back, they were laughing at me, as though I were still just a PR man trying to drum up publicity for a client. I'll tell you, Bess, I know now what it must have been like for Jonah when the Lord came to him and said, Jonah, you've got to go right now to those sinners in Sodom and Gomorrah and tell them to stop their wickedness and fornications. Jonah knew if he did what the Lord told him, they'd just laugh at him but he had to do it anyway. That's my situation exactly. Actually, Dan, Bess said in a tone of gentle reproof, it was to Nineveh that the Lord sent Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Jonah chapter 1 verse 2. Sorry, Bess, it's been a while since I've read the good book, but you get my idea. I understand that you were a smoker yourself, Dan. I was, but not any more, Bess, and never again. It wasn't easy to stop, even with the Lord's help, 
I still wake up in the morning and reach for that pack of cigarettes. But then I remember Sid and Rita and Maurice and other good friends who are sick right now, some already in the hospital. And I know I'd be there, too, if it weren't for the grace of the Lord. Yes, Bess agreed. The Lord is our refuge and our strength, and He will spare the sinner who comes to Him with a contrite and repentant heart. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than for the ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. That is the good news we're here to tell you today on the Good News Hour. Thank you, Dan, for being with us, and I hope you will be back soon to tell us more about these remarkable developments. And thank you, good people, for your prayers and contributions. A hymn tune swelled up from the background, and Bess's face faded from the screen to show a slowly spinning globe banded at the equator with the name of the show, and below that the address to which contributions could be sent to support the continuing work of the Son of Man Foundation. The next program, Ever Since Noah, an educational series on creation science, was well underway before Sandra thought to lean forward and turn off the recorder. The movement made her grimace with effort. Her pregnancy was well advanced, and even in her billowing maternity gowns, she seemed immense and ungainly. There was a long silence. They all went on looking at the blank screen of the TV so as not to be looking at each other. Finally, Judith said aloud what they had all been thinking. He may be born again, but I can't tell any difference. Sandra lifted her eyebrows in ironic agreement, but felt obliged to say, We mustn't judge. It is a weird coincidence, though, wouldn't you say? Judith ventured. William and Sandra had to agree. 48. On October 21st, the Philadelphia Phillies won the World Series as Steve Carlton and Tug McGraw pitched them to a 4-1 to victory over the Kansas City Royals. Within minutes of that victory, as William, in his own room, was computing energy changes in various reactions for the next day's chemistry class, he got a long-distance phone call from Dan Turnage in Philadelphia, reminding him that he now owed Turnage $250. William had long ago spent the money Ben had given him on his birthday, and he didn't have ten dollars to his name, let alone two hundred and fifty. It seemed mean of turnage, and even slightly threatening, to be so quick to demand a settling of the score. In fact, ever since the series had started, and there seemed to be an even chance that turnage's long-shot prediction might come true, William had been hoping their bet would quietly be forgotten, out of deference to the fact that any official business connection between Turnage and Ben had been severed by his departure to the greener pastures of the Son of Man Foundation. Instead, Turnage, who was calling from Veteran Stadium, positively gloated over his having won what had seemed, back in April, a sucker bet. William got more and more resentful as Turnage did his own precy of the major plays of the day's game, but he did promise to mail Turnage a check as soon as he could, for which purpose Turnage dictated his new address at the office of the Son of Man Foundation in Wilmington, Delaware. "'We saw you on TV last week,' William remarked, before Turnage could hang up. "'Uh-huh.' "'You certainly have changed your mind about cigarette smoking.' "'Yes, I have.' Turnage didn't seem disposed to discuss his new views, but William persisted. How many other people at ATA have actually come down with lung cancer, besides the three you named? A few. Is it classified information? Is there some reason you can't tell me? There was a long pause, and when Turnage answered, it was in a different tone of voice. Okay, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I don't owe you any favors, or your dad either. But the situation in Baltimore is pretty desperate. ATA is going belly up. They're rushing through the paperwork so they can officially cease to exist a day or two after the election, when they figure there'll be the least attention from the media. I don't suppose there's much your dad can do about it with that little advance notice, but for what it's worth, now he knows. Any more smart questions? You didn't really answer the question I asked. I answered it. You just weren't listening. Get that check off to me pronto, you understand? And next time think twice before you bet against a pro. Turnage hung up. 
Ben was not home yet, and William didn't look forward to being the messenger of Turnage's news. ATA funded most of MIMA's research. If ATA sank, it didn't seem too likely that MIMA could escape being dragged down with it. In hindsight, the logic of this seemed so inevitable that William wondered how he had failed to foresee the results of the curse he'd placed on Turnage's lighter. There were not that many dominoes involved. He decided he would tell his mother the bad news and let her pass it on to Ben. He also decided that at the same time he would take the caduceus from its hiding place and use it for one final benevolent action, and then never again. He would extend to his unborn brother the birthday present of a lifetime of unfailing health, and trust that the havoc being wreaked in the corporate ranks of ATA would suffice to cover the cost of such a generous gift. He'd long ago worked out a rhyme that seemed, in its thoroughness and categorical simplicity, to be secure from being construed to mean something it wasn't intended to mean, and now, as he grasped the caduceus tightly, he pronounced the words of that rhyme. To the child within my mother, whether my sister or my brother, this hand imparts a long and healthy life, unthreatened by disease or surgeon's knife. The idea of using simply his own hand to channel the power of the caduceus had come to him as he had watched the Good News Hour and seen a montage of healings performed by Hal McKinley. In each shot, the camera had been focused tightly on McKinley's right hand as it rested on the forehead or arthritic hands or crippled legs of the person to be cured. It seemed an efficient technique. William found his mother in her own room, sitting up in bed and eating dry roasted peanuts directly from the jar. A paperback romance, open to where she'd stopped reading, rested precariously on the basketball of her belly. William told her about Turnage calling to collect on his bet and what he'd revealed about ATA. Sandra sighed. That is bad news, but I doubt Ben will be surprised. Surely it was only a matter of time. ATA couldn't have kept going on with business as usual much longer. They were lucky that Turnage's story didn't receive any more notice than, oh! She drew a sharp breath, and the paperback on her belly fell to the bedspread. Ah! She let out the breath in a long sigh. William looked alarmed. It's not starting now, is it? No, this is just practice. Braxton Hicks' contractions is what the book calls it. Oh! Oh, feel how hard it is now. She took his hand and placed it on her abdomen, then closed her eyes and bent her head back. William closed his eyes, too, and under his breath he recited again the words of his fraternal blessing. Slowly the flesh beneath his fingers grew less rigid, as though it were a leaking balloon. Sandra sighed a deeper sigh. It was done. Isn't that strange? Sandra said. And now I can feel its little feet kicking at my rib cage. It doesn't like it when I'm on my back, because then it's resting on my spine. William felt overcome by a strange shyness, almost a sense of shame. I'd better go finish my homework, he said. Here, take these peanuts. She handed him the jar. I've eaten too many already. When William was back in his own room, he dialed the old St. Paul phone number. He let the phone ring more than twenty times, hoping if Madge was at work that Grandma O would eventually stir herself to answer it, but she never did. He was hoping to be able to get the money to pay turnage from the trust fund that Madge set up for him from the insurance proceeds. Then, when he visited the house, he meant to return the caduceus to the place where he'd found it, buried in the loose insulation in the attic. He couldn't bring himself to deal with it in any more irrevocable way but at least in the Obstschmecker attic it would not be tempting him to take some spur-of-the-moment revenge. He wanted the caduceus out of sight and out of mind, as it had been until his thirteenth birthday. Why did he want that? That was a question he managed pretty well to evade. If he had had to give a reason, he would have claimed it was the working of his conscience. In fact, he was beginning to be afraid. 49. There is another darkness than the darkness of the night, an inner darkness that corresponds to what is called the inner light, and this darkness, 
the light as well, is visible only to spirits who have passed beyond this life, and, sometimes briefly, to those with whom such spirits are able to communicate. Henry could see such visible darkness now, curling like the surf of some immense black ocean over the rooftops of Willowville, engulfing and blotting out the incandescent lights of the houses, the street lamps, and the moving cars. Mountain climbers can witness a similar sight, looking down into a valley as it fills with turbulent vapors. It was beautiful, but only as the coilings of a very large and deadly snake might be beautiful, viewed in a documentary movie or through the thick glass of a vivarium. Henry enjoyed no such safe vantage with regard to the darkness that flowed across the lawns and seeped into the houses arrayed below him. Within those mists, invisible to living eyes, he would be blinded. Their fumes, undetectable by mortal senses, could suffocate and infect a spirit's incorruptible flesh. Even from this distance he was filled with abhorrence, and yet he must, for Billy's sake, enter that miasma and try to prevent what the roiling darkness declared, by its very presence, to be a predestined and unavoidable fate. From within that darkness flesh tugged at him. The long chain of chromosomal causality that links the living, the dead, and the yet unborn invited his descent, spider-like, along its trembling filaments. The attenuated thread was all that still linked him to the brutalities, hungers, and horrors of physical life, and he did not wish to trust himself to it. There was a defect in the thread that only his own early death had prevented him from experiencing within his lifetime but the thread still might snap, unable to support his passage down into the black surf of mortal life, and he would fall into the darkness and be dissolved into a flux of immaterial energy. Or worse, the thread would come untethered at its farther end, and the tainted chromosomal heritage would unspool through another life still more ill-fated than Billy's or his own, or any of the other spinners of the thread. Should that come to pass, should the bloodline be perpetuated, the consequences would be felt as an infection and convulsing pains all along the length of the thread. For in eternity the ancestor suffers for the evils of his progeny. Unto, in the prophetic words of Exodus, the third and fourth generation. And so it was not only solicitude for his son that moved Henry to attempt to avert what now could clearly be foreseen. It was, much more, a fear for what he would suffer himself if the thread were spun out to a longer length. 50. Do you know, Judith said, assuming a kneeling position on the cowhide laid down as a hearth rug over the white carpet, my first real memory of you is from Halloween. It was years ago when Sandra and I came visiting the place on Calumet. Remember? Vaguely. I remember you brought over a jack-o'-lantern bigger than the one my dad had already made. You were dressed as a doctor. That's right, young Frankenstein. But I can't remember how I was dressed. A witch, I think. She shook her head, and the fake diamond pin in her hair twinkled in the darkness. That doesn't sound right. William poked at the embers and produced a brief flaring up of the flames that gave Judith's bare arms and shoulders a wonderful tawny glow. She was still dressed in the flowing saffron-colored tunic she'd worn to the school's masquerade dance, but she'd taken off her long-thonged sandals the moment she got back to the house. The sandals and the crescent-shaped pin in her hair had come from Sandra's endless supply of junk clothes. The tunic Judith had made herself. She was the Greek goddess Artemis. She had wanted William to go to the dance as her brother Apollo even offered to make his costume for him, but he'd balked at the suggestion. Instead, he'd dug up an old green tracksuit, smeared his face and hands with green hunting makeup, added an 89-cent green shower cap, and said he was a Martian. It was easily the least fussy and cheapest costume at the dance, and it had the further unplanned advantage that, since the makeup rubbed off at the lightest touch, no one had wanted to dance with him. Judith had not danced much either, but that was because the thongs of her sandals kept slipping down from her thin calves unless they were tied so tightly they were painful. They'd left at the first offer of a ride. I remember now. I was St. Clair, St. Francis's sister. 
She laughed in the nervous way of someone looking at an old and unbecoming family snapshot. That's right, you had on some kind of gunny sack. Quite a change from tonight. From a saint to a goddess? It's a logical progression. And besides, Claire and Artemis were both virgins. William poked at the fire some more, by way of steering the conversation in some other direction than sex. Sex was fun to talk about only with boys his own age, where the rules were clear as to what lies you could get away with and how far you could carry certain lines of speculation. But with your own three years older sister, what could be spoken of? You could tease her about boyfriends or about her vanity, and that was it. But Judith didn't have any boyfriends, and though she was beginning to be beautiful, she wasn't vain about it. Happy in a Cinderella-ish way, but that wasn't the same as vain. Speaking of virgins, Judith said, have you heard what they're saying about Elizabeth Naughton? When he shook his head, she leaned closer and lowered her voice. She was pregnant. And she isn't now? They say she had an abortion in August. Is that a bad month for abortions or something? She smiled, but at once corrected it to a frown. Abortion isn't something to joke about. So what is the proper way for us to deal with it? Should we go up to her after English class and tell her she's guilty of murder and insist that she wear a big M on all her clothes? William, abortion is a serious crime. Liz isn't a Catholic, is she? That doesn't make any difference. Not to you. It probably does to her. Seriously, Judith, lots of women have had abortions, and if you're going to live in the world with them, you can't go around staging a protest anywhere you've sniffed out a sin. Well, how would you feel if I told you she'd murdered Mr. Paley? I'd be curious to know why. Was he the father? Is that what you're implying? William, I just chose Mr. Paley as a random example. Be serious. You always say be serious when I start to win an argument and it's always the same argument. If you'd had an abortion and felt guilty about it, I could understand your being so obsessed with the idea. I don't deny it's an obsession, and that my own feelings get tangled up in it. This summer, when I went down to visit her, I found out that my mother had had an abortion before she had me. She told me that the last time she visited me in the hospital, and she added that if father had had his way, I'd have been an abortion too. I guess if you look at things from an either-or point of view, we all of us can be considered failed abortions. Judith clamped down on the impulse to laugh so that it emerged as a kind of muffled sneeze. You're just trying to provoke me. Why do you always have to act out the part of a bratty kid brother? Did I bring up the subject of abortion? Anyhow, I wouldn't necessarily credit everything your mother says on the subject of Ben. She obviously holds a grudge against him, and I wouldn't put it past her to have made up the whole thing, knowing how you'd react. Besides, that's all ancient history. Ben's certainly not guilty of promoting abortion these days, is he? Speaking of which, isn't it getting late for them to still be at their party? Mom's in no shape to party all night long. Actually, sometimes at the end of a pregnancy, there's a period when you get this great charge of energy, and you feel up to anything. That's what the book says, anyhow. It's such a miracle, isn't it? The more I think about it, the more amazing it is. Two little cells connect, and the result is everything we think, everything we do. Somehow, no matter what she said, his impulse was to contradict her. He knew he should stop it, but it was like chewing fingernails or scratching poison ivy. If you're speaking of us, there'd have been four cells— but a miracle? Why is what ova and sperm cells do any more miraculous than what cancer cells do, or hair follicles? Any cell just does what it's programmed to do. It's like a robot with a mini-computer telling it, now do this, now do that. Oh, William, you're such a romantic. It gives me goosebumps when you talk that way. I'm not saying that miracles don't happen down at the level of the individual cell, only that it's hard to tell the difference between a miracle and business as usual. We just don't know how things happen down there. We could find out, Judith said, in a tone of mock suggestiveness, which she couldn't quite bring off. When William looked up in surprise, she blushed and turned her head. 
The easiest thing to do was pretend she hadn't said it, or at least that it didn't mean what it seemed to. William erected an impromptu barricade of philosophy, trotting out a neat idea he'd discovered in a book in the school library called Six Before Breakfast, a collection pointing out the paradoxes that were involved from a scientific viewpoint in the various miracles reported in the Old and New Testaments, such as the quantity of water it would have taken to produce a global flood or how the sun could not have stood still in the sky without the earth stopping its rotation, and what the results of that would be according to the laws of inertia. This particular paradox had to do with the virgin birth and the nature of Christ's genetic makeup. Was he a haploid, with chromosomes only from his mother, or did he also have a set of chromosomes from God the Father? And if so, wouldn't it be possible at least in theory, to create a genetic map of God's chromosomes? Admittedly, there are a lot of genes in the makeup of any individual, millions, maybe billions, but still a finite number. And once gene splicing became an exact science, would it then be possible, in theory, to duplicate what God had done and create another Jesus in the laboratory? Judith listened patiently to his whole account, and when he was done, her only comment was, It's young Frankenstein all over again. Before he could insist that it was a serious theological problem, the phone rang. The cordless phone was not in its cradle, so William went into the kitchen to use the wall phone. It was Ben calling from the Reagan fundraiser to say that he and Sandra would be spending the night downtown at the Radisson, since Sandra insisted that he was too drunk to be allowed to drive home, and she was too tired. And anyhow, we're still having fun. What have you kids been up to? Any ghosts come to the door begging for candy? Not so far. We've just been sitting in front of the fireplace talking. Did you want to talk to Judith? No. Just have a happy Halloween. Ben hung up. When William returned to the fireplace, Judith's saffron tunic lay on the carpet, but Judith had left the room. Judith? he called out. You don't have to shout. I can hear you quite clearly. And I heard everything Father said over the phone. Her voice was coming out of the speakers set into the bases of several of the phones in the house. She had the cordless receiver and was using it as an intercom. In the darkness, it was easy to think of her voice as ghostly. It made him remember the times back in the Obstschmecker house when Ned would turn off all the lights and hide and start talking in the voice he used when he wanted to be scary. Did I ever tell you what I did when I was in Nashville? She hadn't, and you couldn't help wondering. Her bus ride from Florida to Minnesota had taken almost a day longer than it was supposed to. Judith had described her journey at such epic length that no one had pressed for further details, but William had noted the discrepancy. No, he said, returning to the fireside. You never did. The bus arrived in Nashville late at night and I just couldn't face sleeping another night sitting up. So I went to a hotel, and then I went to a bar and ordered a grasshopper. I was sure they wouldn't serve me, but they did. Have you ever had a grasshopper? It's a kind of mixed drink. It's just delicious. Would you like me to make you one? I know how, and there's creme de menthe in the liquor cabinet. Sure, why not? Carefully he lowered a split log onto the andirons and heaped the embers beneath into a mound high enough to crisp the white flesh of the log. While he tended the fire, the phone broadcast muffled bumpings and thumpings, and then a subdued gurgling, which must have been the blender. A green flame fanned out from the back of the log and seemed to waver in sync with the blender. Judith appeared, wearing a kimono in Halloween colors and carrying a tray with two parfait glasses. They clicked their glasses, and William agreed that a grasshopper was better than an ice cream soda. So that's how you spent the night in Nashville? Drinking grasshoppers? Not the whole night, but I did feel rebellious, sitting there in my Miami t-shirt and waiting for John Travolta to come over and ask me to dance. The only problem with that was that it wasn't a bar where people ever danced, and John Travolta wasn't there, or any other male under the age of fifty. Anyhow, I didn't want to dance. I wanted to be kissed. Ever since I saw those two movies, I couldn't think of anything but the fact that 
I was almost old enough to vote, and that I'd never been kissed. Have you? Been kissed? Not like in the movies. It always seemed like such a repulsive idea to me, putting your tongue into someone else's mouth. I couldn't see what purpose it could serve, except to stop the other person from talking. But then, seeing those movies the day I phoned you from the bus station, I realized there had to be more to it. Do you know, sometimes people spend hours kissing each other, and not doing anything else, just kissing? It dawned on William that Judith was not speculating in any idle way, that she was leading up to something. Judith, he protested, if you're thinking that you and me... Why not, she insisted. It wouldn't be incest, for heaven's sake. Why wouldn't it? Judith chuckled in a superior way. Because our biological parents are completely different. Suppose father hadn't ever met Sandra, and we met each other instead and got married, and then they met for the first time and fell in love. Would it be incest for them to get married? Of course not. Sounds like you had that all thought out ahead of time. Anyhow, I wasn't suggesting that we have sex, but I don't see why we couldn't kiss each other. Aren't you curious to know what it's like? To be perfectly honest, I find the whole idea embarrassing. More embarrassing than covering yourself with green paint and wearing a shower cap to a dance and saying you're a Martian? Maybe not more, but equally. Oh, okay, why not? I'm willing to try it, but if it's not really pleasant, we don't have to keep trying, agreed? Agreed. Should we be sitting up or lying down or what? Right the way we are is fine, but you better give me your glass first. There's more grasshoppers in the blender if you want some more later. She placed the two parfait glasses on the floor off to the side of the fireplace. The new log was burning nicely, and the bark was crackling. Judith positioned her hands on William's rib cage and on the side of his neck, but she couldn't bring herself to bring her lips nearer his. They remained in that position some time, motionless as two mannequins in a store window, smiling stiffly, as for a photographer, and avoiding looking into each other's eyes. It was like being poised to dance and waiting for a record to play. I think it would be easier, he suggested, if we closed our eyes. She nodded in agreement and closed her eyes and waited for him to take the last few centimeters of initiative. He brought his lips closer to hers, but not quite touching. His nose and upper lip were tickled with warm, feathery blasts of breath from her nostrils. Something in his chest resonated sympathetically, as though her exultations were the softest and lightest of mallets a musician uses to touch the bars of a xylophone. And their kiss, when the music came to it, was the sound that issues from that touch, involuntary, clear, and low. 51. In death, Henry could not keep from yielding completely to the embrace of all his morbid fascinations. Combustion, dissolution, the sudden rending or wrenching of any complex tissue, these were spectacles that lured him like a moth to a flame. Indeed, before the flaming log in the fireplace, the likeness amounted to identity. He was himself that log, those glowing gases, the reckless, ecstatic release of years of slow stockpiling of cell upon cell. Simultaneously, indeed, with no sense that the burning log and the awakening of the two children to sexual maturity were distinct processes, he shared in and even, in a sense, directed that first kiss and the motions flowing from it. When William's hands pressed Judith's breast, it was with a certainty of experience and a reverence for the flesh that were his father's inadvertent gift, and that gave his touch a grace, a tenderness, and an authority they would not otherwise have possessed. William did not know this, and Henry, having come this near the flame of mortality, could not have kept from the final joy of immolation. And so his visitation on that Halloween night far from serving to warn William away from what he was about to do, had helped precipitate the action. The log was reduced to soot and ashes in only a few hours. It took four days for the parallel process to be completed. Yet to Henry, outside of the arithmetical chronologies that govern mortal life, the two events seemed to begin and to end in the same moment. 
He was more fortunate than the moth in that he was allowed a little time to appreciate his final brightness. He could witness the first quick uncoilings of the filaments from which the fibers of his grandson would be knit. He saw them double and redouble, and then with a sense of both sorrow and horrible hilarity, as though only now, after so many years' experience of death, had he finally understood the joke that all skulls are grinning at. He turned away and let himself be pulled down into the darkness from which even the dead cannot arise. Henry's spirit was no more. 52. Sandra knew within moments of the delivery that something was wrong. She had remained conscious throughout, cooperating with the doctor, breathing just as she'd practiced through the months, and riding the pain when it came like a rodeo rider on a bull or a surfer on a curling wave. When it was over, she felt that moment of supreme relief, more precious than any pleasure, by which our nerves seek to excuse the fact of pain, and then she waited for her maternal rights to be accorded her. But instead of showing her the child, the two doctors and the nurse seemed to have formed a kind of barricade of their white-gowned bodies to prevent her seeing it. It was alive. She could hear it squalling. Why wasn't she allowed to see it? She tried to frame that question aloud, but already the second doctor, the anesthesiologist, was administering the gas she'd had no need for during labor. She wanted to protest. It seemed so unfair. And then with that strange lack of transition between fading away and coming to that can happen in a hospital or a dentist's office, she was in a small bright room, and Ben was lying asleep in a chair by the foot of the bed. Something awful had happened, but she no longer wished to know what it might be. She let Ben go on sleeping, and when he began to stir, she pretended to be asleep herself. The child was not dead. She had heard its first cries. There must, in that case, be something wrong with it, something visible. It must be deformed. Three days she remained in the small bright room, grateful for the unofficial quarantine she'd been placed in and for the medications that allowed her to avert whatever horrible truth was waiting to be announced the moment she seemed sufficiently alert. Perhaps in the meantime it would die, and she'd be spared ever having to know what the doctors and Ben knew to see what they'd seen that had made them unable to answer her unasked questions. Then, on the morning of the fourth day, when she awoke without even a wisp of tranquilizer on her mental horizon, and when the nurse brought her no medication before breakfast, she knew they had decided to put it off no longer. It was the doctor, not Ben, who performed the grim duty. Beginning with a little scientific lecture on the subject of genetics, the drift of which seemed to be to reassure her that it was not her fault, nor Ben's fault either, but simply a very unfortunate roll of the dice. A recessive gene could be passed on for a hundred years or more without anyone the wiser, and the rarer the gene, the more unlikely that a man who bore it would have a child by a woman who also bore it. The odds in their case had been on the order of one in twenty-five million. Impossible, therefore, either to have predicted or prevented such a contingency. Even then the lecture continued, as though there might be something worse to know. Then she realized that, in fact, the doctor was offering her the only hope left to offer, though it was couched in pieties about the need to accept the likelihood that the child would not live long, that even with the best care the hospital could provide, it would probably be dead before the new year. In that case, she asked, did she have to see it? Yes, he said. He had discussed it with her husband, and they thought it would be best. The hospital bills in these cases could quickly mount up to an extraordinary sum. Even with their hospitalization, the intensive care that such a child required could be ruinously expensive. And since in the long run, there was little to be hoped for from such treatment. Sandra understood. The child would be likelier to die at home than if they left it in the hospital. She agreed to see it, and a nurse brought it to the room, wheeling it in a little crib, as though she could not bring herself to make any closer physical contact. The corner of the sheet that formed a kind of hood over its face was folded back to reveal features so grossly misshapen, so literally horrible, that even braced by the doctor's warnings, she could not repress a cry of revulsion, 
as though it had to be put on the record at once and incontestably that she recognized no claim of motherhood or of humanity. Every facial feature had in some way or other been skewed or twisted awry. The squinting eyes, wide-spaced and slanting. The nose, a bony beak. The ears, misshapen and misplaced. But worst of all, the hair-lipped and cleft-palated mouth with the white fungus-like growths where lips should be. The mouth that, at the very moment of her own cry of revulsion and denial, opened to scream in seeming sympathy, or else to demand that which she would rather have died than to allow, to be given suckle at her breast. Take it away, she told the nurse in a whisper, and then to the doctor, leave me alone. The squalling of the thing in the crib seemed to continue long after it had been wheeled out of the room, and indeed it never really was stilled from that moment on, but like some horrible advertising jingle that replays itself even in our dreams, it went on hour after hour, day after day. In the middle of being fed its formula, it would pull away from the nipple that had momentarily gagged its misshapen mouth to scream with renewed energy, flailing its warped, polydactylous hands at the bottle as though protesting being forced to drink the artificial milk, forced to be alive and in pain. For that must have been the reason it cried. It must be in constant pain. It was not only its face and limbs that were abnormal. Beneath the rough red flaky skin, its body was a nest of anomalies. The heart congenitally diseased, the kidneys and other organs pitted with lesions. The doctors professed to be amazed that it was still alive a week after it had been taken home. And Sandra, who had been able to endure the horror of its presence only because of the doctor's unspoken promise that it would not live much longer, began to doubt that promise. She found that no matter how long it went on screaming, no matter how many hours since it had last been fed, she could not make herself go into her own bedroom where it was kept, and into which neither Judith nor William was ever admitted. A nurse had to be hired, Mrs. Ruddle, an elderly, dwarfish, terribly cheerful, practical nurse, who seemed to develop an actual affection for the child. Soon Sandra felt a horror of Mrs. Ruddle almost equal to that which she felt for the thing in the crib, but Mrs. Ruddle could not so easily be avoided. Meals had to be made for her. Her questions had to be answered, and it was necessary from time to time to pretend to take an interest in the condition and behavior of Mrs. Ruddle's charge. The nights were the hardest to bear. Then Mrs. Ruddle wasn't there, and Sandra had to lie alone in her room, listening to the rasping, irregular breath of the thing in the crib. She did not have the concentration to read, and she could not sleep. So she would watch movies on TV, using earphones to keep the thing from waking up and howling. It did anyhow, of course, at least twice a night, and then she would have to go over to the crib and roll it back and forth till the howling abated. She would not, could not bring herself to take it from its cocoon of blankets and hold it in her arms, and if its diaper was wet, it stayed wet until Mrs. Ruddle appeared at 7 a.m. She slept in the daytime, when the kids were away at school, and Ben was at the office. When they were home, she made a conscientious effort to maintain a business-as-usual attitude, cooking favorite recipes, and during dinner asking one preemptive question after another about their lives, their problems, and whether because Ben had coached them in how to deal with her, or from their own sense of tact, both William and Judith respected the unstated ground rule of all these dinner-time conversations that they were never to refer to the thing in the crib or anything associated with its presence in the house, including the unfortunate Mrs. Ruddle. Christmas approached and was allowed to go by with the most minimal festive observance, an artificial tree assembled by William and Judith on Christmas Eve and disassembled on New Year's Day, a modest exchange of presents that developed inadvertently into a comedy as it turned out that almost everyone had got almost everyone else a sweater. There were no presents, of course, for the thing in the crib. And for dinner, in defiance of all tradition, a roast beef. The one major breach of decorum had come on Christmas morning itself when only Judith got dressed to go to Mass, and then had begun to urge her family to go with her. Finally, more angry than distraught, Sandra had had to explain to her stepdaughter what ought to have been too obvious to need underlining that she did not intend to sit in a packed church and listen to a priest go on about the wonder and glory of the nativity. 
the idea seemed an obscene joke. Judith went to Mass alone. Through it all, Ben paid her the compliment of not interfering or offering advice. What advice could be given? Obviously, she was cracking under the strain. They both were. But what could be done but to wait for the thing to die, as the doctors had assured them it would? In a way, it helped that it looked so utterly inhuman. It was impossible to feel love for it, and so she would be spared the pain of mourning. Though perhaps when it did finally die and had been cremated, she might feel differently. But guilt seemed more likely than grief. Already she could feel that guilt, like another fetus inside of her, not low in her stomach, but higher, near her lungs, clawing at her rib cage as though trying to escape, to be expressed by some visible action. She began to be able to understand stories of penitents who had torn out their hair or whipped themselves with thorns. In lieu of such certifiable excesses, she took to going for long walks along the ice-slicked Willowville streets. The sidewalks were rarely shoveled out here, except the walks connecting front doors to the driveways. You had to walk in the street itself alongside the mounds built up in the gutters by the snowplows. The traffic was light in the daytime, and it was seldom necessary to step aside for a car to go by. The wind was wonderful, cold and brutal, a thief determined to snatch her fur coat away from her. It forced tears from her eyes she would not otherwise allow herself to shed. It numbed her feet and penetrated the thin leather of her gloves so that, by the time she returned home, an hour, two hours later, her hands would be stiff and red. She would go into the kitchen then and plunge her hands beneath a stream of hot water and gasp with the splendor of the pain. But she never came down with a cold or the flu, nor did the little monster, though at night she placed its crib directly in the path of the steady draft from the partly open bedroom window. They really were called monsters in the medical books, though of course they used Greek. Tarata was the word, to smooth over the fact. There was an entire branch of medicine devoted to the study of monsters, teratology, and Ben had brought home a thick textbook on the subject. In it there was a picture of another infant monster like theirs, though the one in the photograph hadn't lived an hour beyond its birth. The book said that no infant afflicted by Bradley Chambers syndrome had ever survived more than ten weeks. It was reassuring information, though she wished Ben had copied only that one page and not shown her the book. The pictures were upsetting, but she couldn't keep from looking at them and thinking. As soon as she was well enough, she would demand to have a hysterectomy. She did not want to risk becoming pregnant ever again. If she did, there would be a one in four chance that any child she and Ben had together would also be afflicted by Bradley Chambers syndrome. That was how it worked with recessive genes. She had learned a lot about heredity since she'd come home from the hospital. As the ninth week passed into the tenth, and the thing in the crib was showing every sign of setting a new record for survival with Bradley Chambers syndrome, a visitor called at the house in early afternoon, rousing Sandra from the comforting void of a deep, dreamless sleep. At first, confused, she thought the ringing of the doorbell was the smoke detector in the kitchen. Then Mrs. Ruddle appeared in the archway leading to the gallery, clutching a piece of knitting, the same sickly pink as the sweater she was bundled in, as though she were in the process of knitting herself into existence. Mrs. Winklemeyer? The little woman inquired in her piping, munchkinish voice. Are you awake? Do you want me to get the door? No, no, Mrs. Ruddle, Sandra said, alarmed at the thought of a visitor encountering the dwarfish nurse. Mrs. Ruddle, like the thing she tended, was a source of shame to Sandra, a skeleton in the closet, and must be kept a secret as much as possible. Please just go back to the bedroom. Mrs. Ruddle crinkled her thickly lipstick lips into a smile of compliance and disappeared back along the gallery. Sandra adjusted her sleep-must hair in front of the foyer mirror and then opened the door to confront, through the hoar-frosted panel of the outer door, the silhouette of a man in black. Mrs. Winklemeyer, he inquired in the soothing tones of a professional sympathizer. A funeral director, she wondered, with a brief unreasoning sense of elation. Then, through the obscuring hoarfrost, she saw the Roman collar. Yes, she replied, through the still-closed door. What do you want? He tipped his hat. 
I'm Father Youngerman, he said, from Our Lady of Mercy Parish in St. Paul. I'd like to talk with you, if I may. Youngerman, she thought, as she watched him shrug off his topcoat in the foyer. How odd that he should be called that. The first thing she'd thought, after noticing the Roman collar, was that he seemed too young to be a priest. He might well have been younger than she was. She couldn't remember ever having encountered a priest younger than herself. It was disconcerting. Without being invited, the young priest went into the living room. He looked about like a guest arriving at a party and hoping not to find himself the earliest. I don't suppose that Mr. Winklemeyer would be home at this hour? No, he's not. I realize that Our Lady of Mercy is no longer your parish, and properly I shouldn't be trespassing on Father Durling's territory here in Willowville. Sandra shrugged. It's no concern of mine. I wouldn't really say that I have a parish, since I was divorced. Father Youngerman nodded gravely. But I understand you have been bringing up your son William in the church, and that your stepdaughter, likewise, is a practicing Catholic. Even, I'm told, an ardent Catholic. What is your point, Father? Father, the word grated, he was not her father, and she resented having to address him as such. Only that I understand, from my work at the hospital, that you've had another child. She regarded him levelly, neither agreeing with nor contradicting his statement, simply waiting for him to continue. And there seems to be no record of that child's baptism. Indeed, the birth certificate says only male child. Has he been baptized? Who sent you here? No one at all, Mrs. Winklemeyer. I came on my own initiative. As I've said, this is not a parish matter. I'm here because of my own personal concern. I'm touched. I realize, of course, that you must have felt, and must still be feeling, shock and emotional distress. Even when there are no complications, childbirth can be... Spare me the sympathy card and get to the point. He grimaced. Very well. The point is simply this. I would like to baptize your child, if he's not already been baptized. I'm sorry that's out of the question. And I'm sorry, Mrs. Winklemeyer, but as a representative of Holy Mother Church, I really must insist that some arrangement be made for the child's baptism, and it really can't be postponed. Father Durling has tried to reach you on the phone, and I've tried. But we get only an answering machine. I respect your wish for privacy at this time, but my understanding is that the child is in daily peril of dying without having received the sacrament of baptism. Your duty as a mother and as a Catholic... Sandra had been waiting for the priest to have his say before she got rid of him, and the last thing she wanted was a quarrel, but his offering to instruct her in her duty as a mother was one too many. She held her hand up like a traffic cop, signaling him to stop. I have a proposition for you, she said. You want to baptize that thing in there, then you adopt it. The priest gave a little snort of incredulity. I'm sorry, Mrs. Winklemeyer, but obviously, as a priest, that's not a possibility I could even consider. In any case, it's beside the point. The point is the salvation of your child's immortal soul. I'm sure I've read in a magazine just recently about a priest adopting a kid. Anyhow, that's my proposition. Take it or leave it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Winklemeyer, but I don't understand your unwillingness to have the child baptized. The very sufferings it has gone through here below can add to its glory in heaven. But if it's denied any hope of salvation through the lack of the sacrament of baptism, do you know, until today I never realized what an insane idea that is? A little water on the forehead and a few words, and it'll go to heaven. And without the water and the words, what? Hellfire? Millions of babies must die without getting baptized. All the ones that get aborted, they all go to hell? That's God's idea of being fair? It's not for us to question the will of God, Mrs. Winklemeyer. We must accept the Church's teaching on faith. Without faith we have nothing. Really? Without faith? Without my faith? You're out of a job, I can see that. Anyhow, I don't want to get into dumb arguments. God didn't have anything to do with... I refuse to even say it's a child. It's not. It's a monster. It should never have been born, and it can't live very much longer. 
and I don't want it baptized. I don't want it even to have a name. It's like a tumor that I've had removed as far as I'm concerned, a tumor that screams and shits in diapers. I'm just waiting, that's all. Waiting? For it to die, and for you to leave. The priest took a deep breath. Can I at least see the child? I've asked you to leave. Father Youngerman? It was the piping voice of Mrs. Ruddle, who stood once again in the archway leading to the gallery. I have the baby here. She held out the bundle cradled in her arms. The priest crossed the living room toward Mrs. Ruddle. Sandra did not object at once. She was curious to watch his reaction when he saw the thing's face. It was not exaggerated, just a clenching of the jaw and a narrowing of the eyes. Then he reached into his right-hand jacket pocket and took out a strip of colored cloth, which he kissed and draped scarf-like about his neck. From the other pocket he produced a small silver flask. It was clear that he meant to go ahead with the baptism, despite her having said that he could not. Sandra considered trying to wrest Mrs. Ruddle's bundle from her by main force, but her aversion to physical contact with the thing in the nurse's arms was greater even than her anger. Instead, without having to take thought, she ran into the kitchen and opened the cupboard below the sink. There beneath the leaking drain that Ben kept saying he would fix and never did was the plastic bucket that caught the leaks. It was three-quarters full of stagnant water. She eased the bucket out from under the U-shaped curve of the pipe, spilling only a little, and hurried back to the living room, where she found Mrs. Ruddle supporting the thing's misshapen head above the big blue and white glass ashtray on the coffee table, so that the ashtray would serve as a kind of basin for the baptism. The priest was already beginning to pour the water from the silver flask, and to pronounce the words of the sacrament. I baptize thee in the name of the Father. Sandra heaved the dirty water from the bucket, and it arced out across the living room to drench the priest, Mrs. Ruddle, and the still unbaptized, still nameless child, which now began its usual caterwauling. The priest stood his ground a while, glaring in speechless rage at Sandra, so aghast at the sacrilege against his own person that he quite forgot to continue with the rigmarole of the baptism. Mrs. Ruddle, with less resources of self-confidence, retreated, the child in her arms, to the safety of the bedroom. "'I baptize thee,' she said with satisfaction, placing the empty bucket on the floor and kicking it football-style in the direction of the priest. Then, feeling inspired, she added, "'In the name of the mother, I could have you charged for assault and battery.' Beads of water were rolling down the black fabric of his jacket, and a kind of wet scuzz had glued itself, neat as a postage stamp, to the square of white collar beneath his chin. "'I asked you to leave. You wouldn't leave. I was defending my property, and my child. And if you don't leave right now, I will call the police.' He considered this a moment, then his face shifted gears. "'God forgive you, Mrs. Winklemeyer. God forgive you.' Having secured the moral high ground, he retreated to the foyer and began to put on his coat, but a regard for its silk lining decided him, instead, to carry it off draped over his arm. He hesitated in the doorway, as though he were forgetting something, and Sandra had the final satisfaction of slamming the door in his face. Only when his car, a black Audi 5000, was out of sight, did Sandra notice what it was that he'd forgotten. While he was dealing with his top coat, he'd placed the silver flask of holy water beside the decorative lighter on the whatnot, and there it remained. She picked it up and sniffed at the contents, but the holy water did not have a distinctive smell. The screw-on cap, connected to the spout by a chain of delicate links, clinked dully against the silvered sides of the flask. She looked at her face in its distorting mirror. Her forehead bulged, her eyes warped out of symmetry. She bared her teeth in a beauty contest smile and tilted the flask to exaggerate the effect of fangy ferociousness. Now she looked the true mother of her monster child. Now, but she didn't have to think what she would do now. She could simply do it the way she'd flung the water at the priest. She could still feel in her arms and deep within the muscles of her back the satisfaction of that act, a tingling and a liveness as though she'd just had a good swim. She capped the flask and snugged it into the back pocket of her jeans. She returned the plastic bucket to its place beneath the kitchen drain. There was nothing that could be done for the stains the water had made on the white carpet, 
but it was overdue for a shampooing in any case. She went to the bedroom and knocked at the door. Inside, the baby started to cry, and Mrs. Ruddle emitted a quavering, Yes? Mrs. Ruddle, I have to know if it was you who arranged for that priest to come here. Mrs. Ruddle didn't at once reply. The baby left off its howling as though sensing that its own fate was at stake. Sandra had begun to feel a strange compassion for it. Not love in the usual sense, and certainly not motherly love. More what one might feel for a character in a movie, a foreign movie, in another language, filmed in black and white. Mrs. Ruddle? Mrs. Ruddle opened the door. She had put on her quilted anorak and a winter cap with furry earlaps, and was carrying her purse and a plastic shopping bag, brimming with paperbacks, knitting, crossword puzzle magazines, and other paraphernalia of someone who was paid to sit alone and be bored for days on end. "'I'm not sorry,' she said, looking up at Sandra defiantly. "'I did what my conscience told me to do. I wouldn't treat an animal the way you treat that poor child.' You won't even let it have the dignity of a name of its own. Even a dog has a name. I don't intend to argue with you, Mrs. Ruddle. Mrs. Ruddle pushed past Sandra and stalked down the gallery and across the living room to the foyer. Sandra felt a real regret that she couldn't thank the woman for having anticipated her dismissal and for offering no protest or resistance. She had been expecting to have to make a scene. Instead, Mrs. Ruddle was practically ice-skating out of the house. It was too bad she could not offer her a kind word in parting, some token of her appreciation. But to adopt a tone of understanding or appeasement, now might delay or even prevent her setting off. The front door slammed. Sandra went over to the crib. The child, she had begun to think of it as a child, and that seemed ominous, a sign of relenting. She could not delay any longer doing what had to be done. The child was staring at her with its bug eyes, its deformed fist pressed against its lipless mouth. It was silent, as though it knew it was in danger. She tried to think what to use. A pillow from the bed would be too unwieldy. The comforter. The comforter Mrs. Ruddle had knitted from her endless skein of pink yarn, and that hung now on the back of the slat-backed chair at the head of the crib. She took the comforter's satin-bound hem in her hand and pulled it free from the chair. It could not have weighed more than a pound, had there ever been an unlikelier murder weapon. There really was nothing else to be done. The thing showed no sign of sickening. It might live on for years, in constant pain itself and making a nightmare of everyone else's life. You could see what it had done to Madge Michaels to be burdened with her bed-bound vegetable of a son. And Ned was no monster. But this one, if it lived. Always before that, if... Sandra averted her imagination, as she averted her eyes whenever she saw its face. She draped the comforter over the headboard of the crib, and from her back pocket took the flask of holy water. Now that she'd finally resolved to kill the child, she was willing to concede that it was, legally, theologically, human. She would baptize it herself, and if there was a heaven that only the baptized had access to, then it would arrive, take it in hand. She trickled the holy water over its head and recited the simple formula she'd not allowed the priest to complete. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then she took the pink comforter, folded it to a fourfold thickness, pressed it to the child's face, and held it in place firmly till the feeble flailings of its arms and legs had ceased, and it had stopped breathing. After all the weeks of agonizing, how easy it had been! As though death were a sunlit room that one entered by a door that said, Keep out! You only had to ignore the sign and enter. She felt a hesitant confidence, like the first time she'd driven a car after two months of driver's training classes. More a hope than a confidence, a hope that suicide would be no more difficult than murder. She located the bottle of sleeping pills, still nearly full, at the back of the drawer of the bedside table. She took five of them at once, using the holy water remaining in the flask to wash them down. Then she remembered her doctor's warning never to take alcohol and the two and all at the same time, since the combination was a recipe for instant oblivion. She didn't want to leave the bedroom. The corpse in the crib lent the room a steadying sense of peace and finality that she would not find elsewhere in the house. But it wouldn't do to put off getting the liquor. She might fall asleep, merely asleep 
if she didn't act at once. The sideboard that served as a liquor cabinet had been substantially depleted in the past few weeks. She and Ben had both been drinking heavily, and neither had bothered to restock it. She had a choice of sherry, creme de menthe, vermouth, a Christian brother's brandy, and tequila. The brandy seemed least vomit-making, and the fact that it had been a present from one of her own poor relations, an uncle visiting the Twin Cities for a family funeral, gave it a spice of poetic justice. She poured some into a snifter, added the last of the holy water to take away the worst of the sting, and washed down another ten tablets. Then she refilled the snifter, and considered whether to return to the bedroom or to remain in the living room, which seemed, now that she was here, the most suitable part of the house to die, with its oversized waiting-room-style furniture, its chilly colors, its stripped bare anonymity. What a comment it was on their life! She slumped down on the sectional and stared up at the nubbly stucco of the ceiling. She could feel the first wave of wooziness dimming her thoughts. It was a surprisingly pleasant sensation. She'd always wondered what it would be like to die. Everyone must. You hoped it wouldn't be too painful or go on too long. She'd thought a sudden violent accident might be best, the way Henry had died. She'd almost envied him the ease of it. Cancer must be the worst. Crabs eating you up from inside. Horrible. She took another sip of the brandy and felt some delicate digestive balance tipping from well-being to queasiness. She must avoid throwing up. If she botched her suicide, she would almost certainly end up in prison for murdering the baby. She couldn't expect a jury to be sympathetic. People said suicide was a way of cheating death, but she'd always been a cheater. She didn't mind that. She'd cheated on Henry, and it hadn't bothered her at all. If she hadn't cheated on Ben, it was only because she hadn't been tempted to. Her life had been comfortable. She was lazy. One day just followed the next, problem-free, no complaints. But characterless, like this room. She decided that, after all, she'd rather die in the bedroom and placed the snifter carefully on the coffee table beside the blue and white glass ashtray. Getting to her feet took all the concentration she could muster. Walking was next to impossible. Her body seemed to want to tip forward from her hips. The white carpet stretched out in front of her like the sands of some vast desert. The light had become much too bright. She had a nagging sense of having left something important undone, and as she reached the bedroom door, she remembered that she'd not said, Amen, at the end of the baptism. Would it work without the Amen? Was it too late to add it now? Her hand was on the doorknob, but she wasn't able to twist it round so that the door would open. She began to tip forward at her hips, and this time she couldn't keep from falling forward. As she lay on the carpet, she tried to whisper the Amen of the baptism. But not even her lips and tongue would do what she asked now. It didn't matter, really. God couldn't be as stupid as all that. She closed her eyes and yielded gratefully to the ease and comfort of her death. 53. Ben asked Mrs. Ruddle to wait in the car until he'd had a chance to talk to Sandra and be certain she'd calmed down. Mrs. Ruddle was herself in such a state of fretfulness that, though normally taciturn and unforthcoming, she had already twice recounted the tale of Father Youngerman's visit and his abortive attempt to baptize the poor child. One moment she would be effusively apologetic for having contacted the priest, the next she would be fuming at Sandra for having emptied the bucket of water on the priest. I was soaked through myself, but that's no matter. I don't blame her. She was so upset she didn't know what she was doing. But a priest, to do that to a priest— Mrs. Ruddle's two declared objects in returning home with Ben were to offer an apology to Sandra, and try to get her job back, and, if the apology failed of its desired effect, to retrieve various of her possessions that she'd forgotten in the excitement of her first leave-taking. An umbrella, overshoes, a box of decaffeinated tea-bags, and a hand-knitted comforter she'd left by the baby's crib. And what's going to happen to that poor child without me there, I'm sure I don't know. Ben had managed to keep the lid on his own temper through Mrs. Ruddle's non-stop monologue, though the cumulative effect of it was almost as maddening as being kept awake by the baby's screams. She had arrived at his office in mid-afternoon and refused to take Mrs. O'Meara's hint that he was in a meeting. She'd simply outwaited him until, at four o'clock, he'd agreed to see her, and the long whine began. 
Listening to Mrs. Ruddle carry on was like hearing the baby's strident, non-negotiable demands rescored for an adult voice. No wonder Sandra had finally cracked under the strain of having to contend every day with the pair of them, the baby and its nurse. By the time they had got back to Willowville, Ben was inclined to think that of the two, Mrs. Ruddle was the worse. Though it was after sunset, there wasn't a light on in the house, not even the flicker of a TV screen. But that only meant, Ben supposed, that Sandra was taking a nap, and that the kids had stayed late after school. Sandra, he called out, as he went round the living room from lamp to wall switch, turning on the lights. There was an almost empty snifter on the coffee table, standing in a puddle of spilled brandy. Sandra, he repeated, raising his voice. He looked into his office, where she would sometimes nap on the leather sofa in order to be away from the baby, but there was no sign of her there, or in his bedroom. Even when he found her sprawled in the hallway outside the door to her own bedroom, his first assumption, remembering the snifter, was that she was drunk, and when he stooped to lift her up and carry her to the bed, it was with a smile of commiseration and indulgence. Only as he entered the room with the weight of her in his arms did he realize, from the utter limpness of her neck and arms, that this was not drunkenness but death. He placed her on the floor so as to administer mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, though he knew from the coldness of her hands and face that it was too late. Then, as he drew the first breath that he meant to force into her stilled lungs, the thing in the crib began to cry. Just a feeble whimper at first, then a second cry, louder, but with a catch in it, as though it were having some mechanical difficulty. Even before he looked into the crib and seen the folded comforter still covering the child's nasty little face, Ben understood what had happened. Sandra had thought she'd put the thing out of its misery, and then, unable to bear the guilt of her action, had committed suicide. But the guilt was his. He'd known for weeks what he ought to have done. He should have murdered the brat himself, not left it to his wife. Infanticide is a man's job, and he could have done it with as little qualms of conscience as Herod himself. It was only the fear of being suspected and brought to trial that had stopped him. And now Sandra was dead, and the little fucker was still alive and ready to continue the long scream of its existence. No, he would not allow Sandra's death to have been nothing but a bad joke. He lifted the screaming infant by its throat and squeezed. The grotesque face turned cherry red, and its tongue protruded from the doubly deformed mouth. He shook its carcass until he felt something snap, and then, resisting the urge to hurl it for good measure against the wall, he dropped it into the crib, wishing that crib were a bottomless pit, an incinerator, a grave. He hadn't realized, until his hand had been about its neck, the depth of his hatred for the thing. Sandra's suicide seemed more comprehensible now. She must have felt the same satisfaction in the thought of its death, instead of remorse or guilt or some more morally appropriate response. Instead, this obscene elation, this pride, as though he'd defeated some enemy in single combat. What a cesspool the human heart is! Or as someone famous had said, probably Shakespeare in one of his plays, What a piece of shit is man! He replaced the comforter on the baby's face. Again he took up Sandra's body. It had seemed light before, now it was almost beyond his strength, and carried her from the room. Despite his having told her to stay in the car, Mrs. Ruddle had come into the house. William and Judith were with her. At the first sight of Sandra's body in her husband's arms, Mrs. Ruddle became officiously professional, ordering Ben to place the body on the sectional for her to look at, ordering William to phone the hospital. I am taking her to the hospital myself, Ben insisted. That will be faster than waiting for an ambulance. William, would you open the door for me? The baby, Judith said. How is the baby? The baby's dead. No, Mrs. Russell insisted, with calm nursey authority. That can't be. Don't you understand? He glared at the nurse, trying to assert his own authority. Sandra killed the baby, and then she killed herself. No, the baby's still alive. I heard him just moments after we came in the door. He was crying, and then he stopped suddenly. We all heard it. She turned to William. Didn't we? William shook his head. I didn't hear anything. You must have mistaken what you heard, Mrs. Ruddle. The child is dead. See for yourself. But there might still be hope for Sandra. I must get her to a hospital. In fact, he was desperate to get out of the house and away from Mrs. Ruddle. 
William went to the front door and held it open. Mrs. Ruddle grasped Judith by the arm. You heard the baby crying, didn't you? Didn't you? Judith looked at her father and looked away. She needed no further explanation. She understood everything that had happened. She nodded her head. Yes, I heard the baby crying. Mrs. Ruddle tightened her crimsoned lips in a grimace of triumph and went to the telephone. She dialed 911, and when the operator came on the line, she asked for the police. Ben lowered Sandra's corpse to the sectional. He looked at Judith. Judith looked down at the stain on the carpet. William in the foyer closed the door. From this point it all seemed inevitable. The arraignment, the indictment, the trial, and the verdict. Ben Winklemeyer had killed his nameless infant son. That had been established. The only question that remained was whether he'd be allowed to plea bargain down from a charge of murder in the first degree. With chagrin for his own stupidity and admiration for her own larger courage, Ben kissed his wife and waited for the police. 54. So far, two weeks into the month, April had not represented much of an improvement on March. The streets had stopped being slushy, and most lawns had progressed from tawny to green, but the weather was weather that only a garden could love with one gray day after another, and the temperature seldom rising into the fifties. The last two weekends had been cold and drizzly, and now on the first day of Easter vacation there was a steady, coat-sopping rain that had been coming down since early morning. He ached to be away from the house, where he felt as much a prisoner of his bedroom as if he were Ned. The Obstsmacker house no longer registered as a great mansion the way it had when he was a kid. He missed the wide-open, unpartitioned arrangement of the Winklemeyer Ranch House. This place was like the house for small mammals at the Como Zoo, a honeycomb of separate little burrows, each generating its own peculiar smell, which mingled into a single overwhelming mammalian stench. Theoretically, after you've lived with any smell long enough, you're supposed to get acclimatized to it so that it becomes as undetectable as your own bad breath. But William had been back here for two months already, and every time he came in the house he recoiled at the amalgamated smells of Ned's bedside diaper pail, wood rot, burnt milk, ashtrays, in pungent and varied association with the twice-daily mistings of Grandma O's favorite pine-scented air freshener. Usually he was able to focus on schoolwork, even with his knack for assimilating science textbooks directly into his bloodstream as systems of self-evident truths, even with the apple assisting at his homework, there was a certain amount of drudgery that had to be accomplished to meet the demands of his physics and chemistry teachers. For English there was an unending slog of books to be read, Pride and Prejudice, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, 1984, preachy, long-winded novels that you had to appreciate according to the lights of the English teacher, Mrs. Sims. It was a lot like catechism classes back at Our Lady of Mercy, only you had to be able to produce the correct answers in your own words instead of just reciting them. American history was much the same, except that Mr. Robb prudently had retarded the march of time so that his class would not encounter any living controversies that might get someone's parents fussed. It was halfway through April, and they had just arrived at the causes of World War I. He had to produce five hundred words on that subject for Monday's class. It wouldn't do to say stupidity or greed and leave it at that. Mr. Robb required heroes and villains and ethical problems with three reasons in favor and three against, and that meant an elaborate paraphrase of the official version set forth in their textbook, Sea to Shining Sea, which he would do, just as he'd done it for the greatness of Theodore Roosevelt and the importance of the railroad in the winning of the West, with the intended result that he was now pulling down an A- minus in Rob's class, though probably more as a mark of sympathy than because of his perfunctory paint-by-the-number essays. Lila Gerhardt, to do her credit, had had his number on that score. His mother's suicide and Ben's being sentenced to five years in prison had made both William and Judith pariahs at St. Tom's, not out of meanness on anyone's part, but because no one knew what to say to them. And then 
when it began to be clear, on top of all the rest of it, that Judith was pregnant, and when the rumor sprang up, natural as a weed, that the father of her child was her own father, who'd already pleaded guilty, after all, to killing his infant son, it had become impossible for Judith to remain at St. Tom's. If her pregnancy became known to the press, the publicity would be fatal. Mr. Paley was too much the diplomat, however, to expel an honor student with a chance at becoming valedictorian. Instead, she'd been given her diploma early in March, whereupon she'd flown off to her mother in Florida, beyond the reach of scandal. And so, after all those years, Rhoda Winklemeyer had at last won the long-fought battle for the custody of her daughter. William had not asked for, nor would he have accepted, an early discharge from St. Tom's, since it would have entailed his leaving the early admissions program, diplomaless, and having to go to another school for a retread of his senior year, a grim prospect. In any case, the easiest way to avoid being buried by an avalanche of bad feelings was to concentrate on nailing down good grades. He studied the way that kids in Japan are supposed to study, to the exclusion of everything else, as though his life depended on it. It wasn't that he didn't feel real grief. He felt terrible about what had happened, and dreaded that worse might still be in store. But what could he accomplish by dropping out of school? It helped to have something to do, a routine to follow, meals to eat, tasks to complete, a life he could pretend to live. If you pretended long enough, it would start to be real. Six more weeks and he'd have his diploma, and then he would start his first courses at the U, and never mind summer vacation. Six weeks was nothing. There were people in the Guinness Book of Records who lived in cages filled with poisonous snakes for longer than six weeks. Such were his good intentions, and usually his willpower could be counted on to carry them out. Sometimes, though, he did get antsy, or angry, or depressed to the point where he had to do something, not just sit around and study or fool with the apple or watch TV, but to feel himself exert an influence on the world. He had to use the caduceus and feel its power. But not, he'd promised himself, on people, not any more. Reminded by the continued well-being of the elm in the backyard, and of the other elms in Brosner Park, whose lives and limbs he'd saved, he confined the use of his power to strictly arboreal ends, tying bits of yellow yarn to the trees he meant to doom, often beside frayed yellow ribbons left over from the hostage crisis, and bits of red yarn to any surviving elms. Only in the past two weeks, as the first buds had opened on the trees, or not opened, had the results of his ministrations become apparent. All along the row of newly built condos that Madge had taken such a dislike to, the seedling maples had expired, their brittle young skeletons lifeless as the tiny plots of sod about them. But against those plants that William would most like to have seen perish, that is, the dense curtains of hanging plants darkening so many rooms of the Obstschmecker house, the caduceus's power was unavailing, for it had been through that power originally that these plants had acquired their extraordinary vigor. Pot-bound, malnourished, cut back and cursed, nothing could inhibit their kudzu-like vitality. Whether for good or ill, what the caduceus once had done, it could not later undo. He had not, therefore, used the caduceus to confer the gift of unfailing good health on the fetus in Judith's womb, as he had blessed his brother. Any infant suffering Bradley Chambers syndrome was supposed to be unviable, but who knows how long it might have gone on living or what it might have become if Ben had not murdered it. And because William was his mother's son and Judith her father's daughter, there was a chance— a lesser chance than with their parents, but not negligible, that a child born from their union might also have Bradley Chambers syndrome. The odds when both parents had that recessive gene was one in four, and the odds that you would pass on the recessive gene to otherwise normal children was one in two. So, a one in sixteen risk, and there was no test to determine whether he or Judith carried the gene. The proof was in the pudding. It was, however, possible to determine, by amniocentesis, whether the fetus was afflicted with Bradley Chambers syndrome. But this Judith refused to do. It would be pointless for me, 
she'd say when they'd last discussed it the night before she was to fly to Florida. It would only make the remaining months of the pregnancy more difficult if the test results were positive. You certainly can't suppose that I'd have an abortion, not after all you've heard me say on the subject. You never saw what that thing looked like, William had said darkly. Whatever it looked like, it was a human being. Anyhow, that's not true. I did see it. I paid Mrs. Ruddle five dollars to let me come in when Sandra wasn't there and to hold the baby. I felt guilty going behind Sandra's back, but I felt I had to know. You've heard the thing screaming. It was always in pain, every minute of its life. If you had a pet that was in constant pain, you'd have the kindness to put it out of its misery. But to another human being, you wouldn't show the kindness you'd show a pet. As I recall, that was one of the arguments that Father's attorney used at the sentencing. It didn't convince the judge, and it doesn't convince me. I'm really disappointed in you, William, that you should stand there and argue in favor of your own child's murder. I thought you had more decency than that. I'm only arguing in favor of amniocentesis, of our knowing where we stand. Whatever it is, it's me who's standing there, not you, and there is no valid medical reason for undertaking such a risk. There is a risk with amniocentesis, you know, one chance in a hundred and fifty of inducing a miscarriage, and no benefit to be derived, except knowledge. We'll know soon enough in any case. In July, my doctor says. When they'd had that conversation, abortion had still been a theoretical possibility. Now, with the pregnancy just two weeks short of the third trimester, that hope was gone. And William had entertained the hope. Not that Judith would ever have agreed to it. He knew quite well she never would. But there was a good chance with Bradley Chambers' cases that the fetus would abort spontaneously. Beyond that worst-case possibility, even if the baby were as normal as one of the Waltons on the TV show, William did not want to be a father at the age of fourteen. And if he ever did become a father, he didn't want Judith to be the mother of his child. Technically, it might not be incest, but it felt like incest, and it would look like incest to other people. Marrying Judith would be a lifelong embarrassment, even supposing it was what they both wanted, which it wasn't. He couldn't understand now how they could have been so dumb or so careless. It wasn't as though they'd been driven by some overwhelming passion. It was more like a project they'd undertaken for a science class, at least in the preliminary stages. Judith hadn't taken any precautions because that was against her principles, but she had let William do what he could on his own by way of avoiding a baby. And except for one time— the night of Reagan's election, when Ben and Sandra had been out of the house to another fundraiser at a downtown hotel, William had always been wearing a condom. But that once, obviously, had been enough. So far Ben didn't know anything. He'd been too wrapped up in his own legal problems to pay much attention to anything that was happening around him, and now he was in prison and Judith was in Florida, and all their visits were over the phone. Rhoda knew Judith was pregnant. That was unavoidable but Judith had promised William not to tell her mother who had played Romeo to her Juliet. However, if the baby should prove to have Bradley Chambers syndrome, then Judith's silence would be beside the point. The chances that anyone but Ben or William could have been the father were on the order of twenty-five million to one. Talk about leaving fingerprints at the scene of the crime. Sometimes, thinking how unnecessary all this anxiety was, how easy it would have been to have taken a simple test and known for sure, William wanted to climb the walls. Several times he'd phoned Judith in Florida, but whenever he'd worked the conversation around to the subject, Judith would say they couldn't talk because her mother might be listening on the extension line. And now she stopped answering the phone at all. When he called, he got either an answering machine or Rhoda. He was helpless. There was nothing he could do, nothing but wait. Wait for the rain to stop raining, wait for graduation, wait for the baby to be born. One in sixteen wasn't bad odds. In Russian roulette your odds were only one in six, and lots of people played Russian roulette and won. At noon he shared a can of chicken noodle with Grandma O, and then he put on rubber rain boots and a plastic poncho and went out to brave the elements. Under the poncho a nylon backpack produced a hunchback-shaped bulge, Inside the knapsack, 
wrapped in saran wrap to keep any more of the original bark from shredding off it, was the caduceus. Without even having to touch it, he could feel the power stored inside, a constant tingling in the small of his back, as though his nerves were wired into it. He could almost see himself as one of those battery-operated robots that had replaced model trains as every kid's favorite Christmas present. For a while he lurched along the puddled pavement robot style, not bending his legs at the knee, swiveling his head from side to side in quick ratchety twitches. But that got dull, since there was no one else out of doors in such weather to pay attention, and anyhow he was too old now, only a few months from starting at the U, for that kind of goofing off. The rain got worse, and he decided to get himself a quarter bag of potato chips, then admit defeat and head back home. He went into the little grocery at the corner of Coglin and Austin and took a bag of old Dutch potato chips from the bottom shelf of the Crunchy's rack. Only when he got to the counter and was digging into his pants pocket for the quarter did he realize that he'd forgotten to transfer his billfold, change, and the house key from yesterday's pants to today's. Madge was at work, and Grandma O. had gone up to Ned's room after lunch to watch as the world turns. Once she'd settled in her rocker, she would probably stay with Ned until General Hospital was over at three o'clock, and William knew from past experience that she was deaf to the doorbell, knocking, and even the telephone when she was upstairs with the TV on. No doubt that was why she was willing to make the effort of going upstairs. He looked at the old man behind the counter, who was waiting for the quarter, and explained, I'm sorry, I left my money at home. That's okay, the old man said, with a prissy smile like Mr. Whipple in the toilet paper ads. You can leave your money home and that bag of chips here. He bent forward over the counter and appropriated the bag of potato chips. William was peeved. I've bought all kinds of stuff here. I'm in here almost every other day. And I can't have credit for a quarter bag of potato chips? Store policy, the grocer said, nodding his head knowingly. The sign's right up there, over the cigarettes. I'll read it for you, if the print's too small. In God we trust, all others pay cash. He repeated his mean little smile. Sorry. Yeah, sure. I can see you're real sorry. William stalked out of the store and stood fuming in the shallow recess of the doorway. The rain had got heavier in just a little while he'd been in the store, so heavy that even wearing the poncho he'd be soaked by the time he walked a block. For that matter, he'd soon be soaked standing here in the doorway. There was a big canvas awning that spanned the front window of the store that would have served quite well as an umbrella, but it was rolled up tight. Whipple probably only opened the awning if you paid him admission. Sorry. William could have made the old asshole know what sorry was if he hadn't made it a principle not to use the caduceus on people any more, whether for good or for ill. In the past few weeks, since moving back to the Obstschmecker house, he'd come to have second thoughts about almost everything he'd done with it. Not regrets, exactly. Jimmy Dieters, Miss Gerhardt, the bigwigs at ATA, they'd all got what was coming to them. But maybe his punishments had been too drastic. Maybe he'd been what's called a hanging judge. It might have been better to have gone easier on some of the people at ATA and given them just a smoker's cough. What is it called? Emphysema, instead of terminal cancer. A temporary problem that would go away after a while, or that could be reversed. How often, hearing his little brother screaming in endless, irremediable pain, he'd wished he could have taken away the perfect health that for him had been only a curse. Health is no blessing when you live in a torture chamber. If he could take away what he gave, or give back what he took away, if each curse or blessing could be like a door that could be gone in or out of, locked or unlocked by the caduceus's power. There was a sharp rapping on the glass of the door. He turned around to see the grocer gesturing at him to move away from the doorway. You're blocking traffic, the old man shouted through the glass. At the same instant as the rapping, he felt in the small of his back a zap of something that was neither electricity nor warmth. As though the caduceus itself were reacting to the possibility of its being used as a key. He smiled at the old man behind the glass, and walked off into the rain with a genuine sense of delight, happy to pay the price of a soaking for the idea 
which he might not have had in any other set of circumstances, of a curse, or blessing, that worked like a lock. He began to work out the details as he walked through the pelting rain, which was no enemy now but the outward and seemingly inevitable expression of his own state of mind. By the time he'd got to the next corner everything was in place but the rhymes. And then, noticing a payphone that shared the same pole as the traffic light, he had an inspired hunch and reached into the coin return slot to see if there was a quarter someone had left behind. When he found that there was, he wasn't even surprised at the world's being so ready to fall in with his plans. The glow that still radiated from the mid-small of his back, making every muscle a conscious entity, that glow seemed also to guarantee the success of any action he might undertake. He felt infallible as a pope. If he'd had a basketball in his hands and aimed it at a hoop all the way at the other end of the court, he'd have made a basket at that moment. If he'd been playing cards, he'd have drawn the card he needed to complete a royal flush. There was a great flash of lightning and then a splendid, long, lingering roll of thunder. Heaven itself seemed to agree. Across the street, catter corner from the phone booth, was a shelter for a bus stop. There were two people in it, and then, by another act of providence, the Coglan Como bus came along and scooped up the two people and carried them off. He crossed the otherwise untrafficked street and took refuge in the bus shelter, where in no time at all he had four lines that would do the job. Deftly he slid the knapsack off his shoulders and, crouching, took out the caduceus and stripped off its protective cellophane. He touched the caduceus to the quarter he'd found in the payphone and spoke aloud the verses of his improved, reversible incantation. How much will my quarter buy? A sty, a sty beneath your eye. There shall it swell until the day my second quarter takes it away. Then he returned to the store and bought himself a bag of potato chips. Book Five Fifty-five. Launce Hill was sitting on top of his black sample case on the shoulder of State Highway 32, some twenty-five miles southeast from Crookston, and almost exactly a hundred miles south of the border. He was waiting for a ride, without any immediate hope of getting one, but that didn't matter. There'd be more traffic later in the afternoon. Meanwhile, counting his blessings, he figured he was beyond the range of the border patrols, Plus, he'd managed to keep down the breakfast he'd eaten at the truck stop outside Crookston. Dry toast, oatmeal, and skim milk. Each swallow of milk had felt as luxurious as slipping on a cool silk pajama top after a hot bath. All the time now he felt he was burning up. Not his skin, he'd been careful to keep from getting a sunburn, but inside, as though his flesh were slowly being roasted in a microwave. A car appeared at the far horizon, and Launce hauled himself to his feet and held out his thumb. The car didn't even slow down. The fat woman behind the wheel knit her brow and squinted dead ahead, so intent on the highway that she didn't know he was there. If her husband had been driving, he'd probably have given a hitchhiker the finger. Men have an easier time expressing feelings of hatred and naked aggression. It's their early training with toy guns. As the car sped by, Launch shot the fat woman with his trusty fingertip forty-five, then sat back down on his sample case. Even as small an effort as that made him wheezy, and the dust raised by the car attacked his eyes like a swarm of gnats and released a slow trickle of poison tears. The Minnesota weeds were beautiful, higher and bushier than Canadian weeds, and the tears in his eyes acted like lenses to bring far-off flowers into focus. The splinters of death in his soul gave them a gleam of ineffable beauty. Everything turned to poetry when you knew you were dying, even the road kills. But, he had to keep reminding himself, he wasn't dying. He had survived AIDS, despite testing HIV positive for six long years, and he would survive Arvids, for which AIDS had been merely an appetizer. He'd hung in till they'd come up with a cure, at which point along came mystery plague number two. But medical defense systems had cured cases more advanced than Launce's. All he had to do was get there. Another 250 miles. A mud-spattered yellow pickup with an unmatched gray left fender approached from the south, slowed as it passed by Launce, and executed a U-turn 50 yards up the road. This time, as the pickup drew near, it came to a stop. 
Lawrence picked up his sample case and approached the window of the pickup with misgivings. I'm only going down as far as the turn off to Ada, the driver announced in a tone of challenge. He was a squat, red-faced old fart with a visor cap that advertised Chippewa Bait and Tackle. Uh, that's okay. Launce set his case down on the shoulder of the road. The guy had a mean face, and it didn't make sense his changing direction to accommodate a hitchhiker. Only a highway patrolman would do that. I'm going a lot further. Into the cities? Uh-huh. Well, you'll have a better chance getting a ride going south after Route 200. So get in. Just be careful with the coffee can on the seat there. It's full of worms. Reluctantly, Launce got in the cab of the pickup, setting the rusted Folgers can on the floor, positioning his sample case on his lap, folding his hands atop the sample case. Without prompting, he began to reinvent the story that had already served to allay the suspicions of three earlier drivers. The family reunion at the Agassiz Wildlife Refuge, the fishing accident, the dead battery, a plausible, slightly farcical mix of family crises and automobile treasons leading to his present carless dilemma. His audience didn't seem amused. From time to time the driver would swivel sideways to glower at Launce, but never cracked a smile or said a word in response, not so much as, is that so? As a salesman, Launce was familiar with the type. Someone like this who combines raw ugliness with other social disadvantages must actively resent smiles and small talk. The man was probably only happy at a lynching. Add to that the incalculable element of pheromonal response. Some straights had a nose for gaze that was like a bird dog flushing out pheasants from the corn stubble. When they reached Route 200, the driver took a right turn and kept on driving. Hey, Launce pointed out, that's where I get off. The driver didn't say a thing, just gave Launce another sideways glance and stepped on the gas. The speedometer needle edged up to its high noon position of fifty miles per hour. Launce knew, without the driver's announcing his intentions, that he was being escorted to the local health authority, who would only have to test his saliva, and Launce would be on a greased slide to the nearest plague camp. He sighed. Then, since there was no real alternative, he dipped his hand inside his jacket pocket, thumbed off the safety of the Lady Winchester, a pretty little handgun manufactured at the end of the eighties for the defensive needs of the fair sex, and held it up to the plastic webbing of the visored hat. "'I think you're driving too fast,' he shouted into the old fart's ear. "'I wish you would drive more slowly.' When instead the old fart floored the gas pedal, Launce pulled the trigger and the bullet went right through the man's skull and out the open window of the pickup. The hands did not at once lose their grip on the steering wheel, and the foot continued to bear down on the gas pedal. This went on long enough for Launce to wonder if he'd fired a blank, and then the head drooped to one side and blood seeped out of the bullet hole and dripped on the bib of his overalls. Launce got hold of the wheel just in time to keep them from going into a tailspin. He was as much concerned to keep his jacket from getting bloodied as with keeping the truck on the road. He didn't have a second suit with him. As the pickup coasted round a bend, the water tower, trees, and rooftops of the town of Ada came into view. Launce managed to nudge the corpse's foot off the gas pedal and towed the brake. The pickup rolled to a stop beside a sign welcoming Launce to Ada, population 784. Make that seven hundred and eighty-three, the eternal proofreader in his soul corrected. He got out of the cab, and after he'd unloosed the corpse from the safety belt, he tugged it to the passenger side of the car, grasping only the unbloodied bib of the overalls. In the process, he overturned the can of worms he'd been warned not to spill. He'd always had a horror of worms, and these were night crawlers, fat as garden snakes, and all in a frenzy of hope now that they were out of the coffee can. Launce could sympathize with them. Who better? But he could not bring himself actually to pick them up in his fingers and drop them into the ditch beside the road. He positioned the corpse's booted feet carefully on the floor mat so that none of the worms were injured, then slammed the door shut and went round to the driver's side of the car. The engine was still running and the road was clear in both directions. For the first time in his life since taking his driver's license exam at the age of seventeen, he executed a perfect K-turn. The corpse tipped first to the right and then to the left. 
Launce pulled to the side of the road, fastened the corpse's seat belt and his own, and headed back to State Highway 32 at a moderate 45 miles per hour. This was the first time in his life he'd ever killed anyone, and he felt a rush of pit-a-pat hyperkinetic coming-of-age glory, which was also, like an inappropriate hard-on, a little embarrassing, since theoretically he didn't approve of the machismo of homicide. He'd been sincere in his draft-dodging days in wanting to make love, not war. It occurred to him that the corpse beside him might well be, or rather the proofreader amended, have been, a Vietnam vet. He was the right age and social class, and the kind of good citizen who follows the rules, such as the rule to report suspicious strangers to the health authority. It further occurred to him that he ought to find out who his victim was, had been, and what, such as money, he might have on him. In any case, not to show some curiosity at such a time would add insult to injury. He had not yet sunk to the subhuman level of some mass murderer who just sprays bullets willy-nilly, killing anyone in his path. If he killed someone, he should at least know his name. His name was Ray Bonner, and he was, like Launce, a Leo, which figured it's never wise for one Leo to thwart another. Now he knew. Forty-six dollars in cash, two useless credit cards, and a gasomat credit card with the confirmation number written right across the back, just the way you're warned not to do. There were sunglasses in the blood-sodden pocket of the overall's bib, and these launts fitted over the corpse's nose and ears. From the same pocket he took a pack of cigarettes and lit, his fingers were beginning to tremble, two, one for himself, and inserted the other, dangling, into the corner of the corpse's mouth. It seemed a proper sort of funeral pomp for someone like Ray Bonner. After the foolish indulgence of the cigarette, but when you think you're dying it's hard to just say no, Launce unwound, focusing on the muscles of his neck and shoulders, humming his own private mantra he'd paid one hundred and fifty dollars for at the start of his TM course back in the lost paradise of Toronto, 1975. Shamu Ermi Zama The fellow who'd run the course had been a perfect charlatan, but a perfect hunk as well, and Launce hadn't in the least regretted spending one hundred and fifty dollars for three nonsense words. Indeed, they'd always worked quite well for him. Shamu Ermi Zama. His spiritual leader had chanted it along with him, his fingers digging into Launce's trapezius muscles. Shamu Ermi Zama. It always did the job. 56. On the Sunday before Memorial Day, it had rained all day long and the rain had continued through the next day, and the next Sunday it had looked like rain again, and Madge had said she had a headache and disappeared as soon as the sun came out, so here it was two weeks after Memorial Day, and Mrs. Obstschmecker had yet to visit Mr. Obstschmecker's grave at Veteran Cemetery, or even make it to Mass at OLM. For the first time in how many years? She took down the notepad from its holder beside the phone on the kitchen wall and did the arithmetic. 1999 minus 1970 equals 29. Twenty-nine years she had faithfully visited Mr. Obstschmecker's grave, bringing him irises from the back yard, and now there wasn't one iris left. She felt peeved. It would mean buying flowers at a florist, and the price of even a small bouquet these days was outrageous. Not that Mrs. Obstschmecker had been to a florist recently, but Madge was always bringing home these gigantic arrangements and claiming to have paid fifty or sixty dollars for them. For flowers. Mrs. Obstschmecker suspected that she was making off with them from the clinic and that these were the bouquets of patients, who were all vegetables like Ned, and so couldn't really have appreciated them. And they did make the house look lovelier, so why make a fuss? That was Mrs. Obstschmecker's philosophy. The boy was supposed to arrive at nine o'clock, and it was only seven-thirty now. Madge was still asleep, but Mrs. Obstschmecker always awoke once it got to be light, which meant six-thirty these days. She blamed the early sunrise on daylight savings time, though Madge said it was the other way round. Maybe she was right. In any case, six-thirty was just too early to be waking up if you didn't have a job to go to or somebody's breakfast to make. 
Already the dawn had brightened to full morning, and the X's of the security gates were sharply defined against the lowered window blinds. Now a new silhouette appeared on the blinds, a squirrel. It scampered up the iron lattice and paused at the point from which it could best launch itself toward the bird feeder hanging from the lowest limb of the elm. Shoo! Mrs. Obst Schmecker called out. Shoo! Go away! She shuffled in her slippered feet toward the window, but before she could get there to raise the blind and wrap a protest against the glass, the squirrel made its leap. And there the nasty little thief was, when the blind was up, clinging to the swinging plastic cylinder, stuffing himself with bird seed and staring back at her with his beady little black eyes blazing defiance. She rapped and shouted for the squirrel to go away, but of course he stayed right where he was, shoveling the seeds out of the feeder. She wished she could have opened the window and thrown something at him. But at her own insistence, the windows were sealed up tight with caulking at every crack, though Madge insisted it didn't do a bit of good. Still, Mrs. Obstschmecker felt safer knowing the outside air was outside, just as she felt safer with the security bars in place, even though they provided the squirrels the ladder they needed to get to the feeder. And there was nowhere else the feeder could be hung. She and Madge had gone through all the possibilities, and there was nothing to be done. You couldn't poison the seed, because that would kill the dear little birds as well as the squirrels. Lisa Michaels had remarked some time ago that Mrs. Obstschmecker could solve her problem by thinking of the bird feeder as a squirrel feeder. Weren't squirrels just as cute as birds? She'd asked in that superior tone of voice. Lisa was Jewish. Whenever she came visiting with her twins, which wasn't that often, thank goodness, Mrs. Obstschmecker had to remind herself that the woman was no relation. Not an Obstschmecker, not even a hill. Only Madge's stepson's wife. Madge said it was unchristian to point out that Lisa was not family, but a fact is a fact. Just because William had become Mr. Big Shot with a Cadillac car and had his picture in magazines didn't mean Mrs. Big Shot hadn't grown up with the last name of Schechner. But there was no need to dwell on unpleasantness. It was the fault of that squirrel. Mrs. Obstschmecker turned away from the window and turned on the TV. Fill in the blanks was on, and for a while Mrs. Obstschmecker tried competing against the contestants, but they played too fast, and the solution of the first puzzle, snug as a rubber, was supposed to be a popular saying. Mrs. Obstschmecker had never heard such a saying, but she could guess what it meant. There was dirty talk everywhere these days, on the TV and newspapers, and the boy who was coming to take her to church, though he was otherwise the politest young man, and claimed to be a born-again. Even he used four-letter words like he'd never been taught any otherwise. And with a nun for a mother. Not that that made a speck of difference these days. Not with a lesbian nun running for the state assembly right here in the Twin Cities, and conducting kneel-ins at the cathedral, so they could be lesbian priests instead of lesbian nuns. And all of it discussed on the TV like it was today's weather. She blipped off the TV and sat and stewed. Upstairs the toilet flushed. Madge was up, but that didn't mean she'd come downstairs any time soon. She had a microwave in her bedroom and her own separate phone line, which connected to the computer, and the computer connected to everything else, so Madge could lock the doors at night without leaving her bedroom. She could even talk to Mrs. Obstschmecker on the television set, since there were gizmos now that let you do that though Mrs. Obstschmecker wouldn't let one be connected to her TV. How would you know when someone was looking at you and when they weren't? Sometimes Madge left the camera on in her room, and Mrs. Obstschmecker could see her on the TV screen, walking around without a stitch of clothes. The computer revolution. Progress. Mrs. Obstschmecker pressed the intercom button. Madge? she shouted into the little microphone. Do you want me to make breakfast for you? No, mother, thanks just the same. That cantaloupe you brought home last week should be right by now. I've had it on the window sill. No reply. That squirrel was back at the feeder again. Nothing. There's still time for you to change your mind and come along to Mass and the Veterans Cemetery. You haven't visited your father's grave for I don't know how long. I took you there last year, mother, if you'll recall. What's that? 
You know you have to talk into the microphone if you want me to hear you. I said, no, thank you. You took me there, but you stayed in the car the whole time. Silence. I don't think it's right I should visit your father's grave on Memorial Day with a stranger. Judge is not a stranger, mother. He's a member of our family. He's the illegitimate child of someone who is no relation to any obstschmecker. So how is he our family, I'd like to know. Mother, you know very well William and Lisa have adopted Judge as their son. And they're no relation either. Mother, really, after all that William's done for us? And what about all we did for him? Who looked after him after his mother killed herself, and that Winklemeyer man went to prison for murdering his own little baby? Family. And the daughter's just as bad. A nun with a son in reform school for setting buildings on fire. And that's who you're getting to take me to see my husband's grave, because you're too busy to take five minutes to honor your father's memory. Well, I guess that tells me what I can expect. Another silence. But this one Mrs. Obstschmecker interpreted as abashed. At last Madge said, As to who's going to bury who, that remains to be seen. You'll probably outlast me, the way you're going. That's because I take care of myself, said Mrs. Obstschmecker, who prided herself on doing without extra salt on her food and for limiting her intake of cholesterol. I've got to go wash up Ned now and feed him his breakfast. Make sure you're ready to go before Judge gets here. I've got down your best wig. It's on your dresser. Mrs. Obstschmecker hated being told what to do by her daughter, but went about doing it nonetheless. By the time she had showered and dried and powdered and got into her best summer dress, and then decided the white dress was more suitable for a visit to the cemetery, it was time to begin to worry whether the boy would be late. But then the doorbell sounded, and Mrs. Obstschmecker felt the same little tingle she'd felt sixty-five years ago in Anoka, the first time Mr. O. had called at the house with the bouquet of flowers. This boy had come with a bouquet, too, roses no less, which Lisa Michaels had picked from her own rose bushes, so they would not have to waste good money at the florists, after all. It was hard to catch everything the boy said, since he kept forgetting to speak up, and even when he did, his Florida accent made him hard to understand. But he was a proper southern gentleman in terms of opening the car door. He was driving William's sky-blue Cadillac and helping her into the safety belt. Looking at him sideways as he sat behind the wheel, with his back scarcely touching the seat behind him, Mrs. Obstschmecker could almost suppose it was her husband, as he'd been in the 1930s. The hair short, but still neatly parted, the Clark Gable-type mustache, the size of him, even the stiff white collar and the bow tie, since that was the fashion again. "'You would have liked my husband,' Mrs. Obstschmecker said in a burst of generosity. "'He was a lot like you.' "'I'm sure that's so,' the boy answered, never turning sideways, keeping his eyes on the street, a responsible driver. "'August 20th, 1970. I'll never forget the day. A stroke. No warning. One minute he was watering the lawn. The next minute gone. Madge, that's Madge Michaels, my daughter. You've met her at the house. Yes, ma'am, many times. Madge was at the hospital, and I called her, and they sent an ambulance right off the bat. But there was nothing they could do. We'll all be called to judgment sometime, said the boy, and usually sooner than we think. That's God's way. Mrs. Obstschmecker tried to take some comfort from this reflection. The boy's tone of voice made it sound as though it should be comforting, but the idea seemed almost the opposite, a threat. Protestants had their own slant on things, which didn't mean that they were right, but they thought they were, so you had to be polite discussing religion. I hope you don't mind my asking, she began with an exaggerated delicacy, but how is it that you came to be a Protestant? I mean, your mother, after all, Mrs. Um, Winklemeyer. The boy made a loud snorting sound, which had been just the way Mr. Obstschmecker had laughed at something when he didn't want to laugh out loud. She's a Catholic, isn't she? 
That's hard to say, ma'am. She says she is, but I guess the Pope off in Rome says she isn't. She's one of these schismatics. The boy made it sound like a kind of appliance or car, and Mrs. Obstschmecker had to smile. There could be no question about the Pope questioning her faith. Whatever the Holy Father wanted her to think, she thought. She was against birth control and abortion and pornography and priests getting married and women becoming priests. She didn't go to Mass every Sunday, but at her age that wasn't to be expected. And were you sent to a Catholic school? Mrs. Obstschmecker pressed on. Again the boy made his snorting sound. Just about everything I did had some Catholic connection. I grew up in this big commune outside of Miami. We grew our own pesticide-free Catholic vegetables and brewed Catholic beer by the barrelful. They are all drinkers, those Catholics down there. So how is it that you left the church? You must have been very young. I'll be eighteen on the fourth of July, and I've been a follower of Brother Orson since I was fifteen. He turned sideways to give Mrs. Obstschmecker a significant look. We don't call ourselves protestants. The time for protesting is over. Now's the time for judgment. Mrs. Obstschmecker waited for an answer to her question, but none was forthcoming. The boy turned his attention back to the road, and two blocks further on they pulled into the OLM parking lot, once the school playground. The school had closed down years ago for lack of funds and students. The boy locked the car and offered his arm for the walk round the corner to the church. Everything seemed as nice as could be, but then, the moment they came to the church steps, the spell was broken. A crowd of colored people had gathered about the main door, as though they were waiting to throw rice on a bridal couple. Mrs. Obstschmecker couldn't see over their heads and wondered why they were all just standing about. The boy tapped an older black man on the shoulder and asked, Is there some problem about going in the church? There's protesters blocking the doorway. Some of them got themselves chained to the railing. Why is that? They don't like Father Sinclair bringing in the Amani Temple people. And having the women say, Our mother who art in heaven instead of our father, added a black woman. Uh-huh. Judge turned to ask Mrs. Obstschmecker, You still want to go to Mass? Are they having Mass? The boy passed the question on to the black woman. They having Mass? If you can get into the church, it's already started. Shit, that's no problem. The boy stooped down and scooped up the short portly body of Mrs. Obstschmecker like a groom on his honeymoon sweeping up his bride to carry her over the threshold of their new home. She was utterly flabbergasted, but not to the degree that she forgot to secure her wig with both hands. The boy mounted the steps, saying, "'Excuse us, please,' and "'Stand aside, please.' The crowd on the steps parted to either side, revealing the row of demonstrators sitting, arms locked together, on the top step of the church. They had a bedsheet banner spread out before them that said, "'No more voodoo masses. God is our Father.' It dawned on Mrs. Obstschmecker as she saw the demonstrators, and they saw her, cradled in Judge Michaels's arms, that they were all whites, while all the people they were keeping out of the church were black. Judge began walking up the last two steps across which the bedsheet banner was spread. "'Please don't go in, Our Lady of Mercy!' the oldest of the demonstrators shouted. A man whom Mrs. Obstschmecker recognized by his beard and his Roman collar as Father Youngerman, the church's pastor. The archdiocese does not approve of the new liturgy. Father Sinclair has no right to be saying mass here. Please do not cross. I'll tell you what, said Judge, I'm going to kick you in the face if you don't move your ass. I got this lady here wants to go in, and I mean to take her in. Just stay where you are, everyone, Father Youngerman said to the other demonstrators. We will not be moved. A woman at the far end of the line began to sing, We Shall Overcome, and the others took it up. Judge aimed a kick at the priest's solar plexus. He doubled over, and the men on either side of him didn't try to keep their arms locked in his. They even slid sideways to make room for Judge to pass between them. No violence, shouted the woman who had started the singing going. There must be no violence. 
Once inside the big doorway, Judge set Mrs. Obst Schmecker back down on her feet. The blacks, who'd been kept out by the demonstrators, were coming into the vestibule single file through the breach Judge had made. "'Well, now,' said Judge matter-of-factly, as though nothing out of the ordinary had happened, "'where do you generally like to sit? Up close by the driver, or back here by the door?' 57. Father Lyman Sinclair looked down from the pulpit of Our Lady of Mercy Church and waited for the spirit of prophecy to give him a jump start. The congregation was used to Father Lyman's ways and knew his long pre-sermon pauses were not signals to them to be quieter as they would have been from Father Youngerman, almost the opposite. Father Lyman actually encouraged people to whisper and confabulate and get comfortable around each other. Half of communion, he liked to say, is communication, and who says the Mass has to be a military exercise? So, while they waited for Father Lyman to come to a simmer, many of the parishioners turned to their neighbors to tell what they'd seen of the demonstration outside, and how the tall white boy with the old lady in the third pew from the front had kicked Father Youngerman in the stomach. Father Lyman himself knew nothing of the fracas, but he was aware of the two strangers. Not that many white parishioners attended the ten o'clock service at OLM, not since the Imani Temple people had been invited to move their worship service here from All Souls Parish, from which they'd been removed by force after they'd lost their long legal battle with the archdiocese. For almost five years the leaders of the African-American Catholic Church, the official name for Imani Temple, had been ordaining their own independent clergy and developing their own liturgy, modeled partly on that of their fellow heretics and apostates, the American Catholic Church. The main practical difference between the two movements was that Imani Temple claimed the right, even though its members were excommunicated, to share all Roman Catholic places of worship, a privilege not generally accorded them. In all the Twin Cities, only Our Lady of Mercy had opened its doors to the Amani Temple, and here only because of Father Sinclair's political savvy. With the parish council's help, he'd been able to make an end run around Father Youngerman on one of the latter's periodic retreats to his favorite Josephine Detox Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Father Youngerman had returned to the sobering discovery that OLM had opened its doors and its ten o'clock Sunday service to the Imani Temple. Still more sobering had been his discovery that the doors couldn't be closed. Now it was Youngerman and a small band of ultramontane rednecks who had taken up civil disobedience as the court of last resort. But these matters, just because they were uppermost in the minds of the congregation, were not what Father Lyman wanted to speak about. A good sermon should be a lesson in prayer. That had been the constant theme of Monsignor McKibben, the Jesuit who had taught homiletics at the North American College in Rome. So there it was, like a door opening before him, the way to begin. He began, When I was in Rome studying to be a priest, I had a teacher, an Irish Jesuit, who'd been a missionary in Zimbabwe and Taiwan, and I can't remember where else. And this man had a favorite saying about sermons. A good sermon, he said, is like a lesson in prayer. Now most of you have probably heard me preach a few sermons that didn't exactly follow that prescription. Some of my sermons have been more like political speeches than like prayers. What's prayer after all? It's talking with God, which isn't easy. It's a lot easier talking with other people because they'll talk back and you can tell if you've made a connection. With God it's more like you're on the phone with someone who's listening so hard he forgets to say even, mm-hmm, or, how's that? Mm-hmm, said someone in one of the front pews, and right on top of it, from the back of the church, Christy Aldrich called out, How's that, Lyman? Father Lyman joined in the laughter. Then, after a beat, The Bible says there's one prayer that's all anyone ever needs, and you know how it begins. Our Father... Or our mother, don't forget her. It was Christy again, always to be depended on to look out for equal opportunity for her sex, always alert to patriarchal ploys. Well now, Christy, you've got a point. 
I guess we won't any of us know what sex God is till we get to heaven and see for ourselves. But let's suppose that Jesus wasn't just an old-fashioned sexist who didn't know better than to suppose the almighty Alpha and Omega might transcend questions of gender. Let's suppose he meant something by starting off his prayer to our Father. Fathers and mothers are different kinds of people. There were several low mm-hmms and amens. Mothers are just plain closer, for one thing. When you're a baby, you suck milk from her breasts. She hugs you. She loves you. She's there. Fathers, they can't be counted on the same way. They're not always around when you need them. They're off at their jobs. Or in jail. True enough, Christy. Anyhow, he's away. Maybe far away. Like the prayer says, Who art in heaven? Though, just as a side note, the Protestants say, Which art in heaven? And in terms of the gender problem, that's interesting, because who is for people, but which? Which is like saying God is something else besides a person. Anyhow, who or which, he's in heaven, far away from human shit and misery. It's all blue sky and sunshine, and your prayer is like a kite you're sending up there. Kites again, Lyman? This from Jerry Stiller, who was sitting with the other members of the parish council around the communion table. It was true, and no accident, that kites were a regular feature of Father Lyman's sermons. His first consciousness, both of sin and of redemption, had come in the form of a kite. Mm-hmm, kites again, and what's written on the kite is just the basic message man has to send to God. Hallowed be thy name. Amen, amen. Oh, no, not so fast. We got a lot of the Our Father left before we hit amen. We got thy kingdom come. Not came. It's not here yet, but it will come. It's the first thing we've got to believe. It's faith and hope rolled together in one big promise. It will come. It is coming. And I believe it's got to be very close. Just think what year it is. One, nine, nine, nine. A few months now, the odometer of history will be turning over its last row of zeros. And then, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah! Hallelujah, indeed! But that trumpet is sounding not just glory, hallelujah, it's sounding judgment, and there's not going to be anywhere to hide from the sound of that trumpet. No safety perimeter sealed against the plague he'll send down the plague we already can see mowing people down around us. No fallout shelter, not against the radiation God has got. No sterile labs, no millionaire mansion with its air pumped in from tanks of oxygen. So we better all shape up. We better mean it when we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because that's what the judgment will be about. Have we done His will? Have we loved one another? not just said nice things about love on Sundays in church, but got out and done some actual hands-on love, because he knows, God knows, he knows for sure. He paused and smiled and caught the eye of Jason Beale. Jason was the main security officer at the A&P. What comes next, Jason? Daily bread, Jason muttered, pretending shyness, but pleased to have proved he was actually following the sermon. Right. And that's the part of the prayer everyone understands. Gimme. That's what people mostly think prayer is about. Gimme this, gimme that. Once you got the bread, you need some butter. Anyhow, in the daily bread category, we seem to be doing pretty well, and I'll bet most of the people Jesus was dealing with weren't exactly starving. Not with the wedding feasts and loaves and fishes. So maybe the daily bread he's talking about means something else. Maybe it's like the bread of God. In John chapter 6, verse 33, The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Or in a nutshell, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. That's clear enough. What the prayer is asking is for God to be here. Lyman gave the side of his gut a solid slap. Every day, inside of us, 
where we can feel him like a full belly of food. Another pause, and then the verse, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Another version has debts and debtors. Forgive us our debts. I wish I knew which bank would do that, and that reminds me at some point we've got to discuss the building fund. That ceiling up there looks so pretty, with those big rafters and the stained glass either side. I read in the Star Tribune that considered purely as a work of architecture, this church has got it over the Basilica downtown. A landmark of the twenties Byzantine revival, no less. But structurally, the roof is a borderline case, and the inside of the dome needs more than a can of paint. So that's one debt that'll have to be paid and not forgiven. Trespassing, on the other hand, I've always thought is an essentially harmless activity. You see all those woods when you drive north a ways out of the city with the signs tacked on the trees. No trespassing. And I will confess that I have sometimes trespassed, as I've been trespassed against, which I try to deal with forgivingly, such as when a basketball game starts up at 11 p.m. just outside my bedroom. Loud noise late at night is definitely trespassing. But evil? No, evil is something else which the prayer comes to next. Trespassing can get you into trouble, even into jail, but it means well. Trespassing is just looking for fun. A joint, if I may say so, is a trespass. But evil, Lyman shook his head, evil hurts people, and it may not even know it's doing so, like a tank that just runs over innocent bystanders in a crowd, or a banker investing millions of dollars in cigarette companies. Oh, you start looking for evil, and it shows up all over the map. And all you can hope for, really, is that fate doesn't put you in a situation where evil starts to look tempting, where it looks like an easy score, but it ends up homicide. Lead us not into temptation. He paused again. But deliver us from doing the evil we might be tempted to or from the evil that's out there like Jaws or this damned plague that's keeping everyone but us sitting home locked up in their houses, this plague that doesn't sniff around for sinners like old AIDS did, but just strikes down anyone it takes a fancy to, like some psycho sniper? The prayer doesn't specify which kind of evil it has in mind, and what I think is that there's no real difference. The evil that gets hold of you when you decide that nothing but your own ass is worth saving, that is the same evil as the one that chews you up directly. Now, I could be quite wrong about that. In fact, that's probably a heresy. It's like saying evil is too big and too bad to break loose from once you get to be a sinner. And I know, or I hope, that has not been true for my own particular sins some of which definitely passed beyond the category of no trespassing. That part of the prayer I still haven't scoped out, but maybe that's why Jesus said this prayer would last a lifetime. Because all the problems we've got to discuss with God, all the ones nobody's got an easy answer for, they're all there, built in. Fathers and children, power and glory, heaven and earth, bread and the national debt, and the knowledge of good and evil. God bless you. Father Lyman smiled and stepped down from the pulpit and nodded to Sister Fidelis in the organ loft, who was ready to hand with her own rendition of the Lord's Prayer. 58. Judge, Mrs. Obstschmecker urged in a commanding whine, are you sure this is a good idea? Judge heeded her no more than Madge would have. He just stood there at the edge of the crowd, funneling through the church doors, and wouldn't budge. Won't take but a minute, ma'am. Then we'll zip right off to that cemetery and get those roses to your old man. Anywhere I ever been to church, you stop by after the service, even if it's only to shake hands. This was precisely what Mrs. Obstschmecker was dreading. There had been a period, years back, when they'd try to make people kiss the person sitting next to them in the pew, no matter who they were or what disease they might have. The kiss of peace, it was called. 
Mrs. Obstschmecker would only go to church then when she had someone she knew sitting on each side of her. Finally, in the 80s, things returned to normal, and you only had to nod and smile at people at that point in the Mass. The crowd diminished to where only Judge and Mrs. Obstschmecker and the people who'd been sitting up at the communion table were left inside the church. Judge shook hands with the black priest. You must be the young man who dealt so roughly with Father Youngerman. From everything people have told me, it seemed unprovoked and unnecessary. I was out of line, and I admit it, said Judge, and I beg to apologize for my hasty action. I would have never used my feet against a man if my arms were free. I have a bad temper, but I know that is no excuse. I will convey your apology to Father Youngerman. I am told that he wasn't seriously hurt. Are you visiting the Twin Cities? I don't think I've seen you at OLM before. I'm from Florida, but this lady here has been going to your church for a while, I believe. Oh, yes, hers is a familiar face. The black priest held out his hand. Mrs. Mrs. Obstschmecker offered her fingertips, but not her name, for a gingerly handshake. I am not a Catholic myself, Judge volunteered. No? The black priest was not letting go of Mrs. Obstschmecker's fingers, despite the hint of a gentle tug. I was brought up a Catholic by my mother, who was now a nun. Really? She tugged again, and the priest responded by clamping her hand inside both of his and flashing his dentures in a priestly smile. I am a follower of Brother Orson. Praise God. I always praise God. At last he let go of her hand but I can't say I'd do the same for Brother Orson. Maybe not, but there was things you said from the pulpit about the Lord's Prayer and the judgment soon to be that could have come right off one of Brother Orson's audio cassettes. I was wondering if you had seen his TV show. No, I can't say I have. I've read about him. Then you've read lies, probably. That's all you ever hear in the media about him. Secular humanist lies. Judge, Mrs. Obstschmecker tugged on his coat sleeve, we should be getting to the cemetery. This is my great-grandmother, by adoption, Judge went on, unbudged. I am taking her to the cemetery where her husband is buried. If you would like to come with us, I will tell you about the promises the Lord has made through his prophet. As you said in the pulpit, we are living in the last days. A judgment is approaching. All men will not be saved. Do you know, I think I'll take you up on that. Father, please. Mrs. Obstschmecker acted as though the smoke alarm in the kitchen had gone off. There's no necessity. What's the old saying? Opportunity knocks but once. I've never had a chance to speak with a follower of the famous Brother Orson. None of my parishioners... He turned to wink at the members of the parish council who'd been hovering at the edge of the conversation. Are likely to become heretics in that direction. As I understand it, Brother Orson holds out little hope of salvation for the sons of Ham. That's true, but we are not forbidden to testify unto the heathen. And you will be heading back this way after a while? After this lady has had time to pray beside the grave. Judge, really? I'm sure the father has more important things to do. The name is Lyman, said the priest, holding out his hand again to judge. Lyman Sinclair. No need to call me father. I didn't mean to. I got but one father, God Almighty. Then, with an odd smile as an afterthought, which art in heaven. Mrs. Obstschmecker was too flustered to reprimand Judge for showing so little appreciation to William for having adopted him as his own legal son. It was true, of course, that the boy had no real father, unless it was Ben Winklemeyer who'd got his own daughter pregnant, which Mrs. Obstschmecker had heard Madge speculating over the phone when she thought her mother wasn't on the line. But for him to say he had no father was certainly an act of ingratitude. Judge led them to the Cadillac, and the priest was suitably impressed, which led to judges explaining who his adoptive father was, and the priest was suitably impressed at that, too. 
It never ceased to astonish Mrs. Obstschmecker that the name of William Michaels, Dr. Michaels, should be known by so many people who'd never met him. But in fact, this black priest had met him, for as they set off for the cemetery, Mrs. Obstschmecker had insisted she'd be more comfortable in the back seat. He explained that he'd gone to school with William at OLM. Well, isn't that something, you and Billy classmates, my goodness. But the men in the front seat continued talking to each other as though she hadn't said a word. The priest was interested only in hearing Judge go on about one thing, Brother Orson. Judge, however, wanted to explain about the rapture and the last judgment and some book that was sealed with seven seals and some horses connected to that. All a lot of nonsense as far as Mrs. Obstschmecker was concerned, and after a few minutes the priest got tired of it too. Actually, Judge, that's your name, Judge? Since I was baptized into Christ, Judge has been my name, praise God. His real name is John, Mrs. Obstschmecker said, leaning forward to speak directly into the priest's ear. John Winklemeyer. Actually, Judge, the priest continued, I've read the book of Revelations myself, and I've got my own ideas about what it may mean. What I'm more interested in is Brother Orson himself and your uh, relationship with him. I relate to him every day, praise God. On the TV, you mean? And in my heart? But the image you see on the TV, you realize, don't you, that it's like a cartoon. And when Brother Orson is talking with that angel who's got so many opinions, the angel Lazarus, praise God. That's not a real angel. That's a computer-generated program. And when you ask them questions, if you've got that interactive capability, when I ask the angel Lazarus question, the angel Lazarus tells me all I need to know. When I was in prison, like Paul, for testifying to my faith, the angel came to me and said I would be redeemed from my bondage. Soon, the angel said, and so I was not two weeks later. That's when the Lord sent me here. Mrs. Obstschmecker sighed and gave up trying to keep the boy from making himself look worse than he had to. He talked about his time in prison without an ounce of shame. But you was asking about do I know what I see is a kind of cartoon? Well, shit, any fool knows that. But is the Pope off in Rome any different? Doesn't he have his cistern chapel with all its graven images of what God's supposed to look like? For one thing, the priest said, starting to sound like the boy was getting to him, which he always did eventually. Mrs. Obstschmecker had seen him drive William right up the wall. It is the Sistine Chapel, not the cistern chapel. I know that. I was making a joke. Now let me ask you, you think when you see your Pope on TV that those little dots sprinkled on the TV screen is a real person? Isn't that a picture, the same as Brother Orson's picture? Only difference is, Brother Orson is more careful how he gets his picture taken. Are you aware of the stories that have been in the newspapers? Do you know about the trial going on right now in Florida? It's not the media who are saying the man is a fabrication. It's people in his own organization, people who are officers. The chief of the studio where the programs are put together has said, and I quote, Brother Orson is no more real than Mickey Mouse. Well then, I guess Mickey Mouse must be more real than we knew. He turned sideways to smile at the priest. That's another joke. Praise God. The boy did have a wicked smile. It always put Mrs. Obstschmecker in mind of the, the nice young senator who used to work for President Reagan, Oliver North, except that Judge's hair was shorter and he had a stockier build. The obvious answer to your question, Judge said in his most serious and reverent tone of voice, is Paul to the Corinthians. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. That is a clear prophecy of Brother Orson, and as far as the lies in the media, it's no news that Brother Orson has got enemies, and enemies spread lies. You have an amazing faith, said the priest. The boy smiled. 
When I have spoken with Brother Orson, he has said to me, Judge, he called me by my name, Judge, you have a perfect faith. And I guess if he said it, it must be so. 59. Valerie Bright was the perfect administrator, brusque, incurious, a benevolent martinet toward her staff, who either loved her or left, and discreetly obsequious to her superiors. To Ben Winklemeyer on a daily basis, to Dr. Michaels whenever her duties took her within the perimeter of his personal regard. She understood his need for privacy. Creative natures require solitude, and it was one of Ms. Bright's primary duties, though not one listed in the official job description of the administrative director, to create that solitude for him. Ben had discovered her at a Christian fellowship breakfast in Eden Prairie some time after his release from prison. Even then she had seemed to him the incarnate spirit of the eighties, one of those plump, gilded assistant directors of a government agency who would appear on the nightly news denying guilt, glaring at the cameras through enormous glasses, shameless and unconfoundable. This had been during a troubled period for the breakfast sponsor, the Son of Man Foundation, and Ms. Bright had shown the stuff she was made of by proclaiming her undiminished faith in the co-presidents of the foundation, Hal and Bess McKinley. If the Lord had bestowed unusual bounties on them, surely that was a mark of His grace, and no reason for a media witch-hunt. When less confident voices expressed misgivings and even repeated the media's allegations, Ms. Bright had held her hands over her ears and declared, I don't want to hear any more so-called facts. Then, lowering her hands and smiling warmly, I thought this was supposed to be a fellowship breakfast. She had been much cast down when the McKinleys, at their sentencing, had acknowledged some degree of guilt with regard to the funds that had disappeared, though they still insisted that they'd always tried to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The judge had said he'd try to do the same in meeting out their sentence, which was eight to twelve years, or half that term if either of the co-presidents was able to help in locating the missing funds. Miss Bright had been furious. I just know that man was being sarcastic, she'd confided to Ben on their first date, two months after the fellowship breakfast. Mean and sarcastic. Try not to think about it, he had urged. You're right, I know but when I think of those two beautiful people in some terrible prison. Prison doesn't have to be terrible. If I hadn't been in prison, I probably wouldn't have found my way to Jesus. Prison can lead sinners back to God. Ms. Bright had squeezed his hand. You are such a brave man, Ben Winklemeyer, and you're right, too. The Lord doesn't send us more grief than He knows we can handle. In the long run, it probably will be a blessing. A month later, Ms. Bright had found herself unemployed. When it developed that the Eden Prairie Development Fund, EPDF, in which she had served as executive secretary, represented a significant part of the vanished assets of the Son of Man Foundation. Ms. Bright had accepted this stroke of fate without a murmur of protest. Ben believed her when she said she'd never had the faintest suspicion that EPDF had been anything but what it seemed, a real estate developer. The woman was a jewel, and Ben had offered her a position with medical defense systems at a salary matching what she'd been earning at EPDF. She expressed her gratitude at the job offer with a hug and a kiss. But no more than that, mind you, she'd said, lowering the protective barrier of her glasses to peek out over the top of the frames flirtatiously. That's all any man gets till I'm wearing a wedding ring. This to a man who'd rounded the bend of sixty, a man almost twice her own age. And she was in earnest. If he'd proposed, she'd have accepted. To Miss Bright, marriage represented only a more intensive form of management. At Medical Defense Systems headquarters, Ben addressed her as Miss Bright, an appellation she preferred to Miss. Miss represented her commitment to feminism, albeit a fundamentalist feminism. She believed in women's right to equal pay, and was alert to any sign of on-the-job sexual harassment, including the use of loose or insinuating language, as more than one former employee of MDS had learned to his cost. 
Except in her dress, which was unexceptionally drab, costly, and ladylike, Miss Bright avoided stereotypically feminine behavior. If a man held the door open for her, she froze in her tracks and would not go through it. She prided herself on doing no cooking that could not be done in a microwave. The only magazines she read were Fortune, U.S. News and World Report, the Journal of Hospital Administration, and, until it ceased publication, the Good News Gazette, the McKinley's monthly newsletter. She loved baseball and attended the Twins' home games on Sundays. At all other times, so far as Ben could determine, she worked. She worked not only as administrative director for medical defense systems, but soon was acting in a similar, though unacknowledged, capacity for other businesses that nestled under MDS's capacious umbrella. For MDS was much more than a simple research facility in the war against Arvids. It was also, in some sense, a chain of hotels, a prison system, and a realty and construction company. Indeed, the profits of these related businesses the Minnehaha Hostels, the MedSec Group, and the Northwestern Development Fund, rather dwarfed as financial entities their parent or host organization, MDS. And Ms. Bright soon was devoting considerably more attention to these affiliates and offshoots than to MDS itself, which in its nature could not be administered efficiently. For if one's business is research, and there is no guarantee that the research will achieve results, and if that business defines itself as not-for-profit, then what can an administrator do? There was only one supplier for the 10,000 mice that MDS purchased every year at $25 apiece, and that supplier did not give discounts for quantity. If Dr. Michaels approved a particular experiment, then MDS had to bear the expense. Funding sources seemed not to be a problem. In its not-for-profit infancy, with a staff of only the good doctor and some two dozen technicians, MDS had played a significant role in developing the vaccine that had brought the AIDS epidemic to an end. Now, with Arvids cutting its much wider swath and wreaking proportionally greater havoc, MDS had virtual carte blanche both from the government and the big foundations. Whatever Dr. Michaels wanted, Dr. Michaels got from $25 mice to $25,000 incinerators for the disposal of said mice's infected corpses. For the profit-oriented concerns, especially for Northwestern development, Dr. Michaels's word was not so inevitably taken as law. Indeed, his connection with this side of things was generally de-emphasized. He was known to be a member of the board in all three companies and a shareholder, but so were many prominent figures in the medical world and in state government. Minnesota hoped to set an example for the rest of the country in operating a system of treatment and security that would be fair to both the victims of the plague and the community at large. If the investors who helped create that system also realized a profit in doing so, that was one of the benefits of the free enterprise system and none of anyone else's business. But even in a medical emergency on this terrible scale, there were people who insisted on monkey-wrenching the system, and it was another of Ms. Bright's unwritten duties to deal with such troublemakers. In most cases, this meant reaching an understanding with former long-term residents of one of the many ha-ha hostels who wished to take back a benefaction, freely given, to MDS, now that they supposed themselves recovered and out of reach of Arvid's scythe. Less numerous but more troublesome were the disgruntled heirs of those whom MDS had been unable to help, some 46 percent, alas, who threatened to litigate to recover a testamentary endowment. No such litigation had ever succeeded, but it always looked bad, and there were certain confidential documents that it would not do to have subpoenaed. So sometimes an out-of-court settlement was the wisest course. In all these matters, Ms. Bright and her legal staff could be counted on to realize the organization's overall goals with a minimum of fuss. But there were some matters beyond Ms. Bright's scope, some forms of trouble for which her years of experience working for the McKinleys were of little use. State Senator Lester Burton was one such form of trouble. Politeness was no use against him. Though he came from one of the poorest counties in the state and dressed deplorably, Senator Burton could be as polite as Ms. Bright at her politest, and yet not yield an inch. 
he had also made it clear that he was not to be deflected from his purpose by being offered a position on the board that would administer the project whose development he was hindering, lucrative though such a position might be. He is just bound and determined to spoil the entire project, Miss Bright had lamented to Ben in their regular Wednesday morning meeting. I've pointed out all the long-run benefits that Onamia itself stands to gain. The facilities that will be built, the employment opportunities, the health benefits for those who choose not to relocate. Not to mention the benefit to the thousands who will be treated there. I've been over every detail. I've shown him the lovely scale model that the architects built with the teeny little pine trees. I've shown him the actuarial projections over a five- and ten-year period and he actually spent half an hour reading the text while I twiddled my thumbs. Then he wanted a photocopy, but he wasn't willing to make a single concession. He insists that he is going to bring the matter up at the next session of the legislature, and he means to call a press conference before then. To what purpose? To keep Northwestern out of Onamia. He lives there? He was born there, and he's been holding on to the building the drugstore is in. I trust we've made a reasonable offer. At this point we can afford to be generous. Our people have offered him twice the building and the business's market value, and firm guarantees that it will continue to operate as a pharmacy. That was his first concern. He said he didn't want Onamia becoming another ghost town. That was when he thought Northwestern was going to be building a mall outside of town. Then he started doing title searches. Basically, that's what he's done for a living most of his life. A small-town lawyer. With a seat in the state legislature, Ben pointed out. That doesn't seem to make much difference. I've had Lucille Borg, who represents the greater Mill Lacks Lake area in the state house, approach him and explain what a really good thing for Onamia and the whole region the development could be. She probably told him more than she should have because after he talked with her, he got interested in MedSec, and now he has this whole theory about everything we're doing, and I really can't cope with the man. I'm sorry. So what is to be done, do you think? Ms. Bright took a deep, bosom-lifting breath. He says he wants to talk with Dr. Michaels. About what, I asked him. About his real estate investments is what he answered. I told him Dr. Michaels is too busy, but that he could talk to you. And he said, that's too bad, and started walking out the door. I'll tell you, if I were not a Christian woman, I would have liked to... She made a claw of her false fingernails and made a cute growling sound. Ben nodded agreement. Sometimes it's hard to love our enemies. I realize that Dr. Michaels hates to be bothered with business details, but this goes beyond details. This could undermine the whole Onamia project. We can't let that happen. I'm sure William will agree to see the man and smooth his feathers. I hate to take him away from his real work. Tell Stan to set up an appointment ASAP. Ms. Bright touched her gold chain and gave a little bow of fealty. She knew the problem posed by Senator Burton would be taken care of once Dr. Michaels turned his attention to it. He has, she often said of him, a magic touch. 60. William at that moment was in his office, but not at work, unless it is that the play of creative spirits is their true work. He was playing with a favorite piece of software, a flight simulator, and just stoned enough that the graphics on the monitor seemed realer than real. The white clouds in the blue sky shredded into fractal geometries at their edges, abraded by a western wind, their dissolution in sync somehow with the CD on the player. Scott Ross playing Scarlatti. He dipped the nose of the imaginary biplane and dipped his own to a line of coke, and in a moment the clouds parted and he spiraled downward to the dark airfield with a spacey feeling that the plane's extended wings were his own. A perfect three-point landing. Exit plane, he commanded, and found himself at once in the airport lobby, which was neither more nor less generic than any other airport lobby. There was an IBM news kiosk with that morning's genuine headlines scrolling across the screens. 
The software had windows open to the MDS data bank, CompuServe, and a pager. Armed security guards in green uniforms stood beside the main exit, above which a banner proclaimed, Welcome to the Green Hills of Wyoming. He felt the warm sag of happy relief that comes at the first instant of surrender to a favorite sitcom or the fizzing water of a hot tub. He was home in his own private wonderland, his terra, his alternate universe, where anyone he met was the projection and reflection of his own imagination. He went to retrieve his suitcase from the slowly revolving luggage carousel. The suitcase was filled with a jumble of paraphernalia that had proved useful over the years in coping with the perils and puzzles of Wyoming. Knives, scalpels, forceps, tweezers, rope, glue, blowtorches, antibiotics, and placebos. And at the bottom of the bag, wrapped in a silk handkerchief, his most potent resource, a caduceus, whose potency was not limited to the imaginary realm encoded in the program software, but which could share, like a rechargeable battery, some small portion of the total zap available to its original, which William still kept in the Obstschmecker attic and brought to his medical defense system's office only when the icon in the software program needed to be re-energized. It was somewhat worrying, therefore, to have his luggage delayed, but there were a variety of instructions in the program that might account for a delay. Stan might have summoned him on the hotline, but then his pager would be beeping, or there might be a news headline of such urgency that UPS had flagged it for the immediate attention of subscribers. He went to the news kiosk to check that possibility and used his mouse to select print, then national, then top story. His subjective camera zoomed in on a screen of the news kiosk and, via the window to CompuServe, the top story of the day appeared. Country Reckons Memorial Day Death Toll There followed a black-bordered list of the latest celebrities to have died from Arvid's related causes. Death had assembled a varied cross-section of the rich and famous over the past two weeks. A novelist, the mayor of Sacramento, the head of the nation's second-largest bank, a mass murderer awaiting execution in Arizona, a pop singer, an opera singer, the four-year-old daughter of a TV sitcom star, the president of an Ivy League university, a Catholic archbishop, and the owner of a baseball team. The president had rebuffed critics who objected to flags over the Capitol and White House being flown at half-mast, and she defended the Surgeon General's proposal for more intensive random testing in primary schools. All that related to the epidemic was in some sense flagged for William's special attention, but no item in the roster of the recently deceased would have activated an override delay. He switched tracks to state and local news, where the top story concerned the state legislature's rubber-stamping the governor's decision that there would be no state fair again this year the state fairgrounds having been converted to a quarantine facility, or for the duration of the health crisis. Counties were being urged to follow the state's example. It comes full circle, said a familiar voice. William turned around, and there was the god, in a gray business suit, looking down at him and smiling. William knelt to kiss the hand the god extended. The action of kneeling was not accomplished by any command of keyboard, wand, or mouse. By that act of fealty, William had crossed the threshold between simulation and the god's own realm. He knew that what he saw now, the god's archaic smile, was not an image formed by the pixels of the computer screen, but a phantasm visible only to some inner organ of vision. He knew that the touch of the god's hand, prompting him to rise to his feet, was an impalpable touch, and that when he seemed to stand, he yet remained seated at his desk in a kind of trance but he knew this only as we sometimes know when we are dreaming that we dream. It was at the state fair, wasn't it, where the seed was sown from which all these interesting events have sprung? Of course, I have no secrets to hide from you. He waited for the god to say more, but he only smiled. Rather than ask a question, invariably the god would depart when three questions had been asked, William observed, it has been quite some time since I last saw you. But not for want of your keeping the channel open, you have been abusing controlled substances rather recklessly of late. Stan has good connections. 
and I see to it that every gram is guaranteed non-addictive, with no deleterious side effects, pure euphoria, and no hangover, no dimming of the wits, and no sweat. Twinkies are never good for you, William, but I did not come here to lecture you on personal hygiene. He would have to ask, Why are you here, then? To warn you of a very imminent danger. William bit his lip, unwilling to waste a question on what he was sure would be forthcoming without his asking. But the god did not define the danger he was to beware. Instead, he added, And of broader dangers contingent upon the first, dangers from father, brother, and son. My father's dead. The same is often said of the gods, but we still exercise a certain influence on the course of events. You're looking well, I must say. The strain of your work hasn't etched noticeable furrows in your brow. Even your conscience, what can be seen of it, seems clear. A very trout stream of a conscience. It's as the Greeks have said. Mens sana in corpore sano. That's Latin, of course, but the sense is the same. Good health breeds tranquility. Even so, William, I'd advise you to be careful. Within the next few days you will be tempted to use the power of the caduceus in a manner that may have unforeseen and unfortunate results. Therefore, forbear. William knew he was being taunted. His conscience was no limpid stream. Further questions? I don't want to keep you from your magic kingdom. Wyomia awaits you. I have dreams, he said reluctantly. And how do I get rid of them? Mercury laughed. As the physician said to Macbeth, therein the patient must minister to himself. Really, William, that was too easy. Don't make a face. Would you rather have me tell you to confess your crimes against humanity and take your punishment like a man? The cure for any nightmare is an altered point of view. Learn to enjoy what appalls you. I do. No, you've simply grown numb. It's an occupational hazard. Over the years, most doctors become more cold-blooded than generals. It's the training, cutting up cadavers, learning to operate all the chemical switches for pleasure and pain, poking about in open wounds, being the first to know the worst. You succumb to the fascination. To do otherwise would be inhuman. But you don't enjoy your power. Not as I would. Not as a god. Before William could frame a reply, his pager began to beep. Duty's calling, William. The god held out his hand to receive William's fealty. But instead of kneeling to kiss the proffered hand, William, partly from pique at having been taunted and partly from habit, typed, Save. The image on the screen shrank to a single glowing moat and disappeared. William picked up the phone. It's the senator from Onamia, Stan announced. Ms. Bright says you've got to see him, and he says it has to be now. Sorry, Doc, I know you got better things to do. Send him in, Stan, and I'll do what I can. 61. Lester Burton, the senator from Onamia, was fat as the mature Marlon Brando, a marvel of obesity, jowled and dewlapped and huffing and puffing, his tan summer suit banded with the broad motlings of his perspiration, his sagging face and pudgy fingers roseate with the blood his heart strained to supply, his edematous ankles, as he lumbered toward a chair, scarcely flexing. Before the man had said a word, William felt the satisfaction that comes with knowing the answer to a problem the very moment it is posed. Lester Burton was a stroke waiting to happen. Should it come here and now in William's office, there would be nothing to wonder at. William adopted a tone of formal courtesy. Senator Burton, how do you do, sir? You've chosen some nasty weather to visit MDS. What can I do for you? I didn't come here to discuss the weather. I didn't come here to discuss anything. I came here to tell you you can't turn Mill Lacks County into a goddamned quarantine ward. You can buy off the rest of the legislature, but you're not buying me off. I don't believe any offer has been made, Senator. 
Oh, no? The man's jawbone tucked in, his lips pursed, and his jowls trembled in an action that may have been experienced inwardly as a smile. Twenty-five thousand for letting you put my name on the list of the politicians you've got in your pocket. That isn't an offer. That isn't a bribe. Perhaps it isn't enough. William made the suggestion in a bantering tone, but it was there to be taken up if that was what Lester Burton had in mind. It wasn't. I hope that was meant to be a joke, Dr. Michaels. Of course, Senator and I hope that you don't mean to imply that the other members of the Community Relations Board have been venal or corrupt in accepting their positions. Mayor Kula, Representative Borg, Dr. Wemke. Oh, they've been earning their salary, Doctor. No doubt about that. Lucille's been calling me up two, three times a day, trying to smooth my feathers. And according to Dr. Wimp, you're another damned Mother Teresa. As for Mayor Kula... He's had his hand inside of one cookie jar or another since he got a seat on the school board back in 73. And I said so both times he ran against me for my seat in the Senate. So that's what it is. You have a grudge against Emil Kula. Don't you just wish that's all it was? Senator, I can understand your distress at the thought of your hometown becoming a quarantine area. No community can be expected to welcome such a prospect, no matter what the economic incentives may be. Doubtless, some of your constituents are unhappy with the choice of remaining in the development area or moving to equivalent homes elsewhere in the state. No undertaking on this scale can be accomplished without some distress and personal sacrifice. When highways are built, the same thing happens. But you're not exactly hurting, are you, Dr. Michaels? It is the oldest irony of the medical profession that physicians seem to profit from other people's misfortunes. You can say that again. This place you got here couldn't have come cheap. I'll bet just those two marble snakes over the front entrance must have cost a million dollars. I'll bet they're thirty feet high. As it happens, Senator, MDS, as a non-profit organization receiving public funds, was required to spend 1% of its construction budget on public artworks. I'm not responsible for this state's laws. You are. And by the way, those snakes are elements of a caduceus, an ancient symbol of the medical profession. Snakes are snakes as far as I'm concerned, but that's no matter. It's your so-called non-profit organization that's the problem. It seems to me you've got yourself a whole lot of profit already, Doctor, and if this development scheme for Mill Lacks County gets underway, you're going to be setting on top of a medical oil field. That's what it seems to me. Senator Burton, if you wish to audit the books of medical defense systems, you're free to do so. As its director, I receive a salary of $750,000 but no share of the money MDS brings in through contributions or service operations. Those monies aren't profits. They go back into research. Research uses lots of money, Senator. But until there is a cure for Arvids or a vaccine against it, that money has to be found. And MDS is finding it. If it was only MDS, Doctor, I wouldn't be wasting your time, seeing how valuable it is. But there is also an outfit called the MedSec Group that bought up St. Andrew's Seminary six years ago when it was shut down, and now it looks like part of the plan you want the state to rubber stamp calls for this MedSec Group turning the seminary into a medium security prison for prisoners with Arvids. And that isn't any non-profit operation. If the state refuses to open its own facility, then the state will have to pay someone who's willing to do the job for it. Meaning you. I own shares in MedSec, that's true. And in many ha-ha hostels, too, right? William nodded. Senator Burton definitely represented a threat to the Onamia project. He was grateful that Ms. Bright had insisted that he meet with him. Burton continued. And back in 88, when Minnehaha Hostels was still the Mill Lacks Lake Investment Group, 
you were buying up all kinds of properties around the lake. Real cheap. It didn't seem that cheap then. But they sure as hell are going to be worth a hell of a lot more once the MDS project goes through, and every cabin and motel room is rented to outpatients at a hundred dollars a day and upwards, and not just in the summer season, but year-round, according to the prospectus I read. Minnehaha Hostels hasn't been the only investment group to foresee that possibility. The building boom has been going on for a couple years now. But Minnehaha was the first, by a few years, and it's still the biggest. That is, if you don't count Northwestern Development Fund, which has just about gobbled up every acre in Mill Lacks County that's gone on to the market since 1993. Now, you can't tell me that's all just a big coincidence. In a way, it's been the biggest possible coincidence. The Northwestern Fund was started up in response to the prospect of the global climatic changes that are going on right now. The Great Plains are drying up. Saskatchewan and Manitoba and the northern counties of Minnesota are going to be the Iowa and Kansas and Nebraska of the next century. And Mill Lacks Lake stands on the south edge of that new corn belt. It's a big enough body of water that it may survive through the period of transition. That made it look like a good investment then, and that's why the Northwestern Fund was started up. I've read the brochure. The need to establish a research community has only made that investment mature earlier than expected. Conveniently for you, for everyone who's invested in the fund. And you wouldn't care to say just what percentage of the stock in Northwestern and in MedSec and in many ha ha hostels is owned by you and your relatives? All my investments are in a blind trust. Blind trust, mm hmm. Well, maybe some people have blind trust, but not me, Michaels. I think I lost mine when I was around twenty one. Twenty-two years old and watching Watergate on the TV every night with my folks after dinner, and hearing my old man say, if the president says something, I think we got to believe it. If you can't believe the president, who can you believe? I got into politics back then because I decided the only answer to that question was myself. I don't trust politicians or preachers or big business or even high school quarterbacks who swear they don't take drugs. It was me who got the law passed that started random blood testing at any high school or college sports event in the state. Everyone said what an invasion of privacy that was, and ACLU fought it all the way to the state Supreme Court. And when they finally started running the tests— do you know what percent tested out that they'd been using steroids? Thirty percent. It must have been a heady experience for you, Senator. And now, I imagine, you're hoping to get back in the headlines again with the new cause celebra you can drag through the courts for a few years. We'll get into the headlines together, Doctor. Of what exactly do I stand accused? Of having invested too wisely? Mill Lacks County belongs to the people who've been living there, not to some investment group that comes in and sucks up all the real estate on the market and then just warehouses it for a few years so there's less tourist business than before, less business in the stores, and stores folding. And you think now that you've sucked it almost dry, you can turn us into a human waste disposal facility and have the whole country ship all the Arvid's patients here that they're afraid to keep in their own hospitals. Well, twenty years ago, there was a company tried to turn the north part of the county into a toxic waste dump, but the people didn't let that happen, and the people won't let this happen either. In the course of the senator's diatribe, William had eased open the drawer of his desk to survey the possibilities. There was a small stack of business cards printed up with an extension of William's home phone number that was operative but never answered. These were his most reliable medium, as they had two built-in safeguards. They were effective only upon the individual who first was handed the card and took effect only after that person had dialed the number on it. 
William had only to specify the particular affliction he wished the card to transmit. Finishing his peroration, Senator Burton smiled as though listening to silent applause. From his shirt pocket, William removed a gold marked cross fountain pen that bore a transferred charge from the caduceus. He touched it to the topmost card in the pile, and beneath his breath intoned a curse he'd used many times before. When next you sleep, before you wake, a massive stroke your frame will shake. Paralyzed, no speech but tears, you'll linger half alive for years. Senator Burton rumbled some phlegm in his throat and demanded, Well, doctor? You must give me some time to think, and to speak with my associates. I intend to issue a statement to the press tomorrow. Then why did you come to see me? Simply so you could threaten me in person? There are many people besides myself with a stake in the mill lax development. I don't have standing authority to speak for them or make decisions for them. Indeed, the project already has so much momentum, I doubt it could be stopped, even if medical defense systems withdrew. That's all the more reason for me to act right away. Would a week make so much difference? I don't know. Would it? Let me find out. William rose and extended the business card that bore his curse. Meanwhile, if you'll take my card, this has my home phone number on it. And let me know beforehand, at that number, if you mean to make any statement to the press. The fat man levered himself into an upright position cumbersomely, like a balky construction crane. Then he held out his hand to take the card offered him, but the pudgy fingers were not quick enough, and the slip of pasteboard fluttered to the Persian carpet with a butterfly-like motion that seemed willfully evasive. William and Senator Burton looked down at the card on the carpet, each uncertain what to do. Even if he had been equal to the task, the senator was reluctant to bend down and pick up the card from the floor, and William, at the very instant the card had sprung to life and flown away, had remembered the god's advice of only minutes past, that he would be tempted to use the caduceus, but that he must forbear. Here, said William, dipping back into the desk drawer and taking out a second card, is another. Burton accepted it and tucked it into the breast pocket of his suit. When he had left the room, William retrieved the car that had fallen to the carpet. For a moment he considered destroying it. An ashtray and lighter were ready to hand. But then he reconsidered. It had been weeks since he'd visited the Obstschmecker house to renew the charge in his pen. There was untapped power still in the business card, and William's was a frugal nature. He put the card in his own suit pocket, wedged behind the handkerchief, in case he might need it. 62. Except for its high-gloss state of maintenance and the flag atop its flagpole, the Henry Michaels Memorial Clinic did not declare its institutional character from the sidewalk. It appeared to be no more than the amplest home along Luckner Boulevard. Inside, however, it was a model of health care management with facilities sufficient for the care of 60 patients, though only 37 beds were filled at the present moment. Madge Michaels kept it going with a staff of 12 nurses and male aides and a maintenance crew of five, mostly black, who served her with a military esprit de corps. In some ways, the Henry Michaels Memorial Clinic was a lot easier to run than a nursing home that catered to geriatric or terminally ill patients since all its residents shared the same perplexing incapacity as Madge's son Ned, a condition for which there was no certain etiology nor even a commonly accepted name. The clinic's promotional literature referred to it as Colmar's Syndrome, after its most famous victim, the astrologer Gloria Colmar. The 37 patients of both sexes and a wide range of ages and backgrounds were almost as easy to tend as a row of cabbages, and they afforded similar long-term satisfaction with regard to their response to the therapy they received. These improvements were slow to manifest themselves and rarely dramatic. Mrs. Johnston, in bed 12, had begun to be able to refuse food spooned into her mouth by spitting it out. Mr. Reiner, in bed 6, who had been in the clinic since it had opened in 1994, suddenly developed the ability to follow a moving object with his eyes, a sign not only of muscular regeneration, but of some kind of mental life as well. 
all the victims of Colmar's syndrome displayed a steady, if low, level of alpha rhythms, much as though they were yogis in a state of trance instead of semi-comatose, catheterized vegetables. None of the patients had yet achieved the big breakthrough that was the object of the staff's unceasing efforts and Madge's unreasoning hope. None had regained muscular control sufficient to communicate, by the blinking of an eyelid or the stirring of a finger, that there was still intelligence behind the dull-eyed, slack-jawed mask of Colmar's syndrome. But Madge was certain that someday, when enough data had been amassed, the pieces would fall into place and medical science would find the cure for the disease, and Ned would be well. All that was needed was the data, and the patients to gather the data, and the money to fund the research effort. So new patients were always welcome, even those who had to be received as charity cases, and the newest, Robert Corning, was the most welcome of all, since his medical history bore a striking resemblance to Ned's. They were approximately the same age. Ned was 37, Robert 39 and they had both atypically developed Colmar's syndrome as children. Robert might, in fact, be the first actual case of the disease, having manifested some symptoms as early as 1969. In his case, however, there had been a progressive degeneration of his capabilities, from an initial condition of spastic imbecility to the general incapacity characteristic of other victims. Because of this, and because he had been tended at home by his parents and received little professional attention, Robert Corning had not been diagnosed as suffering from Colmar's syndrome. Only after the death, a month ago, of his surviving parent, when he had become a ward of the state, was Robert's condition properly diagnosed. The clinic had been notified at once, and his transfer effected. And here he lay, in bed 38, the most pathetic patient in the clinic wasted to a skeleton, muscles the thinness of twine. How could his own parents have let him come to this? Almost all the patients had been in some way victims of neglect before being brought to the clinic. Vitamin deficiencies and bed sores were common. But none had presented such a spectacle of wretchedness as Robert Corning. According to the social worker who had spoken to the Corning's neighbors, the parents in their last years had lived at the extreme edge of destitution, rarely leaving their home on Kuhn Avenue. They'd avoided the attention of charities for fear their bubby would be taken from them and had subsisted on a diet made up mostly, to judge from the mounds of detritus in their kitchen, of powdered milk, strawberry jello, sardines, and canned peas. It seemed amazing that Robert had survived so long under such a regimen. Now, as though she were atoning for his parents' years of neglect, Madge gave at least an hour of every workday to Robert's particular care. Sometimes she would feed him, sometimes bathe his matchstick limbs. Most often she undertook the task of patterning, exercising the muscles he could not exercise himself. Years ago, when she had first begun to do the patterning for her own son, the endless repetitions had been a purgatory of boredom. Lift the foot, bend the knee, tilt to the right, tilt to the left, pull the legs straight, flex the instep, stretch the toes, then the other leg. But now, after performing these rituals for almost half her lifetime, they'd become a source of inner peace. She'd read once in a book about Gandhi that he'd insisted that all his followers spend part of each day, as he did, operating a primitive spinning wheel. These bodies were Madge's spinning wheels, and the hours she spent in patterning exercises were her devotions. She had finished with Robert's lower limbs and begun the more delicate work on his next wasted trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles, tilting the head back, then lowering the chin to the clavicle, tilting it, turning it to left and right, lowering it, when her stepson and employer appeared at the doorway of the room. Being at work, she addressed him in her capacity as an employee. Dr. Michaels, I wasn't expecting you. I'm not here as Dr. Michaels. I was on my way home with Ben. Lisa's planned an official family dinner, and I thought I'd drop by here and see if I could tempt you to join us. Lisa and the boys will be off to visit her brother soon, and I know she'd love to have you come. The boys, too. Oh, you know, I'd love to, but there's Mother. She'd never have to know, William inveigled. You could say an emergency came and you had to stay late. 
Madge snorted amusement. I can't imagine what emergency could happen here unless there was a fire. William looked down curiously at the withered carcass of Robert Corning. Who's this? I don't think I recognize him. Madge knew he was not just being polite. William had a wonderful memory for all the patients in the clinic. Madge had just begun to fill him in about Robert Corning's history when her secretary, Gail Robbins, came to the door to say she had a very urgent phone call, and Madge had to excuse herself, adding hopefully, If you can wait just a minute, William, I really would love to take you up on your invitation. I'll still be here, he assured her. In her own office, she picked up the phone and said, Nurse Michael's here. Madge, is that you? It was her mother. Surely by now Gail should know that all Mrs. O's calls belonged in the she's in a meeting category. Yes, mother, it's me. Is this you? But Mrs. O was invincibly literal-minded. Of course it's me. Can't you tell my voice on the telephone? The reason I called is there's someone at the door and he won't go away. He's been here half an hour. I called before, but that secretary said you were in a meeting. I swear you must not do anything else at that place but go to meetings. Finally, I told her it was an emergency. He won't go away. He says he's your husband. Madge did a silent double take. Not Henry. Henry was dead. Could it be Lance, after all these years? Madge? Do you mean my first husband, mother, Lance Hill? Is that who's there? He's out on the porch. Why don't you let him in? For one thing, how can I tell he's who he says he is? He looks like any other old man on the street. We all age, mother. I mean... Mrs. O lowered her voice to a scandalized whisper. He doesn't look very clean, and he wants to park his car in the garage. And it isn't even a car, it's a pickup. And he wants to use the toilet. All the more reason. He could go to a filling station. Filling stations don't have public toilets anymore, Mother. Not even bars do. Well, that's not my fault. He can just hold his horses. Mother, if you're using the cordless phone, I would like to have a word with Lance. So would you slip the phone through the mail slot? And what if he takes it and goes off? Mother, we've been through this before. Please. There was a longer silence, punctuated by the noises marking the phone's passage through the mail slot. Then, like turning a corner and finding herself back in the year 1965, she heard Lance's voice say, Madge? And there was no doubting it was Lance, and that his voice had the same power over her that it had had when they'd started dating in high school. My God, it really is you. That's what I've been trying to tell your mother, but she's been a lot harder to convince. From what I can see through the window, she hasn't aged a day since I saw her last. Thirty-two years ago. Thirty-two years ago, Madge marveled. Tears were starting to form at the corners of her eyes, and in her chest the first clenchings of the fist of love's old misery. In a way, her feelings were in perfect accord with her mother's. She didn't want to let Lance into the house. I guess I should have phoned in advance, but I wanted to surprise you. You succeeded. Do you think you could convince your mother to let me go to the toilet? I'd hate to get this far, past the border patrol and everything, and then be arrested for creating a public nuisance, which I will any minute if I don't get to a toilet. Aren't you here legally? I'm not here as Lance Hill. I'm Launce, with a U. That's what's on all my ID now. And I guess it was enough of a difference to let me slip past the computer at customs. You got to admit it sounds a whole lot classier. Once. Madge chuckled. He didn't seem to have changed one iota. Do you still have a mustache? she asked. Yes, and chewing on it is the only thing keeping me from shitting in my pants at this point. Please tell your mother to have mercy on me. Okay, but Lance? Launce. It's going to take me a while to say Launce without giggling. There's just one thing. Would you wait till I get home before you go up to see Ned? It's just that it could be upsetting, and I'd rather be there. I guess if I've waited this long, I can wait a few hours longer. Whatever you say. Thanks. Now slip the phone back to Mother, and I'll have her let you in.
The connection did not survive the phone's return trip through the mail slot, and Madge had to wait for her mother to redial and Gail to reconnect. Time enough to collect her wits and settle her nerves. There was no reason in the world to suppose Lance had come back on her account, no reason to suppose they'd even like each other again after ten minutes together. Love was like some damned sliver of frog tissue in a tenth-grade science class. The frog may have been dead who knows how long, but the tissue still twitches when it gets zapped. Madge, her mother whined the moment she had got through the switchboard again. Madge, he's still out there. Mother, you know, Lance, why make such a fuss? Just let him come in and use the toilet, for heaven's sakes. I don't trust him. Mother, you don't trust anyone. Oh, very well. After a spell of silence, Mrs. O announced, It's not working. I can't get that thing to unlock the door. That's strange. You never have trouble with a security system when there's a delivery. It must be broken. What did you press? Just what's written down on the pad. O oh, five two four nine nine. Mother, I've explained before. You've got to punch in today's date. The number on the pad is from three weeks ago. So tell me what numbers I'm supposed to use. O oh, six one four nine nine. Wait, wait, one at a time. Within five minutes, Madge had talked Mrs. O through the process of releasing the security bolt on the door. She felt the same glow of high-tech accomplishment an air traffic controller must feel after coaching a passenger in landing a 747. Lance took the phone from Mrs. O just long enough to say, Thanks, see you later. Just four words as he ran for the toilet, but it was as though she'd felt his hand touch her in the dark. Back in room 38, she had to beg out of the dinner invitation, offering her mother's health as an excuse and saying nothing about Lance's sudden reappearance. She wanted to see him again before she broadcast the news. William seemed skeptical about Mrs. O's purported indisposition. He probably assumed that Madge was being tyrannized by her mother, a reasonable assumption. Before he left, he wanted to know everything she could tell him about Robert Corning, and while she told the story, he kept playing with his Mark Cross pen, screwing the ballpoint tip in and out nervously. From all you say, his life's been hell, William said with a thoughtful frown. Then with a faint smile and a tap of the gold pen on the man's bare shoulder. But now that he's here, he may get well. Madge smiled and repeated one of Henry's favorite stock phrases. You're a poet, William, and you don't even know it. When he'd left, Madge looked down at the inert body of Robert Corning and felt an overwhelming sadness and sense of futility. All these years of moving limbs and needing flesh that could not move or need her in return. All these years without love. 63. Dinner time was sacred in the Michaels household, in theory but like so much else nowadays that was supposed to be sacred, its day-to-day -day ritual observance was left to the women and children. Two nights out of three, Lisa would preside over a rite attended only by Jason and Henry and their nanny. William's absences were dictated by the demands of MDS, even in a sense, by history, both higher priorities than hearth and home. But when Judge did not appear at dinner, it wasn't because he was away from the house. By the terms of his parole, he couldn't be. It was simply to accommodate his and Lisa's mutual aversion. The only way Lisa could keep from seeming a wicked stepmother was to reduce direct contact to a minimum. Let the boy spend all his time at the screen of his monitor, interfacing with his cartoon prophet brother Orson. It was too late, in any case, for Judge's rough edges to be smoothed by the civilizing influence of dinnertime conversation as well try civilizing thistles. But this evening William was to be home for dinner, and he was bringing Judge's grandfather with him, the only person in the world, Lisa suspected, who actually liked the boy. Lisa had gone to her stepson's room and laid down the law. He would be at the dinner table at 7.30, and he would dress properly. Not that Judge ever dressed any other way. Indeed, more than one of his fights with Lisa had been over his objections to the immodesty of her wardrobe, 
which was such a droll reversal of the usual sartorial standoff between the generations in suburbia, that sometimes Lisa, for her own amusement, dressed on purpose to provoke him. It wasn't hard. A bare shoulder would do the trick, or jeans that hugged her ass too closely. So tonight they would have a family dinner by the book. William had phoned from the limo that he and Ben were already en route. Henry and Jason were being scrubbed and polished by their nanny, and Judge, from within the fastness of his bedroom, had acknowledged her summons. In the kitchen, Dory was in a whirl of varied purposes, as the venison roasted and the soup simmered and the celery root soaked in a remoulade. And here, in what Lisa liked to think of as the atrium, because of its showy, energy-saving skylight, Lisa was trying to achieve a balance between opulence and excess in the arrangement of the bushels of roses William had gathered from the garden this morning, a holocaust of roses. Such profusions might represent an overflow from the morning's other pleasures. They'd been ruddy as two goats all through the weekend. Or they might simply reflect William's sometimes naive faith in conspicuous consumption. Lisa was not herself averse to immodest display, but only when there was an aesthetic program behind it. William spent money like a televangelist or a third-world dictator, and he just stuffed roses into anything that held water. It was Lisa's executive duty as an upper-middle-class wife to protect her spouse from such self-parody. When the roses had been recomposed to best effect, Lisa sat down and did a quick skim of the news, avoiding obits and shortages and other material in the category of depressing, and scouting out interesting local crime stories. The Buster Johnson child abuse case from nearly a year ago was still in the news, and there was a wonderful clip of Johnson's ex-wife fuming at the judge in front of the courthouse. Then a story about an unidentified, because decapitated, corpse presumed to have been murdered, which had been deposited in the parking lot of the House of Pancakes on Lake Street. The dumping of mutilated and untraceable plague victims on roadsides and back alleys had become so common that the body had almost been carted off routinely to the big crematorium at the state fairgrounds without having been tested for arvids. Lisa felt she'd scored points against the sightgeist, since she'd already proposed to two of her friends, both mystery buffs, that the easiest way for a murderer to dispose of a corpse these days was to chop off the head, bury it, or freeze it, and leave the carcass for the municipal health authorities to take care of. She had the printer make a print copy of the story so she could document her perspicacity. While the printer purred, Lisa shot a spritz of soda into a snifter and let the cable choose the news by its own set of priorities. It switched to 39, the live news channel, and the first image on the screen was a mural map of the Mill Lax Lake with an anchor woman in front of it in a flame-bright yellow-orange blouse and speaking in a tone of voice reserved for serious trouble. Senator Burton's allegations, if they prove to be true, spell big trouble for Twin Cities medical miracle maker, Dr. William Michaels, and his prestigious research foundation, Medical Defense Systems. MDS spokesperson Valerie Bright denies that the Foundation and its board have committed any improprieties. But questioned about the Northwestern Development Fund, Ms. Bright was less forthcoming. The newscast cut to a close-up of Valerie Bright wearing her invincible Nutra sweet smile and painted thick as a de Kooning. There is nothing in what Senator Burton says that in any way reflects on the conduct of MDS. Obviously, he is looking for any pretext he can to keep the state's project out of the area he represents in the state legislature. Does Dr. Michaels have a financial interest in the three companies Senator Burton cited? An unseen reporter insisted, and even before Ms. Bright could begin to equivocate, Lisa could feel it coming. Don't ask for whom the bell tolls. No, indeed. She told her brother, when he'd involved his own company in the undertaking, that he was moving too fast. But the prospect had proved irresistible, and Jason had taken the plunge, and he'd brought in other major investors, banks and retirement funds, all desperate to invest in the one growth industry in a collapsing market. Death. She had better phone Jason right away. 
He was in Boston, and a Minnesota state senator's news conference would probably not command the same immediate media attention. There might not be anything Jason could do at this point, maybe nothing he would want to do. It wasn't a crime to make money, after all. There had been fortunes made during the AIDS crisis by those, including William, who had recognized its investment potentials. The Mill Lax project had already acquired so much momentum, mere scandal might not be able to derail it. At least that seemed the best hope for the moment and the tack to take with William. The phone rang. Could it be telepathy? Was Jason calling her? No such luck. It was Her Holiness Judith Winklemeyer. To Lisa's mind, Judge's mother was as much of a trial as Judge himself, and for much the same reason. They both acted as though anything they might have to say to you was just a parenthesis in their permanent long-distance conversations with God. Judith's God had somewhat better manners than Judge's, and joining her sometimes to seem to listen to other people. But finally, there was no reasoning with either of them. Judith, how nice of you to call. Where are you? I'm at the bus station. In Minneapolis? Or Tampa? Is Judge there? I'd like to talk to him. Judge has his own phone line. Don't you have the number? Of course, but it's always busy. He must be interfacing with Brother Orson. Still, after all the stories there have been? He won't listen to anything anyone says on TV, except for Brother Orson, of course. In him, his faith is perfect. Judith sighed. That's so like William. Which seemed, Lisa thought, an odd remark. Like William? Judith had no answer ready to hand, and Lisa let it go by. She asked what she most wanted to know. Are you coming here? I wish I didn't have to. Which meant Judith was under orders from her God and not to be argued with. When? Lisa asked. By bus? Of course by bus, since Judith was opposed on principle to air travel because of the carbon emissions per passenger mile ratio. She asked only because she enjoyed rubbing Judith's nose in the sillier consequences of her high-mindedness. Yes, by bus. It doesn't take that much longer, and it's safer. As long as I get there before the 4th, I'm worried about Judge. The 4th of July was Judge's birthday. He would be 18. How's that? Do you think he'll self-destruct, commit new acts of arson? I think he's grown out of that, Judith. Kids go through these stages. Murder, perhaps, but that will be less of a danger once he's moved out of here, for both of us. Has he said that's what he means to do? He hasn't threatened me in so many words, but it's there in his body language. I mean leave home. Did he say he's moving away? I think that that goes without saying. Judge isn't happy here. He considers all Willowville a prison, and it is, for him. For two years almost, he's had to keep within a half mile of this house when he hasn't been in school. And I know from my own experience that there is nothing to be done within a half mile of this house but mow lawns. The boys stir crazy. Anyone would be. But for him it's a little worse, because none of us share his fixation with his ridiculous profit. None of us, to be perfectly truthful, like him. Except possibly for your father. You can say that and ask me why I'm worried. Do you think your appearing here is going to be a bright candle on his birthday cake? The last I heard, you and Judge were not on speaking terms. But he can't refuse to see me, not while he's a minor and I'm his mother. After the fourth, I'm afraid it'll be too late. He'll be swallowed up by the Orsonians, and I'll never see him again. Speaking of religious organizations, Judith, how is the convent? It isn't a convent, Lisa. It's a community of sharing. I imagine Judge would regard the Orsonians much the same way, don't you? If that's what he opts for, he might just as easily go into the Marines. His sense of the approaching apocalypse has a large guns and ammo component. You should see him practicing with his throwing knives. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, indeed. But come and see for yourself. As you say, for two more weeks he's still a captive audience. Do you know when your bus gets into town? Shall I send our car to pick you up? Judith gave the details of her arrival on Wednesday morning, and Lisa agreed not to give Judge advance warning of the visit. 
Little as she liked Judith, Lisa rather looked forward to seeing the two of them at loggerheads. The immovable object versus the irresistible force. A perfect match. There was still time to call Jason. She dialed the number of Fine, Schechner, and Joseph, and was routed to Jason's home line, where a machine answered. Jason, if you're there, Lisa said, shouting down her brother's recorded voice, please pick up. It's important. Lisa, he said, I know why you're calling. You heard about that Senator Burton. Am I right? I didn't think you would have heard so quickly. My spies are everywhere. Is it serious? Do you mean will it sink the project? It could, but I doubt it. There are too many people involved, too much money already in the pipeline. But there'll be some kind of scandal, and it looks like William will bear the brunt of it. That guy Burton has done his homework. In fact, he's dug up some stuff our own staff never knew about. Some of William's earliest real estate deals in that area go back to 86. How old would he have been in 86? Is that a serious question? Am I supposed to get a calculator? He was 19, in his first year at medical school, an orphan. Where'd he get almost half a million to buy up a bungalow colony? You probably know better than me. He had some insurance money from his father. He was lucky on the market, and he got out before the crash. William occupied ground zero of the American dream. How do you think I was wooed so quickly? I always thought you married him for his pheromones. What I'm worried about, Jason, is if things do turn sour, what kind of trouble could William find himself in? What does he stand to lose if his project is scuttled? In that, let us hope, unlikely event, just about everything, except MDS. And if there's a real scandal, he might even lose control there. Jail? It's a possibility. On what grounds? A project on the scale of the Mill Lax Lake thing requires cooperation at every level of government. Money buys cooperation. But I would bet that William has kept from becoming directly involved in that side of things. William is smart. He'd see to it that he'd have deniability. Jason, would you be an angel and call Mother and explain the situation and tell her I may be bringing the boys to the Berkshires for the fourth, possibly for the rest of the summer? Are you thinking of a preemptive divorce? I don't know. I might leave him. And if I do, I shouldn't dally. As Lady Macbeth says, If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. You mean you want the settlement made before he's gone bust? That would seem a reasonable objective. He'll know why you're doing this, Lisa. It's transparent. I've never told him how to run his business. The marriage is my business. And what about for better or worse? Jason, Whose side are you on? Just curious. Okay, I'll talk to Mother. I hope it doesn't have to come to that. I like William. And so do I, enormously. He's as bright as anyone I've ever known, and he's good company, and he's actually quite good in bed, though rather more athletic than tender. We have what you might call aerobic sex. And as a parent, he's been concerned and responsible, and the boys are undoubtedly fond of him though I wouldn't say they were that close. William and I have brought them up on the English model, and their nanny is probably the largest adult presence in their life. If she were to leave, Jason and Henry would be desolated. But William's absence would affect them not much more than the discontinuance of their favorite TV show. I'm exaggerating, of course, but not that much. It sounds like you've been considering this for a long time. I suppose in some ways I've had it in mind from the day we got married, or engaged, rather. We neither of us ever claimed to be in a condition of romantic passion. We discussed the practical assets and liabilities side of what we were doing. But it doesn't sound like you're intending to have a similar discussion this time. No, I confess it. I'm a coward. I'll discuss it with him once it's a fait accompli and I'm with Mother. And I'd better not discuss it any longer now with you. William will be home any moment. Give my love to Abigail, but don't say a word about this to her. It all may come to nothing. But she knew, even as she expressed that pious hope, that the marriage was over. It wasn't even that upsetting. 
she'd been more fraught, more agitated, during the President's impeachment. Though, of course, that had gone on for several months, and this was only beginning. If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. Tomorrow. Otherwise she would have to contend with Judith Winklemeyer while she was packing the bags. Tomorrow. She felt as giddy as a teenager. The one thing nobody had ever told her about divorce was that it could be such fun. 64. If you looked at the screen in a certain way, you really couldn't tell the difference between Brother Orson and a real person looking into a TV camera. Sometimes Brother Orson even came across as more real. But you had to be connecting with what he was saying, with the meaning behind the words. Then his eyes were like two tunnels opening at some infinite faraway distance into heaven's direct light. You looked into those eyes, and you were already part of the way there. Or when he said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things that have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then you could see, in the very shape of his lips as he spoke, the edge of that secret. It was like a joke that he was sharing with everyone who was saved, like an amazing punchline that makes it clear that all the terrible things that were happening now during the last days were actually a blessing and a gift, and the plague a cleansing fire, and the scorn of unbelievers a precious raiment for the adornment of the righteous. That's why the more people ridiculed Judge's faith, the stronger his faith became. They could subject him to their shrinks and deprogrammers. They could bombard him with phone calls from people who claimed they'd been involved in Brother Orson's operations, who claimed he didn't exist. They could fix an electronic trigger round his ankle to keep him caged like a dog inside his bit of suburbia. But they hadn't made a dent in Judge's faith. Finally, when Judge had threatened to call the local Ma Bell hotline and post a bulletin to the effect that the son of the big celebrity doctor, William Michaels, was being denied his basic freedom of religion, they'd backed down completely and let him interface directly with Brother Orson on a 900 line. His stepmother had been ready to call his bluff, though it wasn't a bluff, he would have done it, but the famous doctor, William Michaels, was too concerned for his media image. It pissed Judge off a little that his stepfather was so indifferent to Judge's involvement with Brother Orson. Judge knew William thought Brother Orson was some kind of consumer fraud like savings and loans or Scientology. But had he ever told Judge to be careful or just said to stop watching Brother Orson? No, he was a permissive parent. He couldn't care less. Brother Orson came down hard on permissiveness. He liked to quote Colossians, 3rd chapter, 20th verse. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. But then he would say, in almost the same breath, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. The Father shall be divided against the Son, and the Son against the Father. Luke's lines reflected Judge's own experience much better than Paul's. Once, interfacing with Brother Orson on the 900 line, Judge had had the nerve to point out what seemed to him the contradiction between the two verses. Brother Orson had bowed his head and wrinkled his eyebrows into a frown of thoughtfulness, as though the question had never occurred to him till just that moment. Then he'd looked up, right into Judge's eyes, and smiled one of those tunnels-to-heaven smiles, and that's when he'd said, You must ask yourself, Judge, who are your true parents? Your true parents are your parents in the baptism of the gospel. You have a father in heaven, and one on earth, and another in the water of your baptism. Judge would have liked to know more about his true parents in the baptism of the gospel, which was the first he'd heard of that idea. But Brother Orson didn't always spell out his deepest meanings. You had to take what he said and think about it. One thing that was immediately clear was that Paul's injunction to obey one's parents in all things referred to one's parents in the baptism of the gospel, not to the two adults who happened to be judges' legal parents. It was about them that Christ had been talking in the parable of the unjust steward. Make yourselves friends, Christ said, of the mammon of unrighteousness. 
meaning it was okay to accept the money and other advantages that came from living with the Michaelses and to be polite to them. Judge gave their mammon the worship they required, neat haircuts and shined shoes, thank yous and excuse me's, passing grades in all his classes, even if that meant repeating the lies and deceits of atheistic humanism when he took exams. Whatever had to be done to get through the system. But it didn't mean they owned him. It didn't mean that they hadn't drunk the wine of Babylon. They were partakers of her sins, and God knew their iniquities, and so did Judge. Partly he knew them just by instinct, but he also knew them by listening to the tap he'd put on the house's main optical fiber cable. Mostly what Judge heard wasn't that interesting. Over the phone, William never talked about anything but business, sometimes medical business, usually wheelings and dealings connected with his real estate projects around Mill Lacks Lake. If Judge had realized those deals had had the potential of bringing his stepfather to financial ruin, perhaps even sending him to prison, he might have paid more attention. He'd just seen them as evidence of mammon doing business as usual. It was Lisa's calls, much more, that he liked to listen in on, especially when she was going on about how much she couldn't stand him, which was one of her favorite topics. Like just now when she joked about his murdering her. That was something he had thought about, in fact. Not his killing her himself, but what was likely to happen to her after the judgment. Brother Orson had spelled out some of the details pretty graphically. In many ways, Lisa understood him a lot better than his real mother, who seemed to think Judge was like a defective TV set, and that if she could just find the right knob and fiddle with it, Judge would suddenly slip into focus and be just like her. Another renegade Catholic do-gooder serving up shitty food to brain-damaged addicts in soup kitchens. Brother Orson had no use for people like that. In the last days, Judith would be burnt up in the same fires that would consume Lisa and William, and all her so-called good works wouldn't abate his wrath one bit. The crusades against fur coats and abortion and killing nuns in El Salvador and quarantine camps. The Lord God Jehovah didn't give a shit about any of that. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He would ask her. Who shut up the sea with doors? and then he would zap her straight down to the garbage pits of Gehenna, where Moloch rules and the fires are not quenched. Till that day came, however, Judge was under the thumb of their unrighteousness. This close to his eighteenth birthday and legal freedom, Judge still couldn't try and make a break for it. Even if his credit card was valid for purposes of travel, the trigger banded around his ankle would go off any time he crossed the invisible perimeter set by the parole board. He would not hear it, but somewhere, in some security office, a blip would appear on a screen along with his name and social security number, and automatically a federal parole officer would be on his case. Judge had tested out the system twice. The first time he'd got as far as Brother Orson's downtown Minneapolis office, where he sat in the waiting room twenty minutes before being cuffed and returned to the Michaelses. The second time he'd headed north away from the city, and they'd picked him up even faster. So there was no way of escaping his mother's visit and all the lectures he was sure she meant to deliver, all the psychological gobbledygook and Catholic bullshit. It upset him. Judge did not like to admit that the forces of unrighteousness, including his mother, had the power to stir him up like this, so that his muscles felt like they were being roasted in a microwave. Not his skin, his muscles so that his head felt like there were calipers squeezing closed round his skull. He knew it was just his emotions, but it felt like his body. Back in the bad old days at the Florida State Correctional Facility for Juvenile Offenders in Stark, he'd been made to take pills that had dulled down the feeling but dimmed his thinking processes at the same time. So since then, to avoid the medicine, he never complained about the burning up feeling when it happened. What he did instead, what he did now was dial Brother Orson's 900 number. And Brother Orson would appear. He appeared now, and he would lift up his eyes till they met Judge's own gaze levelly, and his lips would part in a little smile of recognition. Why, if it isn't my old friend Judge. 
Howdy, Judge. Welcome to the arms of Jesus. Howdy, Brother Orson, Judge replied. He didn't even think to enter his greeting on the keyboard. He was that off-kilter. But it didn't seem to make any difference to Brother Orson, for his brow furrowed as though sensing Judge's unexpressed distress. He leaned forward in his high-backed chair, and a ray of light struck his silvery gold hair, dazzled a moment, and dulled to a shimmer. I think I know what's troubling you, Judge. It's the lies the media are spreading about us. Lies, doubts, distortions, they're impossible to escape. The unbelievers saying that I don't exist, that I am nothing but a computer-generated image, that when I'm talking with you, it's just a script written by a whole stable of paid writers, that when I respond to your questions, my answers come from a computer programmed to provide one-size-fits-all wisdom. They're saying Brother Orson is just a new style of Santa Claus, a fiction, a myth, a lot of nonsense. And you know what else they'd say if they dared to judge? They'd say the same about Jesus Christ and God Almighty. They'd say there's no devil. He's just a superstition from the Middle Ages. So don't worry about him. Go and have yourself a good time. There's no devil, no hell where sinners will pay for their sins. No Ten Commandments handed down to us. And the Bible is just another book like the books they make you read in school. Huckleberry Finn or The Catcher in the Rye. They made you read those two, didn't they? Judge nodded. He didn't remember ever having complained to Brother Orson about the secular humanist brainwashing he received at school, and he certainly hadn't mentioned those two books in particular. Brother Orson had known without being told. It was not unusual. Well, woe unto them, that's all I can say, woe unto them, because hell exists, and there are devils in it, waiting to make the acquaintance of those unbelievers. One of those devils looks at a sinner, and that sinner starts burning up inside like he was a cigarette the devil did up. Brother Orson, Judge said, unaware that he was interrupting, I am burning up inside. That's why I phoned you now. Judge, said Brother Orson, do you believe in me? The question didn't seem to connect to what Judge had just said, but the connection was there in Brother Orson's eyes. Yes, sir. Absolutely and completely. Absolutely and completely, Brother Orson repeated, though Judge had not typed the words out on the keyboard. I knew that, Judge, and now I am going to unfold a mystery. I want you to reach behind your computer to the power switch. Judge leaned forward and put his finger on the computer's power switch. Now, if I were what the unbelievers say I am, I would disappear from the screen you're looking at if you turned off the electricity. Isn't that so? But I am not what they say. My voice is not sound waves. It is not broadcast signals. It is not wiring inside a microchip. It is the voice of faith, and when there is faith in your soul, you will hear that voice, with or without electricity. Do you believe that, Judge? Yes, Brother Orson, I do. Then click the switch off, and I will be with you still. With no hesitation, like a diver bounding from a familiar springboard, Judge turned off the power switch. The image on the screen seemed to undergo a shift of hue, as though a shadow had passed over Brother Orson's face. But when the shadow had passed, Brother Orson's face was still there, bright as an angel's. Even his clothes were like an angel's, a kind of short white dress like marble statues wear in museums. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, the burning-up feeling inside his body was gone. His mind was suddenly crystal clear. He hadn't realized how clouded and static he had had been before, the way you get used to wearing smudged glasses until, just as in First Corinthians, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Brother Orson smiled, and this time the secret that his lips had always seemed to hint at became known to Judge. Brother Orson had put on the flesh of incorruption. That was why he had to appear on television screens as though drawn by an animator. He was no longer a physical person. It was as Paul had written, We are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
and Judge was present with the Lord, here in his suburban bedroom, with its shelves and closets loaded with junk, apparel for his mortal flesh. The very walls about him had been reared by the wages of sin, which is death. But when this corruptible flesh shall have put on incorruption, as Brother Orson had, then death is swallowed up in victory, and the old law was overthrown, and a new law declared. That was the prophecy of Paul, and now the prophecy was fulfilled. Judge, who had refused from an early age to kneel at the ringing of the bell when his mother had made him come with her to church, knelt now on the beige carpet. Wordlessly, Brother Orson held out his hand. Reverently, Judge kissed it. He felt his own flesh change. Flames rose from the carpet and from the white formica of his desk, but they were without heat or hurt. The room became unbearably bright, as though its air were gases fluorescing in a neon bulb. Then the bulb blew. 65. During the two and a half years that Ben Winklemeyer served of his five-year sentence, he had developed a fascination for the book of Job. This was due in part to the fact that his reading matter had often been limited by the whims of the warden to the Bible, but mostly because he genuinely shared Job's sense of outrage and puzzlement. The more he read the story and thought about it, the more bizarre it seemed particularly God's final set piece of self-congratulation, after he'd ridiculed Job for being a ninety-eight-pound weakling, after he'd delivered his natural history lessons on vultures, ostriches, and whales, when he got to the crocodile. Consider, God had said, the chief of the beasts, the crocodile, who devours cattle as if they were grass. What strength is in his loins? What power in the muscles of his belly? On and on God goes for two pages of small print about the sinews of the crocodile, its thick skin, its terrible teeth, how weapons are useless against it, how even its sneezes are to be admired. God doesn't come right out and make the comparison, but it seemed clear to Ben that God was proposing the crocodile as an emblem of his own awful power, to which the non-crocodile part of creation must make an unconditional obeisance which Job does, repenting in dust and ashes, whereupon there is an unlikely restoration of the status ante quo. As though to say nobody ever really has to suffer, it's only a phase you pass through. Just hang in there, show due respect for crocodiles, and all will be well. What could God, or the author of the book of Job, have been thinking of in singing the praises of the crocodile at such length? To Ben it was on a par with Stalin's having his portrait hung in every jail cell in Russia. What do crocodiles have to do with justice? Jesus, it wasn't that Ben had a different opinion than God. He agreed that justice was a mug's game, and that the likeliest way to recoup one's losses was to kiss the crocodile ass of constituted authority. And as much as Job, Ben had done so by following the canny advice of his old friend Dan Turnage, and being born again under the auspices of the right-wing evangelical group that Turnage had pimped for since the American Tobacco Alliance had gone belly up. Ben became a role model of a whited sepulcher, and, just as Turnage had promised, was released at his first parole hearing. Even after his release, Ben continued to be an active member of the Son of Man Foundation for he discovered the secret wisdom of the book of Job, that it is exciting and profitable to work for crocodiles. He found he had a talent for inventing the kind of nonsense people could pretend to believe in order to feel that they were on the side of the crocodiles. He became an expounder of creation science and an enthusiastic supporter of Pat Robertson, and as a private joke between himself and the Almighty, he took to wearing Izod shirts. Meanwhile, like Job, his fortunes were restored, and his possessions doubled. Those were the eighties, and the market had been kind to most investors, but to Ben's teenage stepson the market had been a very genie. During the time Ben was in prison, the boy had made a small fortune playing the market. His first big killing came from National Biodynamic Labs, a private for-profit research hospital offering an experimental cancer treatment that involved the use of monoclonal antibodies. The technology for creating monoclonals had only come into being in 1975, and the therapy it made possible was time-consuming, incredibly expensive, and virtually untested. 
NBL represented a literally desperate hope. Prudent investors naturally had shied away from the stock until the first test results began to be published showing significant rates of remission. Then the gold rush had begun, and William Michaels's initial investment of $95,000, insurance monies he'd received at his father's death, which he'd been allowed to invest at his own discretion, had grown to almost a million. Ben had looked on in wonder as the boy had moved with an unerring instinct from stock to stock, always buying into companies like NBL at just the moment their fortunes were about to take off. After William's third great windfall, Ben, just out of prison and feeling the recklessness of conscious freedom, had put his own fortunes into William's hands. It was like riding a winner's coattails at the roulette table except that William's successes seemed too consistent to be ascribed to luck. If William's profits had been the result of mergers and takeovers, one might assume that he was dipping into the data bank of some inside trader. But that could not be the case. William's talent had nothing to do with the market and everything to do with medicine. He seemed to have a dowser's instinct, even before becoming a researcher himself, for knowing from the bare outline of a medical experiment whether or not it would succeed or fail. After a while, Ben simply accepted William's gifts as God-given, and no more to be questioned than the sufferings and deaths that were the rich loam, so to speak, from which these prophets sprang. Having toiled in the service of the American Tobacco Alliance so many years, it wasn't hard for Ben to set a limit to his curiosity concerning the ultimate source of his income. In the last analysis, he supposed, all money came from crocodiles. Do you remember, he asked William, who was seated in back of the chauffeur and watching the traffic, quite as though he'd been doing the driving himself, a cartoonist called Saul Steinberg? There was a financier called Saul Steinberg. I read an article in Fortune ten, twelve years ago. There was a cartoonist by the same name. He was in the New Yorker a lot. I remember the New Yorker. Anyhow, what about him? He used to draw scenes of highways filled with cars that looked like crocodiles. I never got the point till just now. And what's the point? His bones are tubes of bronze, and his limbs like bars of iron. He is the chief of God's works, made to be a tyrant over his peers. If ever you lift your hand against him, think of the struggle that awaits you, and let be. That's Jehovah's view of crocodiles, and it fits the automobile perfectly, if you think of the highway as a kind of river, the way everyone accepts cars as a fatal necessity, and even admires them. It's just the way God told Job to think of crocodiles. Steinberg was brilliant. He really was. I thought you were against automobiles, William said, turning sideways and inviting Ben to resume the argument that had been going on between them now for almost two decades, the argument about technology and where it would all lead. But that's just it. One can't be against automobiles any more than one can be against crocodiles. Here we are a decade after the hole in the ozone layer was documented and the greenhouse effect is a daily reality, and the cars are still on the road pumping more carbon into the atmosphere. His nostrils pour forth smoke like a cauldron on a fire blown to full heat. That's the crocodile again, I take it. Ben nodded. Who was, if you think about it, the last surviving relative of the dinosaur? So, in a way, the automobile is the dinosaur getting the last laugh. They've been refined to their irreducible molecular minimum, but they haven't given up against the mammals. The rolls was slowing down for no apparent reason, and William picked up the intercom to ask the chauffeur what the problem was. The chauffeur theorized it was a public health roadblock. William whispered, Shit. Ben poured himself a second glass of wine and held the bottle up with a questioning look to William, who nodded his assent. Outside, in the ninety-four-degree heat, the traffic snarled to a complete stop. A blonde teenager alone in the back seat of a Honda began combing her hair, using as her mirror the rolls window through which Ben watched. She seemed an allegory of youth, its genuine, ingenuous assumption that all the world reflects its own bland values. It did not occur to her that there might be someone behind her mirror studying her. 
Once, in Ben's own youth, the entire country had seemed like that. He still remembered the tune, though not the exact words, of the wonderful ad from the seventies about wanting to give the whole world a Coke. And why not? It was a realizable hope. Let them drink Coke. What's so funny? William asked glumly. I was thinking about Marie Antoinette. Guillotines amuse you? There won't be any guillotines for us. If Senator Burton had made his stink two years ago, when the project was first proposed, we might be in trouble. Now there are simply too many others involved. We have achieved full bureaucratic inertia. We are unstoppable. That's the beauty of being an institution instead of a person. Ben was spared from having to produce any more positive thinking by the appearance at the chauffeur's window of a white and tanned uniformed PHA officer who explained that the public health authority was conducting a random sampling and that the riders in every seventh car had to submit to a blood test. The chauffeur tried to explain that such rules didn't apply to Dr. William Michaels. The officer was adamant. William rapped on the window and told the chauffeur to yield to the inevitable. The PHA officer directed their car over to the right, where the rolls took its place in line, just behind the Honda with the blonde girl in the back seat. The PHA van, where the blood tests were being administered, was fifty yards ahead. One of the intervening vehicles was a school bus full of kids. We are going to be here an hour minimum, Ben observed. William sighed a philosophic sigh. I can't complain. I was on the board that drew up the guidelines for operations like this. The more holes you allow in a net, the less effective the net will be. It stands to reason. At least we've got air conditioning. If Judith were with us, she'd want us to turn it off out of respect for the ozone layer. It's too late to worry about the ozone layer. Ben went him one better. It's too late to worry about the atmosphere. Or the rainforests, William added. Or whales. Not to mention several hundred varieties of phytoplankton. You read about that one, too? That sounds like the scariest so far, if it's true. Half the known species of algae in the Antarctic are dying off. Half. Now that's the pessimistic way of looking at it. An optimist would say that half of them have survived. Ben laughed and lofted the bottle. Your glass is half empty. But now, he poured, it's full. Ben leaned back and regarded the sear grass at the road's edge as though it were emblematic of what they had been discussing which quite possibly it was. The corn belt was well on its way to becoming an extension of the badlands, the topsoil drying up in the dry summers and blowing away in dust storms that were slowly scouring the earth down to bedrock. The world was coming to an end, just like his crazy grandson was always saying. "'You've got to look on the bright side,' William said, in a tone of considered equanimity. "'Right,' Ben agreed. "'Where is it?' In a way, we're in the middle of it right now, as we wait in this line. What is the basic problem, after all? The basic problem is too many people. It's people, billions of people, who burn the coal and gas in forests. Too many people. The only long-term solution to the overall problem is to reduce the level of the population to what it was about a hundred years ago. A hundred million tops. Oh, God, another deep ecologist. Spare me. No, not in the political sense. No society will ever be convinced to trim its own numbers to a half or a quarter of what they are now. But Arvid's, potentially, is the ultimate Malthusian equalizer. Unless a cure is found, Dr. Michaels. That's what I meant by potentially. Does that mean you're in favor of the disease? If so, please don't ever discuss this topic in front of a TV camera. We can survive Senator Burton. We couldn't survive that. William gave a wince of annoyance. Every doctor has a kind of vested interest in disease, just as dentists thrive on tooth decay. Do you know, there are some people, including my grandson's guru, Brother Orson, who think that our vids has been custom-designed by genetic engineers for just these reasons, that the government decided ten years ago to institute its own covert population control program. 
There were people who thought the same thing about AIDS, William noted. And that actually makes more sense, since the people who would have implemented such a policy would not have been putting themselves at risk. Arvid's, on the other hand, doesn't confine itself to marginal social classes. It's as democratic as the Black Death. It would take a fanatically principled leadership to let loose an epidemic that was as liable to kill them as anyone else. No, if Arvid's was engineered, the engineer had to be someone who had it in for the human race right across the board. Someone, I suppose, like God. Which takes us right back where we started, to the book of Job. Or how I learned to stop worrying and love... Ben paused to see if William would hit the ball back. The crocodile. Exactly, Ben said. At just that moment there was a gunshot. Ben looked up in time to see the blonde girl who had been sitting in the Honda running in front of the rolls. There was a second shot that shattered the limo's windshield and the front seat window on the passenger side. The chauffeur began to moan. Ben crouched down behind the bar. There was a third shot and a fourth, and a crashing sound that made the car shake. Ben peeked up over the front seat to see what had happened. The PHA officer who had made them pull over had jumped onto the hood of the rolls to take aim at the girl who was running away. His fifth shot connected. The girl collapsed into the yellow grass beside the road. The chauffeur continued moaning. 66. Sergeant Janet Beale looked down at the limp body of the protester with a familiar rush of satisfaction and fear. Satisfaction for the obvious reason. Fear because any time you had to incapacitate someone in the line of duty, you were inviting an inquiry, and an inquiry could always go the wrong way. This guy had said he was a doctor, and he'd been riding in a limo, so he probably hadn't been bullshitting. Who but a doctor would go out of his way to become involved with someone shot down trying to escape a PHA checkpoint? It was a complex they had that made them look for trouble, and then when they found themselves in trouble, it was always the same story. I'm an M.D. You can't arrest me. I was following my Hippocratic Oath. Well, they could follow it all the way to evaluation and attention, and on to the camps, as far as Sergeant Beale was concerned. Doctors weren't any better than anyone else. They could come down with Arvids as quick as the next person, and this doctor had got blood on his hands from the girl who'd been shot, so there was every chance he'd been infected. The stupid asshole. To make matters worse, the asshole had panicked when he'd seen the chauffeur and the other passenger from his limo being driven off in a police car. He'd started yelling at Sergeant Beale and then tried to push her aside from the door of the shed, and when he wouldn't obey a simple command to desist, she had been obliged to use a chokehold. This was not the first time Sergeant Beale had faced a possible charge of using excessive force. Fortunately, there were no witnesses. The incident had taken place inside the GHA detention shed while the guy had been waiting for the results of his blood test though he must have realized that whatever the results were, he was on a greased slide to E and D, since the girl's blood was all over him, and she'd been saturated with Arvids. The guy had only himself to blame for the fix he was in, and Sergeant Beale could see no good reason why she should take any heat for what had happened. What she must do now was a simple matter of routing her problem to the farthest possible bureaucratic distance from herself, beginning with I.D., she went through his pockets and was happy to discover that William Michaels, that was the name on all his plastic, did not live on credit alone. She took five of the six crisp hundred-dollar bills, leaving the sixth for Larry, who drove the meat wagon. Then she disposed of the billfold and assorted scraps of paper and the pyrolyzer. She didn't bother taking the watch, even though it was a good one. Likewise, a ring and a fancy fountain pen. It had become more trouble than it was worth to unload that kind of junk. No matter what the experts said about how such things weren't contagious, fences were about as interested in second-hand jewelry as in old underwear. Then the paperwork. What mistake could be more natural than writing him up as M. Williams instead of W. Michaels? She printed the reversed name on a yellow and black band and fastened it to his wrist. Larry's first drop was at Como Hospital Admissions. With a yellow and black band around the guy's wrist, and without instructions to the contrary on the envelope attached to the stretcher, 
it would be a natural enough mistake to leave him at Como instead of at E&D, where there were always do-gooders, the so-called ombudsman, going around looking for trouble. At Como, he'd be processed like anyone else. In the register, however, Sergeant Beale noted that M. Williams was being sent to E&D, and she used Private Cullen's key and code number to log it in. Private Cullen having conveniently left these at her disposal when he'd panicked after killing the girl, his first such experience in the line of duty. Now, even if there was fallout from leaving the guy off at Como, it would be the driver who got blamed, not Cullen, and certainly not herself. Larry arrived with the meat wagon at half-past six. Sergeant Beale helped load the girl's black-bagged body into what had been the luggage compartment in the wagon's first incarnation as an interstate carrier. Then they hauled M. Williams, strapped to a stretcher, into the wagon and slotted him into a middle berth. Seven other berths were filled, a couple of them being obviously symptomatic cases. "'Busy day?' Sergeant Beale asked when they were back outside the wagon and had peeled off the black plastic snouts you had to wear whenever you were handling meat. So-so. There was a pickup at a school this morning. Kids are always a pisser. You can't sedate the whole lot of them, so you just got to put up with the hollering. You know, if you've got any darts left, it wouldn't be a bad idea to give this jerk another dose. He was a real hell-raiser when we pulled him over. Will do. Have a good run. After Larry had driven off with the bodies, Sergeant Beale poured herself a cup of decaf and rolled her neck around five times clockwise and then in reverse to take out the tension. Then, because the phone log was one of the first things they checked when there was an inquiry, she called the number on the card she'd taken from the breast pocket of the man's suit. She was in luck. After the fourth ring, a machine answered and said she'd reached the number she'd dialed and to leave a message at the beep. At the beep, she held the receiver up to the speaker the Muzak came out of and left the doctor's machine a minute of cheery polka music. The rest of the work was routine, cleaning up, shutting down, peeling off, and disposing of her protective under-uniform. Sergeant Beale generally followed the procedures as they were set down, since their purpose was to protect her from the possibility of contagion. She was not such a fanatic, though, that she was about to put the day's windfall of five hundred dollars into the pyrolyzers. None of the PHA guards she'd ever known were that scrupulous in following the rule book. By seven o'clock she was done, and by eight she was home with a big bucket of fried chicken and all of the extras. She dished up the chicken and potatoes and slaw, and then joined the kids in front of the TV. She let them watch their Star Trek cartoon through to the end, but then she insisted on tuning to the religion channel and watching that. Sergeant Beale wasn't particularly religious herself, but she believed religion was something kids should have, like milk. At eleven o'clock she turned in, having smoothed the way to sleep with a pint of blackberry brandy. When the children went into her bedroom the next morning, summoned by the non-stop ringing of the alarm clock, they found their mother on her back in the rumpled bed, staring at the ceiling through tears that welled up and pooled at the sides of her eyes and trickled down into her tightly braided hair. She wouldn't move, and nothing they said to her seemed to register. Later the social worker would explain to them that the reason she couldn't move was because she had had a stroke in the middle of the night. But he assured them it wasn't Arvid's, and that was a great relief since they had always expected that because of her job their mother would eventually come down with the plague and they would all be sent to the state fairgrounds and put into quarantine and die. 67. There was a child seated on the steps of medical defense systems, a boy no older than his own son's. He was playing with a radio-controlled turtle, making it emit nuts onto the sidewalk, then backing it off a little way, daring the squirrels to go after the nuts, and, when they tried, sending the turtle to attack them at its top speed. On the sidewalk the turtle was almost as fast as the squirrels, but it could only inch along through the grass, so eventually the squirrels got all the nuts the turtle produced. He was dressed in the unwary t-shirted style of only a decade ago, but the skin his clothing left exposed to the sunlight had the creamy, protected pallor of a child of the present fan de siècle, whom direct sunlight has no chance to tan. 
The boy looked up at William with eyes as black and a gaze as intent as the squirrels he was teasing. Hi there, Dr. Michaels. What are you doing up so early? William knew that he knew the boy from somewhere, but couldn't think where. The boy smiled in a mischievous way, biting the tip of his tongue. His lips and tongue were the bright, unnatural ripe cherry of red dye number two. Have you forgotten my name? William had to admit that he had. That's all right. It'll come back. He pointed the zapper at the turtle, which emitted this time not a nut, but an inch-long brown turd. Then the turtle slowly lifted its head to take in William's reaction. William smiled the kind of smile he allotted to the similar merry pranks of his sons, ostensibly indulgent, but in fact as unamused as if he'd been watching cassettes of Pee Wee's Playhouse and The Muppet Babies, cassettes that Jason and Henry had played over and over until William had memorized the timing of every pratfall, explosion, and canned laugh by heart. Children can be terrible bores, even the brightest, even his own. The only solution to the problem, as to most, was to ignore it. Let children lead their life apart in nanny land. Lisa agreed. Meanwhile, this problem refused to be ignored. The turtle grinned up at William insistently, its lipless mouth looking like some small gardening tool, a hedge clipper or pruning shears. Its neck slid out from its carapace to almost a swan-like length before William realized that this was no turtle at all but a large, black, worm-like snake. Don't you remember Rotten Core? Yes, of course. Then you're... He felt confused. When the wise men finally got to Bethlehem, what did they do? William ignored the question as being rhetorical and marveled. The other times I've seen you, you were an adult. Gods are any age they want to be. Jesus, for instance... At Christmas he's a baby. A few months later he's a dead grown-up. I think it must mean something. But the truth is, Dr. Michaels, I didn't come here to discuss hermeneutics. He tilted his head to the side and smiled the same tongue-biting smile as earlier. That's a pun. Hermes, hermeneutics, get it? William said nothing. Oh, you're not any fun. I was going to show you something, but now I don't think I will. They worshipped the Christ child. Is that what you were after? Though the boy made no reply, William realized that he was demanding to be worshipped himself. He hitched up the legs of his pants and knelt on the lowest step of the clinic's entrance. The boy held out the radio control device, except that it had become a caduceus. William put his hand on the caduceus and prayed aloud. Thou, Mercury, art my God. I place my being in thy care. Now I lay my soul in pawn. This upon thy staff I swear. As he renewed the pledge he'd first sworn so long before, Rottencore slid down from the child's shoulder, coiling round his pale bare arm and about the caduceus, to brush the back of William's hand. The snake's chill length looped once more round William's wrist, effectually handcuffing him to the child. It lifted its head to grin at him again, exposing its hypodermic-like fangs. Then, with the deft precision of the nurse who had found the same vein only minutes earlier to administer a sedative, the second within two hours, Rottencore bit into the softest part of his forearm, drawing blood with the regular suctioning peristalsis from the median cephalic vein. Not too greedy, Rottencore. We don't want him to go into shock. With his free hand, the boy stroked the pulsing body of the snake. His hand was larger than it had been only moments before, and William's correspondingly smaller. It wasn't blood that Rottencore was drawing from his veins, but the form and stature of his body. Yes, it's as I was saying, Billy. The gods are neither young nor old. And we appeal, like Disney cartoons, to children of all ages. Indeed, when we would speak with a grown-up like yourself, it's usually necessary to make some alteration in the consciousness we would address. As Jesus remarks in Matthew, chapter 18, verse 3, Unless you become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, it is written, Ezekiel, chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, 
go through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have pity. Slay utterly young and old, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. As he quoted the verses of Holy Writ, his voice took on the familiar redneck twang of Brother Orson. His mimicry captured both the man's sanctimony and his belligerence. Then the mask was dropped, and Mercury spoke in his usual smooth musical baritone. What you say, Billy? Let's enter the kingdom of heaven, shall we? Let's smite a few maids and little children. The god, who had grown to the stature of a youth in his early teens, reached forward to grasp Rottencore's head, and, not without some resistance on the part of the snake, to extract its fangs from the flesh of Billy's forearm. You're turning to marble, you see. He ran his finger along the vein from which the snake had been drawing blood. Soon you'll be stoned from the tip of your nose to your pituitary, stoned through and through, but still as human as I am. Are gods human, then? You can see for yourself that we are. Oh, the Jews objected to letting it be known how much the creators share with their creation. Indeed, the scandal goes deeper, for who did the creating, and who was created? The jury's still out on that. And the early Christians were no better. How does John end his first epistle? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. It wasn't until nearly the year 1000 before decent statuary began to appear again with any regularity. Billy looked up at the god with puzzled respect. He couldn't understand anything he was saying. What was the jury he was talking about? How had Mercury grown so big so quickly? And how had Billy become so small, a boy again, no bigger than he'd been when he was five? Mercury regarded his massive marble hands with a complacent smile. That, a simple matter of transfusion, together with the repetition, three times, of the scriptural phrase, little children, and the work was done. But come, hop on my shoulder, and I'll take you to Olympus. We don't have that long before your sedative wears off, and I've an omen to show you. Obediently, Billy let himself be lifted to the god's shoulder. Then Mercury opened the door to medical defense systems, and they went inside. The lobby clock said it was 6.04. A maintenance worker in blue coveralls was waltzing a whining polishing machine across the terracotta tiles of the floor. He didn't look up as Mercury and Billy passed before him and went inside an elevator. The elevator doors closed, and when they opened again they were on the ninth floor where the administrative director, Valerie Bright, was sitting at one of the workstations, squinting at the monitor through her large glasses and typing in short, decisive bursts. The early sunlight, slivered by the Venetian blinds, made bands of brightness on the dark silk of her jacket. The god set Billy down like a giant paperweight on the desk beside Miss Bright, who glanced up with a look of annoyance, and then resumed her work at the keyboard. Billy felt slighted. Even though he might appear to be five years old and wasn't wearing any clothes, he was nevertheless her boss. She should treat him with a bit more respect. He considered pissing on her keyboard. That would get her attention. Then he realized that the god must be playing another one of his tricks on him. He twisted his torso round. It was slow work, since he had turned to stone, and regarded Mercury with an impish smile. This isn't really happening, is it? It is, and it isn't. In fact, if you were in your office now, it would appear just as you see it. The janitor would be in the lobby, polishing the floor, this woman would be busy with the same task. But you are not really here. At the moment you are somewhere else, under sedation, and that has had the effect of bringing us into a more tender rapport. As Mercury placed a hand on his shoulder, Billy felt a sickening warmth diffuse through his body, a conviction of certain harm to come, such as a child feels when a doctor assures him that what he's about to do is not going to hurt all the while the doctor is intending to perform surgery. He cast about for some delaying tactic, a question that would fend off the knife's approach. What is she doing? he asked the god. Why is she at the office so early? Why don't you ask her yourself? Can she hear me? She can, and she can't. 
but whatever question you put to her she must answer truthfully, for she is under my compulsion, just as you are. Billy turned his eyes toward Miss Bright and asked her, What are you doing? She removed her glasses and grimaced and spun round in her office chair to look at the naked marble boy on the desk. I'm transferring funds, she told him, from MDS's unnumbered Swiss account to my own. This time I don't intend to leave the sinking ship without something to show for it. This time? I worked seven years for the McKinleys, fiddling and finagling, and when the Son of Man Foundation went down, I didn't even have pension rights. So when I started here, I made damned good and sure that wouldn't happen again. This time I've been provided for. I figure, with Dr. Frankenstein in E&D, I've got at least forty-eight hours, providing I can keep that old fart Winklemeyer out of my hair. And he's still waiting bail, and there hasn't been even a phone call yet from Frankenstein. So far so good, knock on wood. Ms. Bright looked around for anything that might be made of wood, but she was not at her own desk, and there wasn't so much as a walnut nameplate. Billy was furious. You mean to say you're stealing Dr. Michaels's money? My money? It's my money now, kiddo. Screw Dr. Michaels. Ms. Bright turned back to the monitor that connected her with her broker's office in Zurich. Billy couldn't believe what he'd heard. Miss Bright was supposed to be a born-again Christian businesswoman. She was always going to fellowship breakfasts and pinning cheerful Christian thoughts on the bulletin board. And here she was, calmly embezzling company funds. He couldn't move, he couldn't even speak. But he still could do what any other naked five-year-old marble statue could. He pissed on Miss Bright's busily typing, beautifully manicured hands, a steady stream of hot yellow urine that vanished in steam as it struck the keys of the keyboard. Miss Bright didn't even deign to look up. She'd been released from the god's compulsion, and none of this had ever happened, except in the mind of the sedated man strapped to the stretcher in the vast admissions wing of Como Hospital, the man pissing in the pants of his Giorgio Armani suit and moaning in his sleep. 68. The first thing he was aware of was the bad smell. Then he could feel a generalized pain throughout his body, an aching within and a soreness all over his skin. He wanted to return to sleep, to feel nothing, to be no one. But now there were noises, as well as smells and aches, voices and footsteps on the stairs, and then the void before him brightened as the overhead light came on, and the mattress shifted beneath him as someone sat on the bed. He braced his mind against the shock of the light as fingers peeled his eyelids back from his eyes. The brightness speared right to the middle of his brain, erasing every other sensation. Then his mother's voice said, All right, you can come in. He did not want his eyes to focus, to have the bleary shapes resolved into known forms, but the process was as much out of his own control as the opening of his eyes. And there, blazing beneath the ceiling bulb, were two faces. One that of his mother, too familiar to register as more significant than the buzzing of a fly. But the other face, the man's, was unfamiliar and somehow unsettling. Ned? Receiving no response, the stranger turned his face sideways and asked of his mother, Can he hear us? Who can say? The sounds may register, but whether our words make any sense to him, I doubt it. There's no way to tell. Jesus! His irises will dilate or contract according to the level of light in the room. All the processes that are autonomic, breathing, peristalsis, even the occasional blinking of the eyes. But they're like windshield wipers. It's not something his mind controls. He looks so young, but he must be thirty-six? Thirty-seven. After about the age of twenty-two, when I made myself stop over at feeding him, he seemed to stop aging altogether. I used to kid myself he looked like you, but really I don't suppose he looks like anyone. If you never smile or frown, your face doesn't develop an identity. The Secret of Eternal Youth The stranger picked up his hand and turned it around, palm upward, as though reading his fortune. Is he a lot of trouble? Feeding, cleaning up? It used to be, but I've got it down to a science now. It doesn't seem possible to get rid of the smell, though. 
It must have penetrated through the whole house by now. But I don't usually notice it, and Mother hasn't been able to smell anything for years. And we don't have many visitors, except for William now and then. He'll still come and spend the whole evening here with just Ned and Mother. No kidding. What's it like having a celebrity in the family? I can't think of William as a celebrity. I mean, he's not that different from other doctors in the same income bracket. They're all rolling in money, and they all think they're the center of creation, and William's no different. But I guess it still seems a little strange to be his employee. I'm sure the only reason he set up the memorial clinic was to give me my own little kingdom. He can be very generous. I'm glad to hear it. Also, to be fair, I suppose he does have a real concern for people with Comar syndrome. He lived here all these years, in the same house with Ned. It must have got to him. The buzzer sounded, and his mother went to the phone on the wall and listened, nodding and purring assurances. Mother's in a fret, she explained. I've got to go down and smooth her feathers for a moment. Would you mind staying with Ned a little while? Your mother never was that happy to see me. She's not used to having visitors in the house, especially overnight visitors. Is that an invitation? Unless you've already arranged something else. I'm a homeless person. The buzzer buzzed again. Duty calls, his mother said, but she still hesitated at the door. Lance, it really is wonderful to see you. When she had left the room, the stranger was still holding his hand. Now he began to experiment with it, lifting it, lowering it, shaking it by the wrist to make the fingers waggle. All these motions were accompanied by the familiar bone-deep pain he experienced during each day's patterning exercises. The man put his hand beneath his chin and tilted his head back to look him in the eyes. Where the man's fingers pressed against the flesh of his face, he could feel a kind of burning. The burning became more intense until it seemed his head had been put inside a furnace. And then, where the web had been weakened, it was rent. The light lanced through his eyes to pierce the long, sealed ducts of the lacrimal glands. Tears began to issue from the gland, each one a blissful remission of the pain and the burning, each exerting a further minuscule pressure on the web. The web was vast. Each bane and each blessing that had been created by the power of the caduceus was a filament in its immense architecture. But the center of the web was here in Ned Hill's inert and pain-racked body, the first to be blighted by William's curse. Here was the knot that secured the integrity of the entire fabric, and now that knot had slipped. The fabric was unraveling. 69. For a fleeting instant, as he woke, William could remember the dream, though only in a shattered form. The snake's hypodermic fang entering his arm, the polisher gliding across the lobby's floor, which seemed, even as the memory faded, as real as if he'd been there in person, and a general sense of grievance against Ms. Bright. But the gist of the dream escaped him, whatever the god might have said, whatever of warning or portent it might contain. He was staring up into the springs of a metal cot. There was a stabbing pain in his lower gut, but he could not touch the spot. His hands were strapped to his side, his feet as well. He could lift his head just enough to see the canvas restraints that bound him. But he could see nothing of the larger space beyond the narrow confines of the cot, for curtains were drawn on either side, through which a fluorescent brightness penetrated to create a diffuse institutional twilight, unchanging by night or day. Even with so little evidence he knew, from the smells and a low thrumming of respiratory ills, coughs and wheezes and moans of self-communing misery, he knew where he must be, the ward of a public hospital where those suspected of having Arvids were tested and, the great majority, dispatched to the camps. He tried to call out, but he was unable to raise his voice above a hoarse rasp. Even that effort hurt his throat. He waited, as captives must, thinking the thoughts of captivity, futile anger, impotent rage, fantasies of revenge. But he did not pray or try to strike a bargain with the forces that had betrayed him to this fate, for helpless as he found himself, he did not, in an essential way, doubt his power. Someone would come, he would explain who he was, he would submit to the blood test. 
His blood had been tested at weekly intervals, as was everyone's who worked at MDS. He'd nothing to worry about on that score. And then he would be released. What had happened was an accident, a slip on the ice. One moment one is walking along the sidewalk, the next one is on one's back, short of breath and sore, amazed but still structurally sound. The one thing that nagged at him was the pain in his lower right abdomen. His problem calling out was no puzzle. The last thing he remembered inside the little shed at the PHA checkpoint was the woman guard getting her knee in his back and wrapping her arm around his neck, forcing him to his knees. In the process, she must have hurt his larynx. But why the pain in his gut? She must have kicked him when he was on the floor, unconscious. Thinking about it, imagining the kick, triggered an anger that let him forget the pain. He promised himself he would track her down and see that she paid a suitable price for what she'd done. Something to pain her gut. Appendicitis? Yes, that was precisely where she'd kicked him. Appendicitis it would be. Appendicitis. It was the god's voice, distant and muffled, as though he stood some distance away from the cot in which William lay restrained. A kind of shimmering appeared on the curtains, veiling the ward from his view, like a TV tuned to an inert channel, a scattering of pale violet blips that did not resolve into coherent forms. You had appendicitis once, but you wouldn't remember it. You thought it only a stomachache and you had the good sense to use the caduceus at once. That was the first time you used it, in fact, after poor Ned had had his accident. I don't remember. Who remembers every cough and cold and stomachache they've ever had? The suspicion formed as beads of sweat before his mind had framed the words. Why are you telling me this? Why are you here at all? I'm wide awake. I'm not doing drugs. I've come to say goodbye while there's still an opportunity. I've become quite fond of you, William, in a peculiar way. We gods do have our vulnerabilities, though not in the same sense you mortals do. No, please, if I've done something wrong. The god's laughter pierced his flesh like a blast of winter wind through a thin cotton shirt. Wrong! Can you suppose I concern myself with right and wrong? Have I ever urged such considerations on you? Health and unhealth, life and death, these are my antinomies, and they've been yours. You mustn't think, because I'm leaving you, that you have fallen in my estimation. That has never been the way of it. When the god withdraws his aegis, then must the hero come into his own. I'm going to die, then. Had you ever supposed otherwise? All mortals die, and William Michaels is mortal. You can draw your own conclusion from that. What I hope, William, is that you will die well, not in abjection, but bravely, and with a little style. Then don't let me die here. You have my word for that. You won't die here. I mean, in quarantine, a prisoner. I wasn't quibbling. I knew what you meant and my promise is for that. You'll die just where you wish, at home, in bed. Thank you. He managed a rueful laugh. And so, farewell. The flickering faded from the curtain. It was too late to offer his own goodbye. The god had departed. Seventy. Mrs. Obstschmecker was in such a state she didn't know what to do. She was sure that having Lance Hill in the house spelled trouble. She knew it like she knew two plus two. But would her daughter listen to her? No, not a word. Madge even swore he'd done some kind of miracle for Ned, started him to crying. Mrs. Obstschmecker couldn't see anything very wonderful in that, especially since ever afterward Ned hadn't stopped crying except when he was asleep. His tears meant about as much as the water dripping from a leaky faucet. The boy's plumbing was broken. Simple as that. But Madge insisted it was a sign Ned was going to get completely better. And now there was another one of her cases at the clinic who was the same age as Ned, and he had actually started to be able to move his lips and curl his fingers. So that made Madge even more certain about Ned. She couldn't talk about anything else. 
she was upstairs all the time with that Lance Hill, from the moment she got home from work to the moment she went back to the clinic in the morning. She even had her dinners upstairs, and when Mrs. Obstschmecker dared to complain about having to eat nothing but microwave dinners, Madge just laughed and told her she had only herself to blame if she was too proud to sit down at the same table with Lance. She could hear them up there laughing and moving furniture around, and not a word about how long the man was going to go on staying with them. Officially his room was down in the basement, in the room Henry had fixed up for a playroom for the kids before Ned got sick. But he was almost never down there. He was upstairs with Madge all through the night, so far as Mrs. Obstschmecker could tell. And in the daytime he was all over the house, in and out of the kitchen, up and down the stairs, as though the house were his. It wasn't pride that made Mrs. Obstschmecker leery of sitting down to dinner with Lance Hill, or having any more to do with him than was strictly necessary. It was a concern for her health. You could tell just by looking at him that the man was sick, and if that wasn't enough, you could hear him in the bathroom throwing up into the toilet, not to mention his coughing in the morning, which he said was a smoker's cough, though he never smoked. Thank heaven for that, at least. She'd said to Madge, what if it was the plague? It was the same symptoms they warned you to look for on TV. Madge just told her to mind her own business. She wouldn't discuss it, and when, in desperation, Mrs. Obstschmecker had threatened to call the public health hotline, Madge said, You do that, and you'll have the lot of us sent to a quarantine camp. And that was probably true. The public health officials denied all the time that they put everyone who was living with someone who had the plague into the camps along with the sick person. Mrs. Obstschmecker, as a general rule, believed what the authorities told her. But in this case you had to wonder. Madge said there were two houses within just a block along Luden's that were bordered up with black and yellow striped tape that meant the P.H.A. had been there. And that was just one street. What happened to the other people living in a house, the ones who weren't sick, when it was sealed up by the P.H.A.? Alternative housing, that's what the newscasters said, and they could show pictures on TV to prove it. But still, you had to wonder. So she hadn't carried out her threat to report Lance to the public health authority, and she probably wouldn't even if the man died of the plague right here in the house. She didn't know what they'd do with the body, probably bury it in the basement or stick it into the deep freeze, if the deep freeze still worked. That's what you were always hearing other people had done. That was safer than trying to dump a dead body on an empty street, since a lot of people got caught when they tried to do that. What a world it was where you could sit at your own kitchen table drinking hot milk and eating strawberry jam on toasted raisin bread and think about things like that. Looking at the almost empty jar of strawberry jam gave Mrs. Obstschmecker a clever idea. It used to be, back in the days before Mr. Obstschmecker had died and she had been busier in the kitchen, that Mrs. Obstschmecker had made her own jam and applesauce and canned tomatoes and pickles and such, and the bulk of her home canning had been stored on shelves in the basement. There almost certainly was nothing left of those efforts but the empty jars. But Lance Hill wouldn't know that. So if he should happen to come down to the basement while she was there, which wasn't likely, since he usually slept till well past eleven, it wouldn't seem as though she'd gone down there to snoop in his room, which she was perfectly entitled to do in her own house. You couldn't even call it snooping. No, she'd gone downstairs to look for a jar of strawberry jam. The bulb at the top of the steps had burnt out. Madge was terrible about replacing bulbs. And when Mrs. Obstschmecker had got to the bottom of the steps, there wasn't even a dead bulb in the main basement overhead socket. For a moment, in her exasperation, she considered tramping all the way back up the stairs to get the flashlight. But just coming down the steps had left her a little winded. To be able to manage the steps at all at age ninety-two was remarkable enough, if you thought about it. Anyhow, there was enough light to find her way around. In the room where Lance had put his things, Mrs. Obstschmecker was astonished to discover the brass standing lamp that used to be by the chair in her own bedroom before Madge had remodeled everything, with a working three-way bulb in it. 
and here was the couch that had been up on the sun-deck till the springs busted out through the bottom, and sheets and two blankets draped over the armrest, still unfolded. Obviously Lance was sleeping upstairs, and probably right in the same bed with Madge. When Mrs. Obstschmecker had hinted at this suspicion to her daughter, Madge had shot right back by asking her if she and Lance weren't still married in the eyes of Holy Mother Church, an expression Madge used only when she was trying to be sarcastic. Even so, Mrs. Obstschmecker hadn't known what to answer. In fact, even though he'd left the States in his twenties and was now of mature years, even though he'd deserted the army— and had admitted to being a sexual deviant, and had got AIDS back in the eighties. Despite all those things, it was true. Lance was Madge's husband, and therefore entitled to sleep with her any time he liked, which Mrs. Obstschmecker had always found a hard pill to swallow when Mr. Obstschmecker had told her that was the church's teaching, and her confessor had said he was right. That is the cross, Father Vindakeva Chova had told her, that the wife must bear. Lance's one little suitcase was unlocked, but there was nothing very interesting in it, just shirts and ties and papers and underwear that hadn't been properly laundered for some time. Men's underwear was a problem never discussed on the ads on TV. She used to have to soak Mr. Obstschmecker's shorts for an hour before washing in order to get rid of the stains from where he hadn't wiped himself properly. There were more crosses wives had to bear than Father Vendikyevichova ever dreamed of. The papers didn't look that interesting, all official-looking documents. No letters, no pictures, just one old grubby paperback titled Astrology for Leos. But then, inside the breast pocket of the jacket he'd left hanging on the hook behind the door, Mrs. Obstschmecker made a discovery that justified the effort of coming down to the basement. A gun. Not a very big gun but definitely a real gun that would fire real bullets. Mrs. Obstschmecker had never had a gun in her hand before. It was an odd feeling. She almost could have wished the gun belonged to her. She almost considered taking it. But, of course, Lance would have known whom to blame. She returned it to the pocket of his suit with a cluck of disappointment. And just in the nick of time, too. For the next moment she could hear footsteps coming down the stairs, and she barely had time to step outside the room before Lance appeared, wearing the peach-colored cotton bathrobe that Madge had spent eighty-five dollars for at Dayton's. "'Well, well, Grandma O,' he said with a big smirk. "'I didn't think you could handle the stairs.' "'I don't know why not.' "'That's what you said yesterday when Madge wanted you to come up and see Ned.' "'I can handle the stairs if I make an effort.' I see. She knew what he was thinking. He was thinking she'd come down here to snoop in his room. So she played her trump. I came down here to get a fresh jar of strawberry jam. We're almost out of jam. She headed toward the farther, darker end of the basement, which meant having to go past the deep freeze. As she did, she could hear it rumbling to itself. So it did still work. But why was it on? There certainly was plenty of room in the freezer that was part of the ice-box in the kitchen. Madge wouldn't have had to bring anything down here, unless there were things in the freezer she didn't want her mother to know about. Ice cream? "'Can I help you get the jam?' he asked in a way that seemed like he was really asking something else. It dawned on her that it might have been Lance, not Madge, who'd turned on the freezer. She said, "'Yes, I'd appreciate that.' and she led him to the shelves that Mr. Obstschmecker had built so long ago. It must have been before the war. And pointed to the topmost shelf, where there were rows of dusty pint-sized mason jars. Up there, I think. Lance went and got the stepladder from beside the broken washing machine, and brought it back and climbed up to the top step. It's so dark, I can't see very well. That's why I went into the playroom and turned the light on there, Mrs. Obstschmecker declared, with a sense of having perfected her alibi. Well, I can't see any jars that aren't empty. But there's this. He came down off the stepladder and showed her a letter. What's that? Lance blew dust off the envelope and squinted. It says, for Billy. Oh, yes, 
Mrs. Obstsmecker nodded her head as though she'd just remembered something. I put that there a long time ago. Let me see. He handed her the envelope. Yes, of course, she said. She recognized the jaggedy handwriting at once as Henry's. You see, it's my handwriting. My goodness, what a long time ago I must have left that there. He looked at her skeptically, but made no direct challenge. What about the strawberry jam? Just look around. It'll be on one of those shelves. I'd better go back upstairs. She managed the steps faster going up than she had coming down. She was that eager to get to her room and open the letter. She couldn't imagine what Henry would have written in a letter to Billy, or how the letter had ended up where it was, but she was sure its contents would be interesting. Once in her room, she switched on the electronic lock that bolted the door shut. Then she took the letter into the bathroom and wiped off the dust with a Kleenex. She wiggled a fingernail under the flap of the envelope, but the glue held fast. Darn it, she fretted. But she did not give in to impatience. She'd dealt with the same situation before, and she knew that if she took the time to steam open the envelope, no one would ever be the wiser if and when she had to pass the letter along. So she hid the letter at the bottom of the lingerie drawer until such time as she would be sure to have the kitchen to herself. No sooner had she closed the dresser drawer than the telephone rang. She picked it up without waiting to hear who it was on the answering machine. As usual, it was someone asking for Madge. I'm afraid my daughter is not here now. You can probably reach her at the clinic. Is this Mrs. Obstschmecker? Yes, it is, she answered, surprised at even that degree of recognition. This is Judith Winkelmeyer. It took a moment for the name to register, and then she said, Judith Winkelmeyer, for goodness sakes, it's been years since I've heard your voice. Where are you? I'm in Minneapolis at the bus station. I didn't know you were planning a trip here. You know, I just had the nicest time with that boy of yours. He drove me out to visit Mr. Obstschmecker at Veteran Cemetery, and to Mass beforehand, and all the way there I kept thinking how much he looked like my husband. I don't believe you ever met Mr. Obstschmecker. He would have been before your time. You wouldn't know where I could find William, would you? Well, if he's not at home, I suppose he must be at work. I've tried phoning both places, and I simply don't get an answer. I don't want to take a taxi all the way out to Willowville if there's no one there. Of course not. So I called you on the chance that William or Judge or Lisa might have stopped by. No, but you wouldn't believe who is here, Lance Hill. Who? Madge's first husband. Ned's father. He used to be called Lance, but now he says he's Launce because he's been living in Canada such a long time. And now he's living in our basement. Isn't that something? Do you have a number where I could call Madge? Mrs. Obstschmecker read off the number, which was written on a piece of adhesive tape, taped to the phone. Judith thanked her and hung up. She hadn't paid attention to a single word Mrs. Obstschmecker had said. She hadn't even asked a polite, how are you? Where did young people learn their manners? 71. Since the last time she'd come here in 93, when she'd brought John, at age 11 he wasn't judge, to visit William and his grandfather, downtown Minneapolis had become a nightmare. But that was true of almost any downtown area nowadays. First the recession, and then the plague, and Hennepin Avenue was as dead as Nineveh. There were no shoppers and little to shop for. Except for the bus depot and a Salvation Army thrift shop, the street-level stores were either boarded up or gaped at the desolated streets through broken windows. One such shop, the Shoe Tree, with a sign in its single intact window saying, Last Days, Big Bargains, had become a kind of dovecote, all full of coos and flutterings when Judith stopped in the doorway to admire the effect. In its own way, it was as romantic as a ruined chapel. A few blocks east of Hennepin, there still were functioning office buildings and a few restaurants and shops that connected to them along the second-story skywalks, 
but even here the city gave the impression of a genuine ghost town, at least at street level and at 11 a.m. In an odd way, Judith felt personally responsible for what she saw, for it hadn't been that long ago that she'd been a believer in deep ecology and in the absolute necessity of trimming the human race back to a sustainable pre-industrial era size before people simply poisoned the planet with their waste products. All the pollutants and gases and radioactive sludge that were laying the foundations for an otherwise unavoidable ecological catastrophe. In a sense, these desolated streets were what she had been wishing for, since you couldn't reduce the size of the human race so drastically without dooming a lot of prime real estate to abandonment, and, more to the point, sentencing millions of people to death. In her deep ecology days, she'd never worried much about the means that would be required to put man and nature back in the right proportions, probably because she hadn't believed it would ever happen. Now it was happening all around her. The figures on Arvids were appalling, and there didn't seem to be any upward limit to the harm it might still do. In some areas, nearly ten percent of the population had been killed, and there was no end in sight. During the Black Death of 1350, half the population of Europe died. According to some authorities, three quarters. For years that plague had raged, and then, for no known reason, it had stopped. It was not a comforting precedent. She turned left on 5th toward the Nicolette Mall, where there were still a few pedestrians and almost as many PHA officers. One of the officers headed toward Judith the moment he spotted her and asked to see her green card. She'd had three different blood tests on the bus trip up from Florida, all duly noted on her card, but even so the PHA officer acted as though she were an illegal immigrant caught trying to cross the Rio Grande. Despite the fact that Arvids seemed to be distributed uniformly through the country, strangers were treated everywhere with suspicion and hostility. The problem was that in a city of any size, everyone is a stranger to all but a small circle of neighbors and co-workers, so everyone in the big cities went around feeling suspicious of everyone else. Dayton's, for a wonder, was still open for business, and opposite Dayton's, in the middle of the mall, was an unattended canvas-roofed kiosk with a sign that said, The Chamber of Commerce welcomes you to Minneapolis. Free maps and information. An arrow pointed to the maps that weren't there. All along the mall, the Muzak was playing an all-string version of a Beach Boys song. Next to the information kiosk was a sprint booth, and it occurred to Judith that Lisa or William might have left a message with her housemates in Florida explaining the situation. Everyone in the Twin Cities seemed to have disappeared. She had called William at home and only got an answering machine. She tried to reach John on his private line, but no one answered. At MDS, there was a recorded message saying that the central switchboard was being reprogrammed, and anyone calling MDS should wait until Friday to call back. She tried calling her father at home and got another answering machine. She'd called Madge and got her mother and when she'd tried to reach Madge at the clinic, she got a please-call-back-later receptionist. She entered the booth, took her receiver from her purse. There was no such thing anymore as a public telephone, only cable access. Plugged it in and punched in her ID number, and then 111, which put her through automatically to her own number in Florida. Greel answered and said yes, there had been a message from her father, who'd called from a PHA detention center in a state of outrage. Apparently both he and William had been arrested at a highway checkpoint, and he couldn't be released until someone came to where he was being held and vouched for his being who his ID said he was. He'd waited a whole day for one of the directors from MDS to come and sign him out, but the woman had apparently vanished from the earth. There was more but he hadn't been able to tell Greel the whole story because the PHA had only let him talk for two minutes. Judith dialed the number of the detention center at once and spent fifteen minutes confirming the fact that Ben Winklemeyer was indeed still there. For more information, she would have to come to the detention center in person. Which she did. The taxi ride cost her a mind-boggling forty dollars paid in advance, and even at that rate the driver refused to wait outside. He was probably right in predicting that it would take at least a couple of hours to process all the red tape it would take 
to get Ben checked out. The detention center had been a Holiday Inn in an earlier incarnation, and the only indication that it was so no longer was a high wraparound cyclone fence topped with razor wire and the letters on the marquee identifying it as Minnesota State Police Health Investigation, Unit 17. The policewoman at the reception desk was much more human than the people she'd had to deal with on the phone. She only had to show her green card and answer three questions on an ID check, and she was shown to the room where Ben had been put. Her armed escort could not have been much older than fifteen, and full of the special kind of self-importance that comes to those who exercise authority at a precocious age. When the young guard unlocked and opened the door, a mingled stench of Lysol and vomit whooshed forth. Ben was standing up, his back to the wall, looking like he was waiting to be shot. His face seemed finally to have caught up with his true chronological age, after all these years of looking perpetually, pudgily fifty. He was an old man now. Judith, he said, thank heaven. She kissed him on both cheeks. Are you okay? she whispered. His smile was almost recognizable. I think I'll have to take the Fifth Amendment on that. What happened? Is William here with you? I don't know any more than what I learned from Greel. It's a long story. Maybe we should wait till we've got our exit visas. As to William, I've no idea where he is. He was still at the checkpoint getting a blood test when they took me here. I've tried calling him at home. No one answers. I've tried to talk to someone at the checkpoint, but it's like arranging an audience with the Pope. And the MDS switchboard isn't working. Ben looked grim, I know, and I think I know why, but that's something else we'd better save till later. Later was not long in coming. Ben's own BMW had already been retrieved from its garage and was waiting, with the keys in the ignition, by the time the paperwork was completed. Off her own bat, just to be helpful, the policewoman at the reception desk made a determined effort to learn from the PHA what had become of William. The PHA people swore that no one by the name of Michaels had been dispatched to detention and evaluation or to any local hospital. They were able to provide the name of the officer who'd been in charge of the checkpoint on Monday afternoon, Sergeant Janet Beale, but she had failed to report to work since that time. Presumably, William had been released after his blood test showed he was clean. Otherwise, the PHA people insisted, there would be something in the records at the checkpoint. As, for instance, there was for Ben and the chauffeur and even the limo. You'll probably find him at home, the policewoman suggested with an unconvincing smile. Many people become very upset when they're stopped at a checkpoint, and with the window of his car shot out, well, who could blame him if he's not feeling all that sociable? There's days I don't pick up the phone for a lot less reason than he's got. You're probably right, Ben agreed. He'd have agreed to anything at that point. He was so anxious to get away. And then they were out on the expressway and moving at what seemed to Judith a criminal speed. Father, she shouted, bracing her feet against the floorboard. Watch out for that van. Ben neither slowed down nor speeded up, and the van that had tried to pull in front of the BMW swerved back to its position in the slower-moving right lane. I'm sorry, Judith said. I'm just not used to being in a car. In Florida, I ride the bus or I walk. Mostly I walk. You left your luggage at the Greyhound station? Ben asked as they neared the downtown exit. Yes, but there's no need to pick it up now. Getting home is the first priority. My first priority is finding out what's become of William. Do you mind if we detour by his place first? As you like, though my concern is more for John than William. If John's found some way to remove his parole band so he could leave town without triggering any alarms... That's not too likely, and you'd better remember to call him Judge. He's sensitive about that. Judge, yes, of course, I'll remember. But with so little time left before he turns eighteen, a couple weeks, it would be so foolish to violate parole. Ten to one, the reason he wasn't answering the phone is that he was communing with Brother Orson. Was his answering machine on? All it said was leave your message at the beep. He's probably just avoiding you. He's at the age when he prefers to be left alone. He was always at that age, Father. Always. Ben chuckled, but said nothing. He didn't have to. 
Judith knew he was thinking, like mother, like son, and it wasn't really fair. As a girl and a teenager, she'd been prickly in many ways, but never systematically hostile. She hadn't seen her father and Sandra as the enemy. Her mother, off in Florida, that was another matter. She had been the enemy, until in the last few years Alzheimer's disease had made her a mere object of pity. Judith sighed, realizing just how much she did have in common with John. With Judge, she corrected herself. She must remember to think of him by that ridiculous name. As they came in sight of the exit to Willowville, she finally broke the ice and said, If you'd rather not tell me about what happened. It was all the cue Ben needed, and the story was not long in telling, how they'd been pulled over at the checkpoint, the stray bullet, the shattered windshield, how William had insisted on leaving the limo to look at the girl who'd been shot by the PHA officer, and how they'd been separated, Ben and the chauffeur being hauled off to the detention center, while William was still inside the little shed where they did the blood testing. The worst of it was afterward, when I was waiting for Miss Bright, and she didn't show. I got so fraught. It was getting to be 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and I was locked in that nasty little room. You smelled what it was like, and I could feel my heart fluttering. That's not the word, but I don't know how else to describe it. I felt like I'd been sent back to Stillwater, except the quarantine camps would be even worse than that. Finally, I bribed that kid who let you into the room to get me some seconds, and I was able to sleep. I slept till noon, and then I had to wait hours to use the phone. And when I couldn't get through to anyone, I really started to panic. I'm still panicking. You sound as rational as ever, Judith reassured him. I know. There's a part of me that just wants Ben Winklemeyer to continue on a business-as-usual basis. And then there's the other part of me that's in charge of my basal metabolism and not my thought processes. And that part of me is still going bong, bong. Remember that smoke alarm that went off every time you started to fry a lamb chop? That's what I feel like right now. Inside me that alarm is screaming, lamb chops, lamb chops. Judith laughed aloud. Oh, God, I'd forgotten that alarm and it only ever went off for lamb chops, nothing else. The house could have burned down. It would be mute. But just try and fry a lamb chop. She leaned sideways as far as her seat belt allowed and was able, by stretching her neck, to plant a kiss on Ben's cheek. My goodness, he said, switching effortlessly to a tone of mellow reminiscence. How long has it been? It's good to see you. You've got so big. My bottom, I know, if my thirteen-year-old anorexic self could see me now. But a big ass is actually supposed to be a good thing, especially for women, as against a big gut. It means you're less at risk for some dread disease or other. Father, isn't that motorcycle going to— No, I'm sorry, highways simply do this to me. When the motorcycle had weaved on ahead through the traffic, far enough so she could take her eyes off it, she asked, How is Judge? Bizarre. I like the boy, mind you. He's actually more interesting for being so peculiar. Though it's hard at times to think of him as my own lineal descendant. One of the women who lives with us, Greel, the one you talked with on the phone, she swears there's a real person behind Brother Orson's cartoon face. She says she's met people who've talked to him in the flesh. But that's not what the news is saying, is it? Greel has also met people who claim to have been taken up in flying saucers. Do you think there's an actual Brother Orson? Ben hooted. You might as well ask me, do I believe in Santa Claus? Yes, Virginia, of course I do. You and William. There was an awkward pause between them. Judith had never openly acknowledged to Ben, to anyone for that matter, that William was her son's natural father. Yet she knew that Ben had long ago figured it out for himself, and they'd come to an unspoken understanding on the subject, just as they had about her being a lesbian. So there was no need now to spell out what she'd meant by her unconsidered, you and William. 
William's steadfast faith in Santa at the age of six, and Judge's dauntless faith in Brother Orson, now seem to have issued from the same stubborn root, from some genetic disposition to belief in its purest form. Yet she couldn't reconcile herself to the boy's invincible wrong-headedness. "'Does he know what's been happening in the news?' she demanded of Ben. "'Has he watched the coverage of the trial in Florida? Has he heard the witnesses?' It's not their enemies now who are saying Orson is a fabrication. It's the people who've been running the organization for years. Remember how long some people went on believing in Nixon, in Reagan, in Guru Ma? The worse the charges, the tighter the noose, the more a loyalist can pride himself on his loyalty. But eventually? I agree, eventually Judge will be disillusioned if he isn't already. He's not as willing to get into an argument on the subject as he would have been a year ago, even six months. Maybe he's stopped believing, but is just too proud to admit he lived such a long time in fantasy land. What does William make of it all? He takes it in stride, pretty much, refuses to argue about it with Judge. I think he may even admire his stubbornness, the chip-off-the-old-block effect. So there it was, out in the open after all these years, the truth she had no wish to discuss. If there's a gene for stubbornness, she said, he might as easily have gotten it from me, don't you suppose? Ben glanced sideways with an amused smile. Oh, I'll grant you that. It doesn't seem ever to have upset you, the thought or the suspicion. She could not even now say it in so many words. I think it might have, if I'd figured it out soon enough, that is, before Judge was born. But I was in prison then, and prison was like a toothache. You can't think of anything else. You must have gone through hell, though. I worried, and I prayed a lot. And then your prayers were answered. In the sense that he didn't have Bradley Chambers syndrome, yes. But you knew that was a possibility. Judith nodded. And you never considered getting an abortion? Of course not. Ben shook his head. You are, he marveled, an amazing offspring. Ben fell silent after that, and Judith slouched back against the leather seat cushion, relieved to be let off the hook, and turned her attention to the scenes of Willowville unscrolling through the windows of the car. At least half the lawns were enclosed by metal fences of the kind erected around the detention center, as though a man's home these days were not so much his castle as his dungeon. The lawns were still well kept up, and you could see sprinklers operating, a luxury that Florida had had to restrict years ago. Otherwise, it was the Willowville she remembered. Even the fact that the only people you could see were people in cars had been true in the Willowville of yore. While they were still a long way from William's neighborhood at the northern edge of Willowville, Ben slowed the car to a crawl and pulled over to the side of the street. They coasted to a stop beside a red, white, and blue mailbox. Father, she asked, are you all right? He smiled the way he did when he was getting ready to deliver a zinger, but then he didn't deliver it. Could you help me release the... His fingers fumbled at the safety belt release. She helped him out of his safety belt, then loosened his tie. It started to go dark there for a while, he explained without her asking. Would you like me to go telephone for help? she asked. He shook his head. Just give me a minute or so. A hospital sends out an ambulance these days. There's always someone from PHA with them. This time we'd both end up in detention. Or worse. I'd ask you to drive us but I really don't think I could get up and out of the car and over to your side. These damned bucket seats. I can't just slide over. I think the best thing right now is a little nap. He laid his head back awkwardly on the seat's headrest and closed his eyes. Judith held his right hand and watched his life quietly ebb away, like the sun sinking through the limbs of trees at a far horizon. It was the kind of death you pray for, a divine Mickey Finn, no pain, no warning, just the simplest closing of the door. She envied him and felt blessed. 
72. At the moment of Ben Winklemeyer's death, a shudder passed through the web. Those filaments nearest the center, already under the strain imposed by the earlier snapping of its first woven thread, registered the effect most forcibly. The elms along Calumet Avenue and in Brosner Park, on which Billy Michaels had so long ago exercised the power of the caduceus, felt a sudden sickening incapability at their phloem soft core. And all through the night that followed, as the affected sap spread through their limbs and leaves, the elms succumbed to the deaths deferred by the caduceus's potency. By morning their yellow leaves littered the streets and lawns. There was a tingling in the scalp of Mrs. Obstschmecker as dark, wiry hairs formed within the follicles that had lain fallow so many years, and as she slept the old woman's right hand crept out from its cocoon of bedclothes to scratch at her bristly scalp. In his bedroom upstairs, Ned do a more painful quickening as his tongue, so long inert, pressed against the roof of his mouth, hungry not for food, for he heeded the operation of his digestive tract no more than the beating of his heart, hungry rather for speech. His jaw clenched. The left zygomatic muscles tensed, tugging at the flesh of his upper lip. Then the muscles all went slack, like a weightlifter's arms, as he collapses onto the bench after his utmost exertion. In the next room his mother slept, and she too dreamed, her tongue pressed against her soft palate, remembering a thirst it had not known for many years, craving a single drop of chilled wine, a sip of orange juice laced with vodka, a long cold draught of beer, booze in whatever form, barrels of it. Nothing less could fill the void that years of abstinence had hollowed out in her. She woke and went downstairs to the kitchen and filled a tumbler with diet cola, and then, barefoot, she went into the back yard, where the lawn chairs had been left spread out, and sat and marveled at the yellow leaves drifting down through the windless June air. Many blocks away on Luckner Boulevard, in bed 38 of the Henry Michaels Memorial Clinic, Robert Corning stared at his fingers with fascination as they clenched and relaxed, clenched and relaxed in complete obedience to the dictates of his will. Robert had felt the shudder that had passed through the web more keenly than anyone. When Ben Winklemeyer had died, he'd felt a jolt of adrenal panic as though, an infant again, he'd heard his mother cry out to him, Bubby, Bubby, be careful. And in the 4-H pavilion of the former state fairgrounds, William Michaels palpated the rigid area of his abdomen. There was direct tenderness, but it was not acute, and, fortunately, no rebound tenderness. Another diagnostic test for suspected appendicitis involved the patient lying on his left side and stretching the psoas muscle, but that was not a maneuver William could attempt by himself. A voice from the darkness whispered, You up there in the top bunk, what time is it? When he felt a prodding through the thin mattress of the bunk, he realized that the question was directed at him. I don't know, he replied. I have no watch. It was stolen. There's a clock over the main door. If you sit up, you can see it. The effort of bending forward at the waist produced a flash of exquisite pain. He drew a sharp breath and gripped the rough edge of the wooden partition reflexively. A splinter pierced the side of his thumb. As though he'd opened the door of a furnace, he felt the heat of his anger suffuse his whole body. While that door remained open, he could not focus his mind on any particulars. There was only raw white rage blotting out everything else. Each new annoyance, each least reminder of his helplessness and pain, triggered another blast of wrath. It had been just the same when they'd made him strip off his soiled clothes that afternoon in the tent erected just inside the fairground entrance. The PHA workers behind their plexiglass partitions had paid no heed to any protests from the arriving detainees. They went through the motions of accepting, tagging, and boxing the old clothes and issuing the white cotton hospital uniforms with a maddening bland indifference to the distress of the people filing by. They did their work like cashiers at a supermarket, and most of the detainees being processed seemed to accept the situation with an unquestioning sheep-like docility. No doubt they had known they had Arvids for some time and had foreseen being sent into quarantine. When William had protested and tried to bring his case to the attention of someone qualified to deal with it, he had been treated with routine brutality. 
as though he were just another overwrought and potentially dangerous detainee who required the simple remedy the PHA guards were always equipped to dispense, sedation. He had only the foggiest of memories of being forcibly undressed and wrestled into these concentration camp pajamas, ill-fitting and stiff with starch. Later, here in the 4-H pavilion, someone had told him that most of the PHA personnel inside the camp spoke little or no English, so complaining was useless. Illegal aliens were given a choice between deportation and working in the quarantine camps. Most chose deportation. Hey, asshole! What the fuck time is it? William scanned the shadowy geometries of the pavilion, the sloping roof and bare rafters, the labyrinthine zigzags of the wooden partitions, all lit by one distant forty-watt bulb. He could see no clock, so he said it was 425, which seemed to content the man in the bunk below him. At ten the guards would unlock the main door and issue meal chits. Then those who hadn't been detailed to clean up would have the liberty of most parts of the camp. Yesterday, still woozy from the sedative, he'd waited hours in order to use one of the reversed-charge telephones in Pioneer Hall. Staring at the plaques of mounted wall-eyes on the dark log walls, probing with his fingertips at the tender spot on his abdomen. Each person was allowed to make one call, and if there was no answer or the charge was refused, you had to go to the back of the line and start the long wait all over. He'd made three calls, to Lisa, which got answered by the answering machine, to his private line at MDS, which no one picked up, and finally, unable to remember Ms. Bright's private number, to the general MDS number, where the operator refused to accept the twenty-five-cent charge. At that point Pioneer Hall closed down, and William had had to return to the dormitory in the 4-H pavilion before the seven o'clock curfew went into effect. He could not believe that he'd been reduced to such a zero, that with all the power he knew he had, he could not do such a simple thing as to secure his own release from the hell into which he'd stumbled. This entire system was in a sense his own creation, so any rage he might feel was, in the same sense, his just desert but that made no difference. There was nothing he cared about now but saving his own skin, and he didn't know how. 73. According to the clock on the tower of the hanging Gardens Town Hall, it was 4.25, but Judge wasn't sure the clock was accurate or even functional. Since arriving in Wyoming, he'd learned that you couldn't necessarily trust appearances or believe what people told you. At the inn where he was staying, for instance, there had been a big vase of roses in the lobby, but when he'd typed out the command, Sniff Roses, they smelled like rotting meat. Judge had always been a little suspicious of flowers, so he wasn't surprised. But there were probably lots of things here in Wyoming just as false and deceitful that he accepted at face value. As Brother Orson never ceased to point out, the mouth of the wicked man is full of deceit and fraud. He lurks in the alleys of the villages, and in the secret places he murders the innocent. So Judge knew he had to watch his step, or he would end up like one of the bodies hanging from the trees in the gardens of Hanging Gardens, some of which were still alive and writhing in pain, though most were dead and rotting. Sometimes it was the simplest things that could trip you up. You'd forget to eat for a few hours, and then faint from hunger. You'd go too long without sleep and become groggy and careless and not just in game time, but in real time. Wyoming was like one of those drugs they lectured about in phys ed classes, the kind like crack that just takes over your whole life and you forget everything else. Now, forty-eight hours after he'd hacked his way into the program, he'd found the disk in a locked file of backups in the top drawer of William's desk. The edge between game time and real time had become so blurry that he had to set the laptop's internal timer to buzz at four-hour intervals, so he would remember to visit the bathroom and go down to the kitchen and nuke a pizza or a can of soup. He'd also taken a couple of long naps on the couch here in his father's study, but when he did, he left the game on the screen out of fear that a save command might be booby-trapped and that he'd have to start from square one the next time he booted up the disk.
Wyoming was a scary place, a country with more cemeteries than cities, and even those cities mostly deserted or else inhabited by demons and witches and other minions of evil. Dead people did most of the work, though you couldn't tell they were dead just by looking at them. You needed a special kind of glasses available only here in hanging gardens. He'd learned this from a talking raven called Karn, who told him that once he had the spectacles of true vision, Judge would understand the secret meaning of everything around him. And what was around him was William Michael's soul enchanted into a landscape. Exploring the simulated environs of Wyomia was better than being able to read his father's diary. It was like walking around inside his dreams. But to know the meaning of those dreams he needed the glasses. And there, around the corner from the town hall, on a street of sleazy shops, was an optometrist's office with a pair of gigantic spectacles hanging over the door as a shop sign. On the door was a brass plate with the optometrist's name, Dr. Nudista. Judge knocked. The door swung open. He entered. Hello, said Dr. Nudista. How can I help you? He was a short, bald old man, with skin the color of white candle wax, and lips as red as strawberry jam. Asked for spectacles of true vision, Judge typed. Do you want wire frames or plastic frames? How much are those, he asked, using the mouse to point to a pair of glasses displayed on a severed head on the counter. When the optometrist turned round to see which glasses he'd pointed to, Judge took a straight-edge razor from the satchel he had been carrying all about Wyomia. It was filled with a jumble of medical paraphernalia he'd acquired in playing the game. Knives, scalpels, forceps, tweezers, rope, glue, blowtorches, antibiotics, and placebos. Kill Dr. Nudista, he typed. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Dr. Nudista said, without turning around. Kill me and you'll never know what any of this means. That's what my name is a pun on. Didn't you notice that? Herman Nudista. You're a nudist. Is that what you mean? Only when I take my clothes off. Here. He handed Judge the glasses the head had been modeling and held up a mirror. See how you look in these. Judge stared at the mirror in dismay. He'd become a demon with short pointy horns and his whole face the dull scaly red of an old tattoo. He lifted the glasses up from the bridge of his nose and saw his usual face in the mirror, but when he lowered them he became a red devil again. But what was more dismaying, when he looked away from the mirror the old optometrist's face had changed into Brother Orson's, and he had horns like judges, and his skin was red, and he'd taken off all his clothes. I wondered when you'd recognize me, Brother Orson said with a chuckle. How can you be here, in Wyomia? Why not in Wyomia? Do you suppose your father owns the entire country? No, it's yours as much as his. Don't you remember when you were just a toddler in little bib overalls with smurfs on them? William would come down to Florida for long visits in the summer and on spring breaks, and he'd have his computer with him, and instead of telling you bedtime stories, you'd see them on the computer screen. That's when you first got to know Wyomia. That's why it all seems so familiar now. You've been here before many times. And you were here too? In one form or another, yes. Don't you remember? I remember an apple that was lying in the grass. Like this one? Brother Orson held up a perfect picture-book apple of uniform, unmottled red. It was a poison apple, and you sliced it in two with your fingernail. Brother Orson touched the skin of the apple with a taloned finger, and it split open to expose rotted pulp teeming with black specks. See the legion serving Herman, he hissed. See a million microscopic vermin. Judge squinted at the specks in the apple and saw that they were an army of infinitesimally small, infinitely evil insects. What we have here is a mutant gene, Brother Orson explained, or rather recited, for his explanation took the form of rhyming verse. So small it slips through every screen, stained by it, your vital juice ripens to illness, pain, 
a noose, a varied, slowly strangling ills, a plague that almost always kills. All this is bound within my curse till I have thrown it in reverse. At first, Judge did not pay much attention to Brother Orson's words from an ingrained suspicion of anything that sounded like poetry. Poetry was a form of secular humanist propaganda that he'd been force-fed at school and more hateful than other forms because of the way it would stick in your head like the ads on TV. But then it dawned on Judge what the words were about. That sounds like Arvid's, he said to Brother Orson. Indeed and these little critters are its seedlings. The insects made a shrilling sound as though agreeing. Vermin is not quite accurate. Properly speaking, these are mycoplasmas, the smallest, simplest free-living organisms. Uh-huh, Judge said. His aversion to scientific gobbledygook was more pronounced than his aversion to poetry. One of the things he liked about Brother Orson was that he never made you feel like you were in school being lectured at. Until now. You are not interested? Brother Orson asked, reading his mind. I'm just not that good at science. But aren't you curious to know the secrets of your father's success? I suppose, but I don't see what that's got to do with these microplastics. A long time ago, when the white man was taking charge of America, he found that he could kill many more Red Indians by giving them blankets than by shooting them, if the blankets were infected with smallpox germs, for which Red Indians had no natural immunity. Whole nations were exterminated. Uh-huh, said Judge, who hated history probably more than any other required subject. History teachers were always trying to make you feel guilty about something, slavery or women not being able to vote or giving smallpox to Indians. And then again it dawned on him what Brother Orson was getting at. You mean William did something like that with Arvids? No one has ever understood the etiology of infections associated with mycoplasma incognitus. It can affect many tissues. It cannot be isolated in blood samples. The test for Arvids is rather for the byproducts of the infection in its terminal stages. Now he was sounding like a public health authority lecturer at school assembly when everyone in the auditorium has to recite what the letters in Arvids stand for. Acute Random Vector Immune Disorder Syndrome like the words were supposed to be some kind of charm to keep you from coming down with it. Whereas Judge knew Arvid's was God's judgment on sin, pure and simple, the sword in his right hand. There are weapons more powerful than the sword. Judge glanced over his shoulder uneasily at the fire irons, standing sentinel beside the fireplace. I guess you mean the pen, he said evasively. No, not the pen, not the poker either, the caduceus. Do you know what that is? Sure, it's that twisty thing over the doorway at MDS. Your father has a caduceus. Uh-huh. All that he's achieved as a doctor has been through its power. It was by using the caduceus that he created Arvid's. It has also been the source of your own unmerited good health and all your families. Your brothers, your mother, old Mrs. Obstschmecker whomever your father has chosen to benefit. How come I've never seen it? He keeps it secret, wouldn't you? You mean hidden away. Hidden from most eyes, but with the spectacles of true vision. A buzzer rang. Excuse me a moment, Brother Orson said, and disappeared through the back door of the shop. As soon as he was gone, Judge realized that the head on the counter was Lisa's. There was still blood oozing through her hair where he'd struck her with the pointed hook of the poker. Lisa regarded him balefully. I always did think you were a nasty little shit. Yeah, well, I never liked you much either. The buzzer rang again. It isn't the phone this time, you know, said Lisa's severed head. It's someone at the door, you born-again redneck moron. Uh-huh, said Judge 
still without quite taking in what she was saying, since he'd turned his attention to the actual corpse on the leather sofa off to the side of the fireplace. He realized that sooner or later he was going to have to deal with the problem it represented. At some point, corpses started to smell and get maggoty. He'd also have to clean up the blood, though he wasn't sure there was any way to get the stains out of the carpet. He'd better start now, he decided. Reluctantly, he typed, save, and the image of the severed head on the counter of Dr. Nudista's shop shrank down to a white dot and disappeared, which was just what he wished would happen to the body on the couch. But Lisa's dead body was here in real time, and so was the person downstairs at the front door who would not stop ringing the bell. 74. Judith had very nearly despaired of anyone's hearing the bell and was considering simply walking away from her problems, leaving the body in the car and returning to the bus depot and taking the bus back to Florida. But finally, after what must have been ten minutes of ringing, Judge came to the door. "'Oh, it's you,' he said, peering out suspiciously through the one-inch crack allowed by the door chain. "'I was wondering when you'd get here.' I've been ringing the doorbell for ten minutes. Sorry, I had earphones on. Just a minute. He closed the door, took off the chain, and opened it only a little wider, still barring entry. Even with everything else she had to feel distressed about, the first sight of him was a shock. His had become one of those faces that attract the morbider sort of photographer, a face that registers at a glance as demented or, at the very least, disturbed and then on the heels of that distress, guilt, the guilt of knowing she must be responsible in some way for what she saw. This was her son. Her words, her cooking, her shifting moods and abiding presence had been the dye that had formed his character and modeled his face. Even the name he'd taken for himself, Judge, seemed to point the same moral. Every child is time's truest judgment on its parents, but even as a child, Judge had seemed to gloat at the judgment he represented. And she had always refused to believe that he was just what she deserved. You all right? Why is Ben sitting there in the car by himself? Because he's dead. He died while we were driving here. No shit. There was something almost Buddhist in his lack of effect, something one might rather envy than pity but then she was not evidencing much overt feeling herself. Nothing settles the nerves and staunches hurt like the need to cope. She'd had to drive the length and breadth of Willowville with Ben still strapped in the driver's seat, her puppet. She'd stopped at every traffic light and stop sign. Her foot could barely reach the brake, scanning the cross streets at every corner with no idea of which way to turn to reach William's house. Always in the past, she'd been a passive visitor, letting her hosts do the driving. Certain any time Ben's head dropped forward to his chest that a passerby would notice and phone the public health authority. She would pull his head back by a lock of hair and continue steering with her right hand, and no one had noticed anything, because there were no passers-by except the other drivers on the street. He died in the driver's seat? Then how'd you get here? I'm sorry, I can't explain all that now. Is William in the house? No, I'm here by myself. Lisa sent the kids and their nanny on the airplane to see her folks in the east. Then she followed on a later flight. But I don't know where William's gone to. He hasn't been home for a few days now. Sometimes he stays at MDS or else at Madge's place in St. Paul. So I wasn't worried. Judge had that shifty look he always got when he was lying, but Judith knew better than to confront him head on. What you figuring to do with... Judge nodded discreetly in the direction of Ben's corpse. Ain't we supposed to call the public health number any time someone dies? Ben was just released from a PHA detention center. It's quite likely we'd both be put in quarantine if we went by the rules and reported his death. So what I suggest is that you open the garage door and I drive the car in there. After that, William will know the best course to take, once he gets home. Do you have any idea where he might be? Not if he ain't where I said first, MDS or Madge's. When was the last time he was actually home? Monday night was when he didn't get home to dinner. Since then. Had Lisa set off? 
next day. You've been here by yourself since then. Where am I going to go with this damn thing on my ankle? He tugged at the cloth of his jeans, lifting the frayed cuff high enough to reveal the bulge of the parole band beneath his stocking. Anyhow, I'm not alone. I can talk to Brother Orson any time I need to, and God is always right beside me. He is my buckler and the horn of my salvation. She almost laughed out loud, not so much at his absurdity as at her own in having come all this way in the hope of having some effect on him. In just this little time she knew, she remembered, that there was nothing she could say that he would hear. Knowing that was oddly liberating. Something funny? he asked, with his usual alertness to being looked at askance. The situation. Our standing about like this chatting while a corpse is waiting to be disposed of. It's a little macabre, wouldn't you say? Uh-huh. Well, I'll get the garage open. You can handle the car? That's what I've been doing most of the afternoon. She got back into the car and did the maneuvering needed to ease the car into the center space of the garage, next to Lisa's Volvo. Judith turned off the ignition as the garage door rumbled closed. She repositioned her father's head against the headrest and tried, without exerting much pressure, to make his eyelids close. Here, Judge said, reaching in through the open window of the car. Let me do that. She looked away, and when she looked back, Ben seemed at rest. You want to leave him in here? Judge asked. Or what? I think so, for now. Judith followed Judge along a hallway hung with Lisa's bright, innocuous watercolors and prints, floral close-ups and rudimentary landscapes that wanted to be Matisse's but wound up looking like greeting cards and record sleeves for easy listening music. Judith was glad that Lisa had spared them the effort of trying to be civil to each other by her early departure. When they entered the dining room, the smell that had been only a faint sickliness in the hallway became an outright stench. Goodness, what in the world? I guess I should have thrown out all these flowers. There were vases of dead and dying roses anywhere there was a level surface to put them, whole bushes torn from their beds and sagging despondently in the room's curtained twilight. The carpet was strewn with petals. It's the roses that smell so bad, Judith marveled. When there's a whole lot of them like this, it can smell pretty bad. It smells more like something that's gone bad in the refrigerator. You can go check the icebox if you want. Thing is, a smell builds up gradual, and you don't notice if you're always there where the smell is. People visiting at Stark used to complain about how we all smelled, but we couldn't smell it. Didn't you have a suitcase? I left it at the station. I thought it might be at your hotel. I'm not staying at a hotel, John, she said firmly. I'm staying here. He scowled. Lisa didn't say anything about that to me. I suppose she took it for granted. And don't call me John. In the baptism of the gospel, my name is Judge. I know, she said. One of the last things your grandfather talked about was to remind me you were touchy about your name. I am not touchy. This time she really couldn't help it, though she pressed her lips together and lowered her eyes to the petal-strewn carpet. The laughter welled up from inside like carbonation fizzing up from a bottle the moment it's uncapped, and not just a snort or a chortle, but hard, muscular laughter. Judge, of course, swelled up with indignation, and that was even funnier. He glowered at her as she went on laughing, but at last, defeated, he turned on his heel and left her alone in the dining room with the rotting flowers. There was the sound of loud, reproachful footsteps mounting the stairs and the slamming of a door. At once she stopped laughing. It seemed as though someone had entered the room at that moment, not as though someone had left it. It was her sorrow, and as soon as she had recognized it, she was able to welcome it with the first tears she'd shed since Ben had died. 75. Finally, after wasting one whole day trying to go through the official channels, William had been able to get someone to listen to him, a black teenager named Larry who was in charge of the food tent where William got his meals. 
Larry had been living in the camp over a year and was well enough connected with his clandestine hierarchy that he was able to send a message to a woman named Lorene, who would be able, according to Larry, to sneak William into the old Midway area, which housed the PHA offices and living quarters. From there, William would be able to phone anywhere in the Twin Cities, and if he was who he claimed he was, he'd be able to contact someone who could vouch for him. Lorene appeared at 3.30. A squat blonde woman who must have been at least ten years his senior, Lorene still wore the traditional uniform of teenage rebellion, leather jacket, jeans, and lots of junk jewelry. She smoked nonstop, sucking at the cigarettes as though she were fighting to draw a breath of air from a faulty respirator. William went through his story again. Loreen listened with selective inattention. She seemed to have no interest in how he'd been shanghaied into the camp or in whether or not he had Arvids. It didn't take medical training to see that she did. Her fingers had a telltale tremor every time she lifted a cigarette to her lips. Tears leaked, unheeded, from the corners of her eyes, tracing lines of melted mascara down her cheeks. And the sour smell of the disease came off her like the smell of a caged animal in the zoo. Even the stink of her Salem's couldn't mask it. But strangely, on Lorene these marks of imminent death seemed less to be symptoms of disease than badges of defiance, like her leather jacket and the haze of her cigarette smoke. Lorene was interested, essentially, in only one thing, how much William might be able to pay for his release. In cash, she emphasized, for obvious reasons. She had a brief fit of coughing, recovered, blinked away tears, and took a drag on her cigarette. It's got to be cash. Gold is okay, too, not jewelry, just the kind of gold that looks like candy bars. I've got money in various bank accounts. If I wrote out a check to cash... Yeah, but who's going to take it into a bank? That's the problem. See, how could we trust you not to try and turn us in once you're out of here? If I did that, I'd put myself in danger of being sent back here myself. Maybe, maybe not. If you're the big shot you say you are, and if you don't test positive once you're out, you're out. And as soon as you're out, you'll forget the reasons you had to be grateful to me and my friends. That seems to be human nature. She took in a lung full of smoke and grimaced philosophically. If you want money, I can get you money. I keep a reserve of cash in my safe. If I can get through to someone on the phone, I can tell them how to open it. Now you're cooking. How much you think is in the safe? Ten thousand, maybe more. You'll need to come up with more than that if you want exit papers, but that ought to set the wheels in motion. No, don't tell me. I'm telepathic. You're going to say, that's blackmail. William tried to echo her smart-ass tone. No, more like ransom for a kidnapping. She nodded approvingly. Right, this is your own personal hostage crisis. So since we're agreed on that, let's head to the trailer. Lorene led him on a zigzag path through the fairgrounds, stopping along the way to confer with other unofficial figures of authority. The bouncer outside a big merry-go-round, which had become a crack house, according to someone William had stood in line with the day before in Pioneer Hall. An old woman selling frayed paperbacks and used magazines from a pronto pop stand. The sidewalks were crowded with people, mostly dressed in the pajamas supplied by the camp, but few of them were going anywhere. They stood in clusters or sat along the curb, a few speaking, most silent, all with an air of aggrieved resignation, as though they had been waiting hours for a parade that would never appear. At intervals, one of the green and white PHA service vehicles would crawl by, like a police car cruising a high-crime neighborhood. So, Larry says you're some kind of doctor. William nodded. I run a research facility. Researching what, exactly? Various aspects of immune response. Hearing Lorene's wheezy laugh was like looking at an X-ray of her damaged lungs. Meaning you specialize in Arvids? Someone has to, if there's ever going to be a cure. She stopped in front of a boarded-up concession booth and squinted at him through a twisting veil of cigarette smoke. What did you say your name was? Michaels. William Michaels, the guy in the news? 
from time to time. You're the one who's got this plan for turning some whole county up north into another plague camp like this? She didn't wait for confirmation. Shit, she said, dropping her cigarette to the pavement and grinding it out. She looked at him with candid, gloating calculation. William felt reassured. Now that he'd been recognized for who he was, it would only be a matter of time until he was released. The size of the ransom demanded was a matter of indifference to him. Lorene developed a sense of urgency, and they headed directly to the midway with no more side stops, entering through a secondary gate where the guards weren't uniformed in PHA green. The trailer they went to was located behind the main Ferris wheel, which was still operational, being run for the entertainment of PHA personnel and for its value as PR. From a distance, the sight of the revolving Ferris wheel gave the fairgrounds an air of business-as-usual cheeriness. It served the same purpose, though on an immensely larger scale, as the bouquet beside a sickbed. The trailer was furnished sparely, with two desks and a few office chairs. Supplies of liquor, chocolate, and cigarettes, the unofficial currency of the camp, were arrayed in cabinets with padlocked doors of steel mesh. Lorene unlocked one of the cabinets, took out a phone, and plugged it into a wall jack. So tell me, what do I dial? He gave her Ben's home number first, and when no one answered there, his number at MDS. When Ben's secretary answered, Lorene refused to relinquish control of the phone. All she could tell me, she summarized when she'd hung up, was that he wasn't there now and she didn't know where he would be. So who do I call next? He gave her the general number for MDS and told her to try and be put through to the administrative director, Valerie Bright. After being shunted about to various extensions, Lorene hung up. It's the same with her as with that Winkleberger guy. She's not there, and no one can say where she is or when she'll be back. Strike two. There was no recourse but to have Lorene dial his number at home. He hadn't wanted to involve his wife in his difficulties any more than he could help. Lisa did not cope well with unexpected demands. He also did not want to give her the combination of his safe. She didn't even know there was a safe in his study. William was already figuring whom to call next when someone answered the phone after just two rings. Hello, Lorene said. Is this Mrs. William Michaels? And then after a pause, Well, is Mrs. Michaels there? I'd like to speak to her. And then after a longer pause, in a tone of exasperation, Shit! Hung up! But someone was there, William insisted. A woman. She had the same last name as the first person you had me call. Winklemeyer. Judith Winklemeyer? Right. Judith wouldn't just hang up. That isn't like her. Lorene snorted derision and dug into the zippered pocket of her jacket for a pack of Salem's. You'd be surprised how many people hang up their phones when they hear where the call is coming from. I got a brother in Edina. You think he's happy to have me call up? You think if I ask to talk with one of my nieces they are ever there? Once you're inside this fence, you are already considered dead by the people outside, and they don't like to be visited by ghosts even over the phone. Welcome to hell, Dr. Williams. But Judith didn't know who was calling. Let me use the phone. I know she won't hang up on me. Lorene lighted a cigarette. Help yourself. Just feeling the beige plastic of the receiver in his hand was like catching hold of a lifeline. He had only to dial the right seven digits and, like a lottery winner, all his problems would be over. He dialed his home number and Judith answered at once with a questioning, Hello? Judith? Judith, it's William. Please don't hang up again. This is very important. William, I didn't hang up. The line just went dead for some reason. Where are you? Ben said you were picked up by the PHA. That's where I am now, at the fairgrounds. It's been a nightmare, but I can't go into it now. Is Lisa there? Lisa had already left before I got here. Left for where? To visit her brother in the Berkshires. She left on Tuesday with the boys and your au pair. I'm alone here with Judge. William, are you all right? The question seemed to act like a karate chop right to the root of his pain. It flared through his nervous system like magnesium, a blast of pure white agony obliterating everything else. 
Vorine pried the phone from his fingers with the schooled indifference of a nurse to whom another person's pain is only a symptom to be dealt with, like fever or incontinence. Hello, Miss Winkleberger, she said into the phone. Your friend is experiencing some temporary distress. The reason he called is that he wanted someone at that number to open his office safe and take some money from it, and then be ready to bring the money to. At this point, it hasn't been decided where, so if you could get the money and wait for us to call again later, do you think you could do that? William could not hear Judith's reply, but it seemed to satisfy Loreen. What is the combination of the safe? Loreen asked him. He couldn't answer at once. The aftershock of the pain and fear that it might return made it hard to think of anything else. Dr. Williams? Loreen insisted, squeezing her eyes into slits. When he had told her the combination of the safe, he felt a strange and humbling helplessness. And where is the safe, your friend wants to know? In the wall to the right of my desk, behind my medical degree. Lorraine passed on the information to Judith with her own commentary. He says it's in the first place anyone would look, behind the degree on the wall of his office. Maybe there's even an arrow pointing to it and a sign saying, Safe here. After a pause, she said to herself, I don't believe it. And then, looking up to William, she hung up again. You think I said something to offend her? But William wasn't thinking at all. The pain had returned, not at full force, only a dull pain, bearable if it didn't get worse. Lorene dialed the number again and reported, Busy. She returned the receiver to its cradle. Just out of curiosity, is that Judith someone you know real well? I mean, she isn't likely to just take the money and run, is she? William shook his head. I think, he said very carefully, I should see a doctor. Lorene laughed. You and me both, sweetheart. I think this may be urgent. Hey, it wasn't me who hung up the phone. It was your friend Judith. If you could get someone to drive me to 1350 Calumet Avenue here in St. Paul, it's not more than a mile from the fairgrounds. Why, what's there? The caduceus was there, where he had first hidden it in the insulation of the attic. The caduceus had never failed to be efficacious in the past. If he could lay hold of it, he would be well, the pain would be gone. But how could he explain that to this leather-clad harpy, this would-be teenager who looked older than Madge? All he could think to say was, My stepmother lives there. She's a nurse, she... He caught his breath as another magnesium flare of pain swept through his nervous system. Lorene leaned forward, squint-eyed, her interest captured by the signs of his suffering as an iron filing might align itself inside a magnetic field. Hey, you're not bullshitting, are you? You got some kind of problem. Please, he begged, with the abjection that comes as hope vanishes. Just take me to 1350 Calumet. Yeah, well, we'll keep dialing. But meanwhile, I think you could use a little mood alteration. Something to take your mind off your immediate problems. She went to the steel mesh cabinet from which she'd taken the telephone and returned with a box containing a hypodermic and various sized ampules. She readied his injection as skillfully as any RN and found the vein she was looking for after only the second try. The morphine flowed into him like the waters of baptism, erasing the pain, filling any darkness with bright white light. His body became a dawn meadow, shimmering with a dew of pure, hurtless sensation. That feels better? Lorene inquired. Her husky voice seemed to have gained a clarinet-like timber. He nodded. Lorene put a finger under his chin and tilted his head up so that she could look directly into his eyes. For a moment he thought she meant to kiss him, but then, reverently, she refilled the hypodermic from another ampule. There was a song, she remarked, back in the sixties. She paused as she felt the first rush of the drug and resumed. I can't remember the lyrics anymore, but I used to listen to that song all the time. 76. It was clear now that everything had been happening for a purpose. 
his father's phone call coming just when it did, and Judith having arrived just when she did, so she would answer the phone when William rang and he would talk to her. Judge was sure that no matter what sort of fix William was in, he wouldn't have told Judge the combination of the safe, not when he knew that inside it was not only the pile of money he'd wanted Judith to bring him, but, praise God, the anchoring device for the parole board's house arrest system. He'd torn the office apart trying to find the damned thing, until he'd discovered the wall safe and realized that that was where it must be. At which point, Lisa was already dead. He was sorry he had had to kill her, though at the time he'd felt a kind of satisfaction. Not a carnal satisfaction, but the feeling you get when the last piece of a puzzle slips into place. The righteous thwack of a knife as it keeps hitting the high score areas in a target. No, he was sorry because he knew he was in deep shit and couldn't see any way out. If he went any distance from the anchoring device in the house, the parole board band around his ankle would trigger an alarm, and he'd be picked up and returned home. And if he'd removed the band himself with the garden shears, the police would have been at the house in no time and found Lisa's body. No matter what he did, he seemed headed back to prison. So he had just sat tight and concentrated his attention on exploring Wyoming which turned out to have been exactly the right thing to do. And now, was it still the right thing to do? Wyoming was a gold mine of information, especially once he'd gained the spectacles of true vision. In some ways, in most ways, Wyoming was a more interesting place than Willowville or Minneapolis or anywhere real. It wasn't like looking at pictures on a TV screen. It was like the world to come, the world of the last days promised by the Gospels and by Brother Orson. And he was there, even more vividly than when Judge had interfaced with him through his 900 phone number. People were always trying to explain away Brother Orson, saying he was just a computer-generated illusion of interactivity. But nothing could explain away what Judge had seen and heard in the last few days. He would have liked to boot up the disc again right now, but he really had to deal with the bodies first, especially Lisa's body, which smelled. One of the good things about living in the last days was knowing that your own flesh would never be corrupted. It would pass through the rapture and be rendered incorruptible. Judge freed up the edges of an oriental rug from the sofa legs, pinning it to the carpet. He placed Lisa's body at one end of the rug and got her rolled up into a fairly manageable bundle. He fastened the bundle to stay closed with three rep ties from William's dressing room closet. When he'd finished and dragged the bundle out into the hall, Lisa's hair was visible at one end and the tips of her shoes at the other, but basically she looked like a rolled-up rug. He left Lisa at the head of the stairs and then went down to the living room to figure out what to do with his mother. He really had not meant to kill Judith, but she hadn't left him much choice. Once he'd refused to let her into William's office, she'd said, Okay, and turned away and would have walked right out of the house. He'd had to stop her. The fact she was his mother really didn't enter into it, though he knew if he got caught and there were newspaper headlines, they'd make him out to be some kind of monster for killing his mother and his stepmother, and they'd probably even try to blame him for Ben's being dead, too. They'd say he was some kind of sex maniac, and it really wasn't fair. And just try and explain to the media that neither Lisa nor Judith was his parent in the baptism of the gospel. Oh, if he got caught now, there would be hell to pay. Judith's corpse looked like she'd fallen asleep on the sofa where he'd left her, her head lolled sideways across the upright cushion. Her left hand was wedged between her thighs, and her right hung limply from the armrest. Except that her eyes were closed, you might have supposed she was posing for a picture. Only if you looked at her neck real close could you see the marks his fingers had made when he'd strangled her. Judge wasn't sure what to do with Judith. There was another oriental carpet in the living room, but it was nine feet by twelve feet and not well adapted to the task. He knew from the last time he'd taken a pizza out of it that the freezer in the basement was too well stocked to get a body into it without taking out a lot of the food. Burying the bodies in the backyard was out of the question, even if he waited till late at night. There were just too many other houses with the view of what he'd be doing. 
As Judge stood there wondering how to proceed, the doorbell rang. He felt an instant of panic, but no more than that. Unbidden, the words of the eighteenth psalm came to his lips. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation. He squatted down, grabbed hold of the baseboard of the sofa, and hauled it out by main strength a couple of feet from the wall. With one hand he got hold of Judith by the waistband of her slacks and slid his other hand under her knees. Then, much as he might have executed a clean and jerk, he flipped Judith's body up over the back of the couch and let it drop to the floor. He pushed the couch back to the wall, or as near as it would go. He regarded the effect from a distance, and he figured it would pass muster. Then he went to the monitor in the vestibule to see who was at the door. It was the black priest who'd preached the fine sermon about the Lord's Prayer at Our Lady of Mercy Church, and then gone out with him and old Mrs. Obstschmecker to visit the cemetery, Father Lyman Sinclair. Judge was delighted. He unbolted the door and opened it, and held out his hand to be shaken. Well, as I live and breathe, you said you was going to come and pay me a visit, and here you are. The priest smiled. Is this a convenient time? I'm not intruding. I can't think of anyone I'd rather see at this moment than yourself. Lyman Sinclair. You will remember that you said I didn't have to call you father. Come inside, come inside. 77. Father Lyman Sinclair knew he was being a snoop, but that did not make him feel sinful, since where was the commandment that said, Thou shalt not snoop? Partly he'd been drawn here by ordinary celebrity curiosity, the same that could fill roadsides with a million unbelievers every time the Pope stepped into a limo. Judge Winklemeyer's father was many notches lower on the scale of newsworthiness than the Holy Father, and lower than most movie stars, but he was at least the equal of the governor or even a news anchorman. He was also the only famous person Lyman had gone to school with and since Lyman himself had become famous in a local way, there was a class reunion aspect to the visit. Even the school bully, and that surely had been Lyman's role, develops a kind of sentimental interest after enough time has passed. Beyond that, however, was a bond of guilt that ran so deep in Lyman's soul that it seemed sometimes that Billy Michaels was his brother, and Abel left alive after a botched murder. When he'd heard, the day after the trick he'd played on Billy, how Mr. Michaels had been killed in a car accident when he was driving Billy to the hospital, Lyman had gone straight to Father Youngerman at the rectory of Our Lady of Mercy and made his confession. The first real confession in his life. But Lyman had never felt forgiven, not entirely, and the sense of his sinfulness had eaten at him year after year, until at last it had turned him into a priest. O Felix culpa! perhaps. But even so, he was sure that the ledgers of heaven had yet to be balanced between himself and the boy who'd become Dr. William Michaels. So here he was at the man's home in Willowville, seated on his living-room couch, yielding to the tug of all those years of curiosity and guilt. It might not be the scene of the crime he was returning to, but it felt like it. But that was only a part of his curiosity. He was fascinated no less by Judge Winklemeyer, Dr. Michaels's loutish stepson, and though he knew it was a morbid fascination, he could not resist the impulse when his parochial duties had called him to Anoka to turn off U.S. 10 at the Willowville exit. Here, in an interior that might have served as a cover for one of the magazines that cater to the house proud, all lush fabrics and fine-grained woods, the boy seemed even stranger, more ungainly, than he had at the church or the cemetery. Nothing of this house's genteel style had rubbed off on him. He looked like a plumber who'd come to fix a plugged drain, with the latex pale skin some white men have that makes them look half dead, and that even in his worst moments of envy or self-pity in seminary days, Lyman would never have wished for in exchange for his own deep cocoa brown. The boy's eyes were what most fascinated Lyman, the eyes of fanaticism of perfect faith, of lunacy. His own faith had never been so pure, 
nor had he ever seen quite the same telltale gleam in the eyes of other Catholics, except perhaps for some of the nuns, the ones he remembered from childhood. He envied such purity of heart and singleness of vision, but he feared it a little too. And as usual when fear is complicated with desire, it had become a temptation, and he had yielded to it and come here. I'll bet I know what you're thinking. You're wondering why there's such a smell in here. It's the roses. On Monday my stepmother filled up all those pots she's got on all the tables, and then she went off east to see her brother, and I've been here since then more or less by myself. I didn't think to get rid of the damn things till this afternoon, and that's why there's the smell. The church can get to smelling the same way after a funeral. Judge jutted his head forward, squinting. Just a joke, Lyman soothed. One had to remember that people with great faith were liable to have zero sense of humor. Judge nodded and seemed to relax. He was seated on the edge of a wing-back chair, his elbows braced against his knees, his thick fingers tightly interlocked in a double fist. I didn't notice it myself, he went on, till my real mother pointed it out to me. She's come here to visit, but she is not here now. I told you about her. I remember you said your mother was a nun. Mm-hmm, that's her. You'd probably like her. Or maybe you wouldn't. She's a heretic. Yes, you mentioned that as well, when we were driving to the cemetery. I probably would like her. Some of my best friends are heretics. That's probably another joke, huh? Myself, I cannot see how you Catholics know what to believe when one bunch of you believes one thing and another bunch believes something else, and the newspapers say that some big percent of both sides don't put any store by what the priests on either side say and just go their own way. We're a bit like families that way, I suppose. Outsiders only hear the noise we make quarreling. The love is quiet. I've got to disagree with you there. With God, there can't be no room to quarrel. He says, do this. You better do it. Thy will be done. It was you preached that sermon. Though when you hit that line, you kind of skittered off, as I recall. You just said we got to all love everybody else and left it at that. I didn't invent that idea myself, you know. That's in the gospel, too. But loving's got to be the easy part. You won't get no one to disagree about love. It's when God's got other ideas that thy will be done can get tricky. Other ideas than love? Lyman asked in a defensive tone. Such as? Such as when he told Abraham to take his baby boy Isaac up on top of the mountain and kill him. I don't see what love had to do with that. Truly, faith was more the issue in that case, but Abraham didn't have to kill Isaac in the end. A ram was substituted. Mm-hmm. But the reason we're supposed to think Abraham was so special was because he would have done it if God hadn't changed his mind at the last minute, right? And then what about Jephthah? Jephthah went ahead and did what Abraham was let off the hook from having to do. He killed his only begotten. Of course, it was his daughter he killed, not a son, but nowadays that's not supposed to make a difference. I know the story of Jephthah, Lyman said, in a tone of annoyance. The story of Jephthah was, in his opinion, one of the Old Testament's major warts. Feminists loved to use it as ammunition to prove that Jehovah was not much better from an ethical point of view than Baal or Dagon or the other major contenders of that era. Yes, he knew the story very well, and he knew there was only one loophole. But nowhere in the story does it say that God told Jephthah to do what he did. It was his own dumb idea to make the promise he did. Well, if it was such a dumb idea, why does the Bible say, chapter 11, verse 29, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. And then, the very next thing, verse 30, Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be, that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, 
and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Seems pretty clear from that the Lord was inspiring Jephthah to vow that vow. And when it was his daughter stepped through the door, don't you think the Lord must have had a hand in that too? The Lord was testing Jephthah by making him burn to death the person he loved the most. That's got to be the meaning of the story. And once he'd done what he vowed, then God made him one of the judges of Israel, like Samson. And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Chapter 12, verse 7. It's in the book. What is your point? Does Brother Orson think we should reinstitute human sacrifice? It ain't my point, and it's not Brother Orson's point. It's God's. God can ask us to do some damned strange things. Like suppose there had to be nuclear war to keep the communists from taking over the whole world, and we'd bring on nuclear winter if we did that. I guess that might be some kind of human sacrifice, but we'd have to do it. Actually, Christ had different ideas about how to deal with one's enemies. That's why we speak of an Old Testament and a New Testament. What Brother Orson says, and what I believe, is there is just one God, and He's eternal. I am that I am. And if he says you got to kill the next person comes through the front door, why then that's what you got to do. No ifs, ands, or buts. But I'm forgetting my duties as a host. Would you like something to drink? I can offer milk or OJ or something from my father's liquor cabinet. Some orange juice, perhaps. I still have a long drive home. Judge got to his feet and headed for the farther end of the living room, where it merged with a dining room of equal extent. It's too bad my father isn't here right now, he said, pausing in the archway between the two rooms. I remember your saying how you went to school together. Judge went through the arch, then turned left out of sight, presumably toward a source of orange juice. When he'd gone, Lyman sniffed at the stink that hung in the air of the room. It went beyond the cloying scent of decaying flowers. It was more like meat that had begun to turn. There was a rustling sound that seemed to come from behind the couch. A pet of some sort, Lyman supposed. Since the couch had been pulled several inches away from the wall, it would have been an easy matter to crane his neck and look over the back of the couch, but just as he was about to do so, Judge returned with two glasses of orange juice. He was still harping on Jephthah. What I don't understand about you Catholics, he handed Lyman a glass tinkling with ice cubes, is what you think the Bible is. If it's God's Word, then isn't the whole thing God's Word, including the story of Jephthah? What do you think God means by that story? St. Mark answers that question. Christ spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Only alone with his disciples did he expound his full meaning. I'd say that the God who gave us the Old Testament was often speaking in parables, too. The story of Jephthah is a myth, like the story of Agamemnon and Iphigenia. They're very similar stories. A father heading into battle makes an oath to kill his daughter and does so. The main difference is Agamemnon kills his daughter before the war, and Jephthah waits till afterward. Judge made a hoot of derision. Agamemnon? Ephigenia? Those are Greek names, ain't they? Brother Orson says all that Greek stuff is secular humanist bullshit. Like that Oedipus we had to read about at school. Killed his father and married his mother, and then this psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud comes along and says we all of us are just aching to do the same thing. I knew that's what Jews think, but I'm surprised to hear it from a Catholic priest. Momentarily, Lyman was stopped in his tracks. Could the son of a doctor, a prominent scientist, really be such a redneck ignoramus as this? He was tempted to call judges bluff, but the gleam in the boy's eye had grown brighter while they'd been talking, and Lyman doubted that was something that could be faked. Somehow, just by living in Florida and watching untold hours of evangelical TV cartoons, the boy had soaked up the essence of fundamentalist dementia. 
So it wouldn't do just to say bullshit and take his leave. That might do for a liar. A madman deserved more courtesy. It was the orange juice that gave him his cue. Ever since his four-year stint of missionary duty in Calcutta, he'd associated the color of orange juice with the garish robes of the priestly caste and with the garishness of Hinduism generally. Oh, Catholicism would have many surprises for you, and the religious world beyond Catholicism would have still more. It did for me. After my seminary years in Rome, I did mission work in Calcutta, and I found out what idolatry is at first hand. Americans pick up the term from reading the Bible, but the actuality of idolatry would boggle even your mind, my boy. The most popular god of their vast pantheon is called Ganesh, who looks like a man, except that he has the head of an elephant. How he came to look that way takes us right back to Jephthah and to Oedipus. Originally Ganesh looked like any other god, that's to say human. But one day his father Shiva came home after a long absence and discovered a young man with his wife Parvati in her bedroom and having a hot temper, he cut off the young man's head. Only afterwards did he realize it was Ganesh, and so to keep Ganesh alive, he cut off the head of an elephant that was passing by just then, and fastened it to the dead boy's neck, in which form Ganesh has been worshipped for centuries. Judge looked at Lyman with genuine amazement. But that's impossible. You can't put an elephant's head on a human being. We don't think so, but there have been billions of Indians who believe in Ganesh just as fervently as you believe in Brother Orson. What's your point? Are you trying to say Brother Orson is some kind of pagan idol? No, my point is about the nature of idolatry, that its nature is to ascribe human attributes to God, and so every culture is liable to end up with myths that look alike because human nature, as Freud pointed out, and St. Augustine pointed out much earlier, is the same in India as it is in Greece or North Africa or Minneapolis. Freud speaks of the Oedipus complex. Augustine calls it original sin. And I call that bullshit. Judge's pallid face was flushed with anger. Elephants, Agamemnon, Jesus Christ Almighty, he got to his feet and stood with his eyes fixed on Lyman as though he were considering hurling his glass of orange juice at him. At that moment, in answer to the prayer Lyman had not yet thought to make, the phone rang. Immediately, Judge switched into his mode of high courtesy. If you will excuse me just a moment, sir, I must answer the telephone. He strode to the far end of the room and promised, as he went out the door, I will try not to be long. Lyman set down his sweating glass of orange juice on a rosewood end table, careless of the stain it might make. He intended to be out of the house and on the road before Judge had finished on the phone. But as he stood up, there was another sound from behind the couch, faint as the rustling he'd heard a moment earlier, but not such a sound as any pet might make. It was a woman's voice which whispered a single word, Please. He knelt on the edge of the seat and bent over to look into the shadowy recess behind the couch. A woman's body was wedged into the narrow space, one arm twisted over her head and pressing the side of her face into the flowery upholstery. Their eyes met. Don't say anything, she whispered. He may hear. Just go. Did he? No, he's very dangerous. Go to the police. And leave you here with him? I'm safe if he thinks I'm dead. She smiled a smile of desperate entreaty. Please. You're his mother, aren't you? In answer, she only closed her eyes. Lyman got to his feet, but before he was halfway to the door, Judge appeared and, with the quick perception of paranoia, understood the priest's intention. He grabbed a large ceramic vase from one of the rosewood tables and hurled it at Lyman, aiming low. The bowl struck his knees and shattered. Lyman retreated back into the living room, and Judge positioned himself some feet in front of the door. There's a body behind that couch, Lyman said, a dead woman. Judge looked about for another missile. That's your mother, isn't it? 
Lyman took refuge behind the wingback chair, and the second vase struck the chair's arm without shattering. I am sorry, Judge said in a normal conversational tone. I didn't mean things to work out this way. She just appeared, like you did. I suppose in a way it must be a sign. Lyman did not think he would be a match against the boy in a physical struggle. His only hope was escape. But the boy stood between him and the only way out of the room, except the large picture window that faced the couch. If he broke the window and vaulted through it, he took a firm hold on the back of the wingback chair, lofted it, and had begun to swing it round toward the glass when Judge's knife struck him in the back. The chair crashed into the coffee table in front of the couch, sending up a spray of orange juice, shattering the rosewood. Lyman, on his knees, felt the knife being drawn from his flesh, and a final flash of astonishment as the blade slid between his ribs and pierced his heart. 78. Do you realize, Madge marveled, how long it's been since I've had a drink? Since I've been drunk? She held up the stemmed wine glass and gave a little spin to the liquor store's most expensive French wine so that its swirling vein-red contours caught the last brightness of the solstice sunset and threw them back like a little liquid chandelier. Lovely. More than two decades, she answered herself with a sigh. And closer to three. That's a lot of water, Launce agreed, that never went under the bridge. Madge laughed immoderately and went on to marvel at her own laughter. And jokes! I used to joke all the time. Though Henry was the real stand-up comic, he could tell jokes all night long, one after another, without repeating himself once. God, I don't think I could remember one of those jokes now. Oh, I remember one he must have told. It was a real popular joke in the sixties. The one about the three Jews pissing in the snow in Wisconsin was how I first heard it. Another time it was three Norwegian farmers. Remember? Lance leaned forward to empty the last of the third twenty-four-dollar bottle into their glasses, filling his own right to the brim, then lifting the filled glass to his lips without a drop spilled. I think so. The third one spells out the president's full name. Is that the joke? That's the joke. He writes, Lyndon Baines Johnson, President of the United States of America, in foot-high letters. Madge felt a glow of nostalgia that was also, without any contradiction, the glow of the burgundy as it smoothed its way down her throat. I can remember Henry telling that one. We were in a bar in Snelling over toward Marshall that isn't there anymore, and there were a bunch of us all at one table, but I can't remember why it was funny. What's funny is that the third guy, the Jew or the farmer, the one who writes so much, has to have someone else to hold his pecker to do it. Madge considered this for a while and then had to ask, Why? Because he says he can piss all right, but he doesn't know how to spell. Madge spluttered wine joyfully all over her lemon-yellow blouse. The joy of the joke and the blouse's ruin were a single pleasure, which was one with the burning of the wine that had gone up her nose. She had forgotten what it was like to be so thoroughly sloshed, the way the edges disappeared from things, and at the same time their clarity deepened. The wonderful insights she'd probably forget by tomorrow. The recklessness. For what could be more reckless than having sex with someone who had Arvids? Which Lance almost certainly did, though they'd avoided discussing it. They'd been as awkward and greedy as teenagers. Lovely. But loveliest of all, the way the sunlight gilded everything with its own beauty, the leaves on the trees and their shadows on the white siding of the house, the ant crawling along the wooden armrest of the lawn chair, the leaves that had fallen mysteriously at midsummer from the elm above them, and which now decorated the unmown grass at geometric intervals. Even the blotches of the wine and the yellow of her blouse were like the blood-red speckles on the pale petals of a flower she could see in her mind's eye, though she couldn't think of its name. Cineraria? She laughed. Not a laugh that would spill more wine, but a laugh that felt like her own body's form of sunlight, a glow deep inside. 
It wasn't that funny, Lance said, leaning back in the aluminum lawn chair and looking up into the leaves of the tree. No, I was thinking how we aren't sinners. Aren't we? I thought we gave it a pretty good shot. No, we're still husband and wife. The church doesn't recognize divorce. So if we make love, it's not a sin. We're entitled. Ah, but the church also doesn't recognize oral sex. Even if you're married? Nope. Father What's-His-Name made that real clear. So we're sinners after all, if that's what you want. Well, it would make Mother feel better, I'm sure. She just about blew a gasket when she saw me kissing you on the stairs. I'm amazed she's got any gaskets left to blow. Don't look now, but I think she's watching us through the blinds. See where there's that little crack? Launce lifted his glass to salute the crack in the Venetian blinds, which instantly winked shut. That was her, all right. Madge giggled. She was in such a state this morning when I came down to make breakfast. It was more like noon when you made breakfast. That's probably why she was in a state. No, it wasn't that. It was her hair. What's wrong with her hair? It's growing back. Her real hair, that is. What you've seen is just her wig. She had an accident at a beauty parlor years ago, and all her hair fell out, and now it's growing back. She says the itching drives her crazy. Also, it's coming back the wrong color. Carroty red. She's in a tizzy. Madge sipped the saint Emilion, and this time it had the taste of philosophy. You know, it's strange. It seems the best way to get anything done is to stop trying. How do you mean? he asked. And the wonderful thing was he wasn't just being polite, he was genuinely interested in what she had to say. Madge couldn't remember the last time anyone had paid her that particular compliment. Out of sheer gratitude she tried not to be vague. For instance, at the clinic, yesterday and again today, I get these reports. Patients are actually getting well. One in particular, Corning, bed 38. One aide says she actually saw him smiling. Of course, you never know. Sometimes you see what you hope to see. I can't tell you how many times I could have sworn I thought I saw Ned start to say something to me. And now, the way he's been crying. Of course, that's possible without any kind of miracle. A speck of dust gets under his eyelid. But God, just think, if he should snap out of it after all this time, he'd be an eleven-year-old in the body of a thirty-seven-year-old man. Launce laughed sharply. That's better than being what I am, a thirty-seven-year-old man inside of this body. Madge smoothed his feathers. Would you rather have the mind of an old person, like Mother? Old people get set in their ways. They get to be like robots. Or like when they warned you as a kid how, if you made a face, it would freeze into that expression. She crossed her eyes and stuck her tongue out of the corner of her mouth to show what she meant. And at just that moment, around the corner of the house came Judge Winklemeyer, who reacted to her mugging with the most delightful double-take. Madge burst out laughing and lofted her glass and called out, Judge, come join us. We're having a picnic. I didn't think you drank, he said in a reproving tone. I didn't. I couldn't. But Launce brought home a bottle, and all of a sudden I knew I could, and I can. Isn't that wonderful? Well, no, I wouldn't say so. Oh, you would if you had some of this. Twenty-four dollars a bottle. You're sure you're not tempted? Just so you'll know what kind of temptation you've been resisting all your life? The boy stood, confounded and blushing, on the narrow concrete path that bisected the lawn. He was dressed in his usual killjoy uniform of dark suit, white shirt, and black tie. Madge, Launce said in a stage whisper, don't be a tease. Launce is right. I'm being a tease. There's some coke in the ice box if you'd like a coke. Thank you very kindly, but no. Why don't you introduce us? Launce hinted. Of course. Where are my manners? Launce, this is Judge Winklemeyer. 
He's the son of Judith Winklemeyer, who was William's stepsister in Florida. But now you're officially Judge Michaels, yes? William adopted him when he came here. What was it, two years ago? Judge nodded. I was paroled into his custody. And this is Launce Hill. Launce is Ned's father. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, sir. He stepped across the grass and leaned forward so Launce could shake his hand without rising from his lawn chair. I was just about to ask if I might go upstairs and say hello to Ned. He turned to Madge. With your permission, ma'am? Of course, Judge, any time. That's very thoughtful of you. Did you come here with Lisa or William? Are they in the house? No, ma'am. I'm here by myself. But I expect my father to be arriving later. I said I'd meet him here. That's nice. She sighed resignedly. I suppose I should be getting up. It'll be dark soon. It's amazing we haven't already been bitten to death by mosquitoes. Don't stir yourself on my account. I noticed that the screen door was open, and I know where Ned's room is. After I have seen him, I will say hello to your mother if she is feeling like a visitor. Well, then, perhaps we'll enjoy the breeze here a little longer. When Judge had gone out of sight around the side of the house, and they'd heard the screen door bang closed, Launce remarked, That's one weird kid. I was thinking myself he seemed a little strange tonight, but I suppose that's how he usually comes across. Mother likes him. It figures. Madge gave the wine in her glass one final swirl of admiration and drank it down. At just that moment, the lights went on behind the Venetian blinds in her mother's room. You remember in the 60s when we'd go to Lake Calhoun in the summer after work? And rent a canoe. Oh, yes, I do. Do they still rent canoes there? I have no idea. Wouldn't that be fun? Get another bottle? We couldn't, not with that boy in the house and William on his way over. Why not? The kid's not going to steal anything, or murder your mother, more's the pity. Launce, what's the use of getting this drunk if it doesn't give us the excuse we need to do what we'd like to do? This seemed so unassailably logical that Madge could think of no reply. You mean just drive there? If you think you're too drunk to drive, we could take the bus like we used to. Madge took umbrage. I'm not that drunk. Launce struggled to his feet. Think about it. Meanwhile, if you want to plump for another bottle of vin extraordinaire, I'll walk over to the liquor store on Pillsbury. You know where my purse is? Launce nodded and went into the house. The leaves of the elm made a hushing sound, and an unseen car on Calumet whooshed by in front of the house. Bats flittered out from the eaves and past the higher branches of the elm, and at that distance, and at this degree of mellowness, even the bats seemed beautiful. Then she noticed something odd. The light was on in the attic. It was a dim forty-watt bulb near the head of the stairs, at the other end of the attic from this one dormer window that faced on the back yard, so it made a barely perceptible glow. It would have looked well as the backdrop for the cover of a Nancy Drew mystery. The light in the attic window. The bulb must have been burning since the last time she'd been up there. When? Weeks ago, at least. But more likely it was Launce who'd been poking around in the attic and forgotten to turn out the light. Whatever the explanation, her concern for energy conservation was not so strong as to propel her into the house and up to the attic to save one five-thousandth of a cent on the electric bill. Such a beautiful evening. But could she really be thinking of driving off drunk to Lake Calhoun, just as though she and Launce were teenagers again? With Elvis on the radio and Lake Street bumper to bumper with great gas-guzzling cars, the names of which she couldn't even remember anymore? But she could remember the feeling of sweet release stepping outside the house, this same house, more oppressive now than then, and the wind that flowed in through the open window fluttering her hair across her face. Even if they couldn't still rent a canoe, what did it matter? The lake would still be there, and they could lie in the grass and look across the water, and for two or three hours nothing else would exist. They'd be back in the eternity of their youth. She should say yes for Launce's sake, if not for her own. 
so when he returned with the store's last two bottles of the miraculous wine, she didn't take any more convincing. He said, Well, what do you say? And she said, What the hell? And went into the house to get the car keys and left a note on the kitchen table. We're going for a drive back later, Madge. It was the same note she might have written and left under the same salt shaker forty years ago with exactly the same delicious feeling of guilt. 79. Lorene smoked while her dinner flowed through the translucent IV tubes and into the hidden plumbing of her own body. There were so few foods she could count on being able to digest, and those few so bland that she'd really come to prefer this more direct approach to the problem of nutrition. Doc MacDonald, meanwhile, was looking at the naked and unconscious body of his medical colleague, where it was spread out on the examining table of surgery. He palpated the man's lower abdomen, eliciting a low, dreaming groan. Well, I'd have to go along with his own diagnosis. Appendicitis? He nodded, though doctor-like, he had to find a longer way to say it. Acute septic inflammation. No telling how long he's got. Until what? Until it bursts. Then it's too late. The poison fills the peritoneal cavity. So he's got to be operated on. Is that what you're saying? Outside of this place, he would long since have been sent for surgery. But here... Doc MacDonald shrugged. What would be the point? We only need to keep him alive a day or two, till we can arrange for the transfer. If he pops off after that, so much the better. I am not speaking for myself, you understand. I am passing along the wishes of top management. The Commandant. If wishes were horses. This is not something you've ever done? I am an orthopedist, not a surgeon. I deal with bones, not guts. But you're always going on about how you were in that field hospital in Vietnam. They didn't have us doing appendectomies. But you must have dealt with spilled guts. It's supposed to be a pretty simple operation. Lorraine, my dear, these days I have difficulty tying my shoelaces. By way of illustrating his motor control problems, he removed the thermometer from the armpit of the unconscious man and tried to hold it steady as he took a reading. Lorraine ignored his bid for sympathy. What does it say? He frowned. It's up over a hundred and three. He put a finger to the man's neck, measuring the pulse against his wristwatch. Ninety-five, he announced at length, with a grave shaking of his head. Listen, Lorene insisted, deftly removing the IV needle from her arm. We both have a nice deal here, right? We've got perks and privileges that neither of us would care to jeopardize. So if you perform an appendectomy that is less than state-of-the-art, who's to know? You think there's going to be some medical board of inquiry? If the guy doesn't recover, that could even be a plus for us, because there'll be no chance of his lodging a formal complaint and trying to get an investigation started. So why don't we just do the best job we can? Details you don't think you can handle, I'll do myself. I am not at all squeamish. Just give me directions. I've always thought surgery was one of those things, like skydiving or eating oysters, that everyone should do at least once in her life. So I consider this my big opportunity. What do you say? Doc MacDonald shrugged. I'll need a couple bottles. Shiva's Regal okay? That would be fine. I'll go get him. Meanwhile, you prep him. That's the right word. Prep? Lorene, you are going to leave this camp a registered nurse. A nurse? Hey, Doc, women today have got higher expectations than that. I'm going for an M.D. She laughed huskily and pointed to the patient on the table. That one. 80. Judge had put off corruption, taken on incorruption, and was feeling terrific as a result. It was like having X-ray eyes, like being consumed in the fires of Pentecost. He could see things the way they really were, the way they had been and had to be all at once and all together, broken into pieces like a monitor with many windows, and each window streaming with light, as though everything in the world were lit up from inside like a light bulb. And if he looked into the light and held his gaze steady, Brother Orson would be there with the angel Lazarus, 
but now the two of them were one, and that one was God, just as in his heart Judge had always supposed. Till now Brother Orson, like Jesus, had had to sidestep questions about who he was and where he came from. But now he stood revealed. So when he read the note Madge had left under the salt shaker on the kitchen table, he was not upset, though for a moment he was surprised, since he had supposed that she had been set down for a sacrifice like Lisa and Judith and the priest. Why else had a salt shaker been placed on her letter? For it is written, Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 23 and 24, Thou shalt offer a young bullock without blemish, and a ram out of the flock without blemish, and thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priests shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them up for a burnt offering unto the Lord. All that was clear, but it was just as clear that the Lord did not intend Madge and the man she'd had with her to be part of the sacrifice, at least not now. What he must do now was to search through this house and find the caduceus that Brother Orson had said had been hidden here for years and years. Though where exactly he would not say, only seek and you will find. The logical places to look were the basement and the attic, since those were the places where something would be likely to stay hidden for the longest time. The bulb at the top of the steps going down to the basement was burnt out and even with his new powers of vision, Judge had to feel his way by fingertip down the steps and along the rough cinder block walls. The only light in the entire cellar was a pinpoint of red at waist level, dimmer than a bathroom nightlight. It turned out to be the light on a deep freeze. He opened the deep freeze and was able to make out the rough outlines of other features of the basement from the light spilling out from its white interior. At the far end of the room was a wall of shelves with a ladder beside it. Something inside him told him to go climb up the ladder and look on the shelves. But when he did, all he found was empty jars intended for canning. Even so, he couldn't shake the certainty that there was something here he was meant to have. Not the caduceus. Something else. Its absence mocked him. He threw one of the bottles at the concrete wall for the satisfaction of hearing it smash. But if he'd broken every bottle on every shelf, it would have only honed his frustration to a sharper edge. He descended the ladder, feeling balked and cheated, and returned to the side of the deep freeze. He'd almost lowered its bulky lid without noticing or taking in the nature of the freezer's contents. A single package bundled in a supermarket bag its white plastic mottled with what Judge was suddenly sure was blood. And in the package, when most of the plastic had been peeled away, a man's head. A bloated frozen tongue protruded from the distended jaw, and the eyeballs had become glassy and crackled like ice cubes. Judge felt a momentary pang of proprietary resentment, such as a hunter hidden in a blind might feel hearing another hunter's discharge only a short distance away. But then he realized that however this head had come to be here, it was intended as a sign. A sign prefigured, he realized, by the priest's pagan parable of the elephant-headed Hindu god Ganesh. The thick purple tongue, could it but move again, had some purpose to communicate, like the impaled head that had spoken to him on the counter of the optometrist's shop. Another prefiguration. In what he did, God left no room for accidents. He decided that the head had to be thawed and took it up to the kitchen and punched instructions, thaw, meat, eight pounds, onto the keypad of the microwave. With its cheek on the turntable, the frozen head barely fit inside. Then, remembering Madge's invitation earlier, Judge helped himself to a can of Coke from the ice box and settled down in front of the microwave and watched the head revolve on the turntable for the time it took to finish off the coke. He remembered how, when he was little, he'd sat spellbound in front of his mother's thirty-three and a third RPM phonograph, watching the music as he listened to it. As he sipped his coke and watched the man's frozen features turning a brighter and brighter pink, he felt a kind of reverence, such as, he supposed, people of a more conventional religious temperament must feel when they're at church looking at the flickering candles and smelling the incense. 
Then a voice spoke to him, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Just as the angel cries out in John's revelation, and when the vine of the earth had been cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God, blood had spurted from the winepress. Even, John writes, unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There had been a time when many of these details had been confusing to judge, and when he'd asked Brother Orson about them, his answers had seemed obscure or evasive. But now all that was changed. Brother Orson was beside him. It was his voice that had spoken aloud, repeating the words of the angel. His hand that had pulled the tab from the can of Coke. And now when the phone rang, it was the voice of Brother Orson that answered and said, Yes. It was the woman whose call he'd been waiting for, the one who'd phoned earlier to Willowville. She was very brusque and businesslike, and Judge was the same. He said he had the money, and he promised to bring it at eleven o'clock to the point they'd agreed on at the edge of Brosner Park. He felt uneasy about leaving the house, not knowing when Madge might return with the old man she said was Ned's father. She would undoubtedly be upset if she noticed what was in the microwave. But it was too soon to take it out, for it was far from being thawed through. Finally, he figured that the Lord could be trusted to guide Madge to do the right thing, just as he was guiding Judge. For all that, he felt the hand of the Lord on his shoulder, and Brother Orson's footsteps beside him, Judge realized, when he went out to the Cadillac he'd left parked on Ludens at the side of the house, that he'd left the engine running and the keys in the ignition. It was natural enough, with all that had happened, to feel nervous, but he really couldn't afford to be so careless. He drove east on Ludens, hung a right onto Brosner, and drove the six blocks to the park at the sedate pace of a jogger. The breeze had quickened to a light wind, and as he came to the park and the larger sky that the trees had blocked from view became visible, he could see clouds being swept across the moon, risen now to its meridian. In eternity, soon, there would be no clouds, nor even a moon, changing its shape from night to night, and the sun would be fixed in the sky as it was above Jericho, impaled by Joshua's horn. At the hour appointed, a large black van pulled up in front of the Cadillac, and two men, in jeans and T-shirts, came around to the rear of the van and opened the door and shone a flashlight across a figure lying on a mattress. Then a woman in a leather jacket came to the window of the Cadillac and asked Judge for the money. Judge watched her while she fanned through each rubber-banded sheaf of bills, checking the denominations. A smoking cigarette hung from the side of her painted mouth. Judge felt disgusted and tried not to breathe through his nose, so he wouldn't smell her cigarette. Okay, she said, with a nod to the two men waiting beside the van. Tugging at the corners of the blanket on which he lay, they pulled the man partway out the rear end of the van until one of them was able to bend over and get a grip on his legs. Then they carried him to the passenger side of the Cadillac, where Judge had already pushed the door open. Judge regarded his father with subdued, anticipatory triumph, but that feeling was complicated by a natural revulsion at the way he looked and smelled. His head lolling back against the seat's headrest with a low, wordless moan, his two front teeth missing, which made Judge remember the times in Florida long ago when William would pry the flipper from the roof of his mouth and pretend to be an old bum. Now he really had become that old bum. You've got to be careful how you handle him, the woman with the cigarette cautioned. He's still pretty sensitive down here. She rubbed the lower part of her leather jacket. You don't have to worry. Judge assured her, I will take proper care of him. You've got a southern accent, she observed. Yes, I'm from the south, Florida. She smiled and touched his cheek with one of her long painted fingernails. Cute, she said. Real cute. Just my luck we should meet like this. Judge was at a loss for words. Well, she said, still in the same suggestive tone, see you around. She winked at Judge and then returned to the van. The two men with her had already crawled inside and pulled the rear door shut behind them. The taillights lit up bright orange, and the van drove ahead to the stoplight at Calumet and turned south along the park. "'Are you okay?' Judge asked, 
without looking at his father. I will be. Soon. William's voice was the barest whisper. Judge waited to start the engine in case he meant to say more, but when there was no more forthcoming, he turned the key in the ignition and headed back toward the old house on the corner of Calumet and Ludens. 81. Each familiar sight along the length of Calumet was an assurance that the nightmare was over. He would be safe where he was going. Whatever butcheries had been committed in the name of surgery would heal as soon as he had again possessed himself of the caduceus. The car hit a red light at the corner of Calumet and Hubbard. All of the small shops had gone out of business, including the Rexall drug store, where on the coldest winter days he'd stopped on the way home from school to get warm. The empty windows of the one-time drug store seemed for a moment to epitomize all that was tragic and fatal in human existence. Then the light changed, and the car moved ahead, and the meaning of the scene sliding by became jumbled and unclear. The drugs he'd been given before the woman cut him open were still in his system, dulling the pain, but also making it difficult to form clear thoughts. His sense of time was all distorted. The car seemed to be moving at the speed of a person walking along the sidewalk. A few houses ahead he saw a hedge, its tiny leaves jittering in the wind, a sickly, glittery yellow under the sodium street lamps. And he remembered passing before this same hedge, running home after the accident with the kite, bleeding then, too, and how the woman who'd been trimming the hedge had called out to him, Little boy, and then, Young man. He could remember the exact X of the open clippers in her hands, the screechy timber of her voice, the blood stains down the front of his shirt. He could feel the wet warmth of the blood soaking his underpants. It seemed a shameful thing, like incontinence, and the thought of asking Judge or Madge to clean his private parts was even more unbearable. But such a simple action, leaning forward, reaching down, was beyond his capabilities now. Even to be sitting upright in the car in his condition was ill-advised. He should be on his back, so the weight of his bowels would not be pressing down against the crude sutures, stitching the incision closed. The car came to a stop at Davis, only two blocks from home, and two kids on a single bicycle crossed the street in front of them. From an open window came the sound of rock music, simplified by distance, or the morphine, to a simple compound beat, systole and diastole. Listen, you can hear the devil, Judge commented, dancing in hell. The light changed and the car lurched forward. The silhouette of the Obstschmecker house hove into view, lights aglow in every window, a haven of welcome. As the car turned the corner and rolled to a stop at the curb, William had his first intimation that everything was not as it should be. When Judge got out of the car and walked round to open the right-hand door, no one came out of the lighted house. Surely they would have been waiting for Judge's return. There would be some show of concern, of curiosity. Where? He hadn't strength to say more than that single word, but Judge understood. I should have said before that Madge ain't home. She'd already gone out for the night with a friend of hers when I called. The old lady had to let me in. Judge slid his right arm under William's knees and his left arm under the shoulders and lifted his father, with a grunt of effort, from the car. Then he told the car door shut and carried his sagging burden across the lawn toward the front porch. William felt each footstep Judge took as a shudder in his body's core. When Judge stumbled, mounting the porch steps, there seemed a kind of inevitability to it. For some time after this, William was in a state of confusion. He did not lose consciousness. Rather, he lost control of its direction, so that at first, lying on the wooden boards of the porch, his attention was fixed on the overhead light bulb as fat June bugs circled it and battered themselves against it. Then he was again being carried upstairs, and he remembered the remark a medical lecturer at the U had made concerning hospital care, that it is a ritual of infantilization. The bland foods, being bathed by other hands, the regulated bedtime, the steady erosion of one's personal authority. And here he was, in his son's arms, as once he'd been in his father's, being carried up the same staircase, and placed in the same bed he'd slept in as a child. There could be a strange comfort, the lecturer had argued, in being treated so, 
but William couldn't remember the reason he'd put forward. It had something to do with fear. He remembered why he had demanded to be brought to this house. He must have the caduceus, which was hidden in the attic but he could not go there himself, nor could he ask to be carried up another flight of stairs and left alone there, even if he'd have had the strength to uncover the caduceus himself, which was doubtful. Yet for some reason he did not want Judge to look for it for him. Better to ask Judith. He cleared his throat, and Judge bent down over him, and he was able to ask, Is your mother here? Judge shook his head, offering no explanation. Or Lisa? Again he shook his head. There was no help for it. There is something in the attic I must ask you to get for me. Judge nodded. A kind of good luck charm, a superstition. But if I could have it now, I'd feel much better. What does it look like, and where should I look? It's a kind of stick with a... Uh, a dead bird tied to it. Where exactly in the attic? Under the loose insulation, in the floor. What part of the floor? He hesitated, for answering the question seemed tantamount to a confession. But what choice was there? Just above Ned's room, I think. About where his bed would be. I'll get it right now. The moment Judge left the room, William felt he should be called back and told not to summon any kind of medical assistance. There was no doctor he knew whom he could trust not to insist on his being taken to a hospital, and there were PHA personnel screening every admissions room. But there seemed no need to caution Judge. Somehow he had understood without having to be told. Tentatively, as much from weakness as from self-solicitude, William fumbled at the buttons of his blood-stained pajama top. When the last one had been undone, he discovered to his horror that the fall on the porch steps had caused the threads of the suture to rip through the soft dermal tissues through which they'd been inexpertly sewn. And the long incision in his abdomen gaped wide, exposing pink coils of intestines. He felt like one of the fabled victims of the guillotine, aware, however briefly, as the executioner holds his head aloft, that he has been decapitated. A doctor would have to be called in now, whatever the consequences. The caduceus could not perform surgery. That don't look too good, Judge said in level tones. He stood in the doorway, holding the caduceus raised before him, as one might hold the stem of a wine glass. William lifted a blood-smeared hand to accept the precious talisman but when Judge did not proffer it, the remaining strength ebbed from the muscles of his arm, and his hand collapsed to the bedspread. I know what this is, Judge said. It's one of those things like you had the sculpture made at MDS, a caduceus, and I know lots of what you've done with it. I even know how to use it myself. Brother Orson explained how you got to spell out what you want it to do so that it rhymes. Please, Judge. I need it. Oh, you will get what you need. But this, he twirled the caduceus wine glass fashion, this ain't yours anymore. It's mine now, and the first thing I aim to do with it is to touch it to this big toe of yours. He tapped William's toe with the caduceus. Till I tell you otherwise, you'll just lie there paralyzed. Judge stood back to see what effect he had produced. William glared back defiantly. But no, it was rather a glare of helplessness, the cancelled stare of a person stopped cold at the moment he realizes every exit has been sealed. Shit, Judge marveled. You really can't move, can you? Even if I was to... He advanced to the side of the bed and dipped the caduceus down to prod the intestines, coiling from the surgical wound. Do this? He waited for an answer and added, as afterthought, You can answer questions when I ask, only you can't lie to me. In fact, you got to answer truthfully. Whether Judge had intended the rhyme or it was fortuitous, it was there, and William replied truthfully, No, I cannot move, no matter what you do. Judge smiled and placed the caduceus on the bedspread a scant inch from William's paralyzed fingertips. 
He stepped back from the bed, confident of his power. You can't even reach ahead that bitty bit and grab hold of it, can you? He exerted his entire will, effectlessly. I can't. You're like old Ned was all that time laying there in his bed, helpless, and anything I do, anything the Lord may require of his servant, you'll just have to sit there and take it. I could cut off your pecker, and you'd just have to smile. Judge hooked his forefinger under a loop of the extruded intestine and tugged at it gently. It seemed to obey his bidding like a living thing, a large pink snake sliding out of the dark hole in which it lived. You're like old Jehoram who had a daughter of Ahab to wife. You know what happened to Jehoram? No. The Lord smote him in his bowels and they fell out. Second Chronicles chapter 21. Only difference is he couldn't get cream aided. Whereas with the Lord you will smell a sweet savor and his nostrils will be pleased. I see the flames of the burnt offering already right now, don't you? I see only what's here. The flames are all around us, everywhere, bright as him standing there by your bed. You see him, don't you? There's only you beside this bed. Then he has struck you blind, but blindness cannot save you. Your crimes are set down on Brother Orson's scorecard, and you will testify and bear witness to them. I know some of it already. I know you used this stick here a long time ago against your brother in the other room and you probably used it on me and all the rest of your family to keep us so healthy we don't any of us even get a cold. And when you want to use it to make patients get well, you do that too. Am I right? Yes. But the plague, thousands and thousands of people you'll never even see, maybe millions before it's all over. I can't understand why you would do that, unless you thought you was acting for the Lord. I might do that. I might have to some day, as part of a larger judgment against the iniquities and sins of the world, because I am an instrument of the Lord. But you, why did you want to make a plague? So I could become rich, and for the power. Power? The power of life and death. Finally, that is the hinge of all power. But it is most nakedly the power a doctor possesses except that medicine is so iffy. With the best of care, patients may die. But with the caduceus, I was like God. I can understand you'd want to be able to cure people, but why hurt people you don't know? Why a plague? The caduceus can be used to cure only in proportion as it has already been used to afflict. Say I'd set out to be the next Dr. Salk and had developed a wonder drug that cured Alzheimer's disease. I would have been able to reduce the suffering of my patients only by enlarging suffering in some other sphere. I might have set up, in a limited way, on that basis, becoming a cancer quack in Mexico or some kind of faith healer but I didn't want to become a one-man Lourdes. I had no wish to be a celebrity, my every action scrutinized. I wanted another kind of power, the kind I got by running and owning MDS. So how did you get the money to build MDS? That was before Arvids. The caduceus was effective against AIDS, but the cost of each cure was exorbitant a matter, literally, of having to kill Peter to save Paul. But even a glimmer of hope in those days could bring enormous research grants, and Ben Winkelmeyer could write better grant applications than anyone in the business. I killed enough Peters and saved enough Pauls to suggest promising avenues for research, and the research that was funded was the genuine article, likewise the vaccine. So why did you start another plague? In a way, it was like planting a garden. I would reap only what I'd sown, and so would always possess a surplus of healing capability. You thought this all out in advance? I figured out the final details at just the age you are now, when I gave a grocer who'd annoyed me a sty, 
and later removed it. The important thing was to figure out a vector for the disease that could never be traced back to me, and it never has been. And what was it, your vector? American pride. Judge took this to be a taunt, and in reprisal pulled out another loop of intestine from the open wound. You got to tell the truth, he insisted. William could make no reply, for no question had been put to him. But Judge was not familiar with the computer-like literalness of the Caduceus's operation. He felt that William was defying him. He grabbed up a handful of guts and shook them in front of William's face. Answer my question, damn it, or I'll tear all this shit out of you. What was the fucking vector? A bull that was exhibited at the state fair, part Cherelet, part Beefalo, and registered under the name of American Pride. He was two years old that summer, and his sperm was said to be worth its weight in plutonium. I decided to make American Pride, or rather his offspring, the bearer of my plague. The wording of the curse was framed to make its dissemination both widespread and untraceable. I also built in a time delay factor of ten years so that by the time the shit finally did hit the fan, I would be in a plausible position to discover a cure. Judge let the guts in his hand fall to William's side. And that curse? How did it go? William recited the words, Let the meaty steers you breed, at the end of ten full years, infect with plague, infest with fears one half percent of those they feed. Once this contagion has occurred, may it only be wholly cured by my hand, my work, my word, upon receipt of the fee agreed. Now to your task, and breed, bull, breed. There he stopped, unable to say more. It was like finding himself at the end of a plank with only the sea and the sharks below. Judge, he was sure, would soon kill him, led by the wiles of his brother Orson, who was surely the god of the Caduceus in another of his disguises. William felt himself to be a fool for never having suspected. There was still so much he wanted to explain, not really to his mad son, but to some imagined jury of his peers. Chiefly he wanted to insist that he was, despite the uses to which he put his powers, a basically good person. Not a saint by any means, but a man with a sound conscience and decent instincts. When he listened to Mozart or Mahler or Bach, he understood what their music was saying. At the sad moments in movies he cried. His soul had not withered or atrophied through the exercise of his power. What he had done through the Caduceus was something that had taken place in a separate moral realm. It was as though he'd been a pilot assigned to bomb a country whose language he could not speak, whose ruins he would never visit. It all seemed so clear to him, so expressible, if only he had not been made mute by the Caduceus's power. Off in another room a bell began ringing and didn't stop. Shit, said Judge, using the bedspread to wipe the blood from his hands. It's the smoke alarm. I forgot all about the microwave. 82. It was as though a chain had been removed, an immense chain of weighty links wound round so tightly and completely that chain and flesh had come to seem one, as sometimes a tree's bark fuses with the chain meant to support a hammock. But at the moment Judge took the caduceus from its hiding place, the chain was shattered and Ned Hill was free. He raised his hand, obedient to his will, and made the living fingers flex almost into a fist. He turned his head toward the door of his room, which stood slightly ajar. He felt as though he were operating an enormous and untrustworthy piece of machinery, a derrick that has stood rusting out of doors for years. Some of the muscles in his neck seemed too weak to support the unsteady mass of the cranium, much less to control its complex motions but it was wonderful that the machinery worked at all, for which the credit was surely owed to Madge's patient patterning exercises. Raising his torso to a sitting position proved to be almost beyond his powers. 
since it was the muscles of his abdomen and lower back that had been exercised the least. At last, by raising his knee up and letting it fall sideways across the other leg, he got into a sideways position in the bed from which he could use his arm's larger strength to tug at the sheets and prod and leverage himself into an upright position. Then he planted his feet on the carpet by the bed, and, keeping a careful grip on the maple spindles of the backboard, he stood up. He took a tentative, shuffling step forward, toward the door, not daring to flex his knees, for fear the whole contraption of bone and muscle would collapse into a helpless heap. His feet were baffling in the constant adjustments and readjustments they required. He wondered how people think of anything else when they were walking than simply how it was done. And then he remembered, dimly, that when he'd been alive and a schoolboy at OLM, there'd been a joke more or less to that effect. And he smiled, not so much at the joke as at the memory of a world where jokes might be made. It was then that the smoke alarm went off in the kitchen, followed a moment later by a confident clattering down the stairs. Great thudding hoofbeats that Ned somehow knew posed a danger to his own safety and to a purpose still unformed. But if unformed, quite clear even so. Each step he took now, each small shift of weight, seemed to be guided toward that necessary and inevitable goal the silent opening of the door, his passage across the corridor and entry into his brother's room. It more surprised Ned to find Billy grown into a man than to see that he was partially disemboweled, even though in a rational way he knew that they had both become adults. But that was by the mere passage of time, while the disembowelment was an act of fate, something ordained and large with justice. Ned did not reason so, but he felt its necessity with a penetrating gratitude. He even found the strength to reach down and take the gluey warmth of the uncoiled intestine in his hand. As he did so, more of it unraveled from the bleeding abdominal cavity. His brother did not stir. It seemed fitting to Ned that if he were now released from his long paralysis, that the agent of his torments should take his place. It is every prisoner's most fervent prayer to witness such a moral symmetry, to hold a knife to the throat of the guard he most detests and trace a line of blood across the flesh. Then he saw, just inches from his brother's fingertips, the cause of all these events, the caduceus he'd made himself from a twisted stick and the withered corpse of a sparrow and a bit of twine. His for the taking. Grasp it firmly, and with the whisper of the wish he would be strong again, nor need he fear, as he knew he must, whoever it was who'd gone hurtling down the stairs. Yet he saw as well that if he did take up the caduceus and use it, it would be as though he'd become just the thing he hated, as though he'd caught hold of an endless bowel spilling out of an eternal wound and could not release it. He would be glued to its evil until it became part of him intrinsic and invisible. He did not take the caduceus, but instead, with wonderful dexterity, slipped his brother's sticky intestines into his own unresisting fingers. He left that room and returned to his own just in time to escape the attention of the young man now returning to William's bedside, bearing, Ned only had a glimpse of it, a large roast of meat steaming on a platter. But the glimpse was enough. Ned knew now clearly what he must do. He must burn down the house with William and the caduceus in it. Which meant that he must make his way downstairs. There had always been a box of matches on the mantel above the fireplace. The stairs posed a greater physical challenge than he'd foreseen. To throw his foot into the void before him and expect his knee not to collapse at the moment of impact on the tread below seemed a feat as much beyond his present powers as walking a tightrope. After some long time, poised on the brink of this impossibility, he came to the same solution every arthritic octogenarian reaches. He turned round and, with the banister's help, got down the stairs backwards, as down a ladder. There was an arrangement of dried flowers in the fireplace, and no longer any box of matches on the mantel above. On the kitchen table he found the smoke detector, its battery ripped out to silence it. The air reeked of burnt meat. For a little while he regarded a large, dark, box-like appliance on the formica counter, which seemed, from the mess all about it and crusted to it, to have been used to cook the meat. A kind of miniature oven. 
the stove was electric, and nowhere could he find matches. But this posed less of a problem than the staircase. He found a jar of cooking oil in the cupboard. It was as much weight as he could manage with both hands, and with it doused a broom, which he found, just where it should be, in the broom closet. He depressed the high button for the front right burner on the stove, and waited till the coils were glowing red. The broom straw ignited almost as soon as he touched it to the burner. He torched the kitchen curtains first, and then methodically he went about the dining room and living room, setting fire to whatever looked like ready tinder. The lace covering on the dining table, the dried flowers in the fireplace, the curtains, but they refused to catch. The flames leapt up eagerly at first, but then they seemed to possess no power of contagion, dying away without setting anything more substantial on fire. The room was full of smoke, but his torch was extinguished, and the only flames were a faint blue flickering across the top of the dining-room table. Madge, screeched a familiar voice. Madge, are you out there? I think something must be on fire. Madge, can you hear me over this microphone? Madge, damn it, answer me. I'm sure there's smoke in the air, and I know I heard the alarm go off. Madge, how do I get this so-called security system to open my door? Madge! Then, just when he supposed his efforts at arson had failed, the back of the upholstered platform rocker burst into flame, and a moment later the lampshade above it was burning, and then a hanging plant. Madge! Grandma O's voice was choked. I know there's a fire, and the phone is dead. Madge! Ned returned to the kitchen and took up the heavy bottle of Wesson oil. He poured some into a cup and set the cup atop the stove and tipped it over so the oil flowed toward the red-hot coils. Without waiting for that oil to catch, he took the bottle into the living room and doused the carpet all about the burning platform rocker and made a trail from there to the couch. He mounted with effort the four lowest steps of the staircase and splashed oil from the bottle, which was much lighter now, onto the banister and the runner and the wall alongside the stairs. Then he tried to leave by the front door, but he did not know the combination any more than Mrs. Obstschmecker that had to be punched into the keypad of the security system. He'd scarcely had time to register dismay before the smoke got to him. 83. The clouds had thickened across the sky so that the moon appeared only in glimpses, and it seemed, because of the erratic motion of the rented canoe, to peek out from a different quarter of the sky each time Launce looked up from the task of paddling. He'd remembered canoeing as effortless, a kind of slow luge that required only the feathering of the paddle to point it in the right direction. This canoe took all the strength he could muster and Madge's efforts at the front of the boat were so mismatched to his own that they were constantly veering off in an unintended direction. Finally he had to ask for mercy. His shoulders just couldn't take any more. Were the canoes always as big as this? Madge wondered as she tucked her paddle under the seat. It was the lake, so dark. It's the clouds, I suppose. I'm so thirsty, and I feel like I'm burning alive. My back is all pins and needles. I didn't think we were out in the sun that long. It was at just that moment that the smoldering platform rocker burst into flame. You want me to open the last bottle? More than anything in this world. Launce laid his paddle down on the ribs of the canoe's bottom and twisted around to reach for the bag from the liquor store. He split the red aluminum foil seal and peeled it from the top of the bottle. It was slow work, and the effort of inserting the corkscrew of his Swiss Army knife into the bottle's cork proved even more taxing. "'Want me to do it?' Madge asked, trying not to show her impatience. "'No, that's okay.' But it wasn't okay. The cork wouldn't budge, nor would the door of the Obstschmecker house, which Ned at that moment found himself unable to open. Not when he held the bottle under his left arm and tugged at the corkscrew with his right hand, and not when he braced the bottle between his thighs. The only results of his efforts was a sudden urgency to get to a toilet. Really, Madge insisted, let me do it. She reached forward and took bottle and corkscrew from Launce. Her first effort was no more successful than his. It's really in there. She tried again with the bottle between her legs. It doesn't budge. She stood up. Madge, 
Launce said cautioningly. Don't worry, I'm steady. I just need to get the leverage. At just the moment Ned died, asphyxiated on the floor of the burning house, the cork came out of the bottle. Madge went over one side of the canoe and Launce over the other. She vowed to herself long ago that she would do everything she could to outlive Ned. Though she would never know it, she'd been faithful to her vow. She was able, by clinging to the side of the capsized canoe, to polish off half the bottle before her strength finally gave out. She enjoyed every blessed drop. 84. The fires of Pentecost were burning all around him, a curtain of bright orange flames, spiritual fires by the light of which Judge could see the glory promised to those like himself who were washed in the blood of the Lamb. He was standing smack dab in the middle of the valley of death, with fire to the right of him and fire to the left, but he feared no evil, because the Lord God was there beside him and inside him. He was seized in his rapture and squeezed in his hand till he had to shout aloud from the joy of it. Praise God! Glory! Hallelujah! And still the flames grew brighter and leapt higher, climbing the trellised roses of the wallpaper, and writhing about entrails that spilled over the edge of the altar, prepared by the power of judges' faith and the wrath of Almighty God. A sweet smoke rose from the sacrifice, as from a bed of spices or a barbecue. And then the lips of the charred head parted, and the mouth gaped wide like a second smaller wound within the larger wound where Judge had crammed it into the gutted belly of the sin offering like a battery inside a flashlight's cavity, and the lips spoke to him in the language of Pentecost, which he alone could understand. You are mine. All yours, Judge agreed. Hallelujah! Though there was in that hallelujah a faint uncertainty, a wavering, a diminishment of rapture, for even as he looked at it, the blackened face of the sacrifice shifted and changed to become the face so well known to him from all their hours of communion together yet not Brother Orson's either wholly, but also his own. Mine entirely, the severed head insisted, with a wink of its blistered eyelid over the hollow socket. It was as though he were looking at his own corrupted flesh, as though the promise so long and so certainly promised him had been withdrawn, and in its place only a plate of worms and maggots. And in that moment he knew the flames of the fire about him were not the flames of Pentecost, not of the spirit only, but a physical fire that was licking at the walls around him and searing his own flesh. You need not feel the flames, the face before him promised. All their heat will be as cool lotion to your skin, if you will only take up the caduceus and worship me. But quickly, you have only a little time before the caduceus itself is consumed. Judge took up the caduceus from where it lay on the smoldering bed. Repeat after me, Thou, Mercury, art my God, I place my being in thy care. Judge shook his head. You must say the words, I cannot help you otherwise. You are not my God, Judge protested fiercely. My God is the God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the burning fiery furnace, and he'll deliver me now, because I believe in him, and that's his promise to those who do. You have never believed in anyone but me, you deluded, ignorant, redneck asshole, and I'm the only hope you have left, not for eternity, only for this moment's anesthetic. Now kneel and adore me, or if you prefer, die in agony. The fire was all around him, inescapable. There was a terrible smell of burning meat as the flames reached his father's corpse and began to crisp its skin. Judge Nelton closed his eyes and repeated the words of his damnation. Thou, Mercury, art my God, I place my being in thy care. Now I lay my soul in pawn. Now I lay my soul in pawn. This upon thy staff I swear. It was too much. He would not do it. Though all his life had been a lie, and this false God the very core of that lie, he would not commit this last abject abomination. He thrust the caduceus into the flames rising from the bed, and held it there until it had been consumed, a burnt offering such as the law demands. Epilogue Ms. Winklemeyer, the doctor's receptionist called out, looking up from her switchboard toward the ceiling, as though she would not venture to guess which of the three people in the waiting room, Judith, Henry, or her lawyer, might be the Ms. Winklemeyer in question. 
Judith stood up, and the lawyer leaned forward in his chair by way of indicating his willingness to accompany her into the doctor's office. She signaled by a curt shake of her head that that wouldn't be necessary. "'I won't be gone long,' she assured Henry, who did not look up from the puzzle cube in his hands. The assurance might well have been more for her own sake than the boy's. The last time she'd been here at Willowville Memorial Hospital, she'd been kept in communicado for two days and in quarantine for another week, not exactly the treatment one expects after almost being murdered. Her lawyer had assured her that even if the hospital had acted at the behest of the police, she had good grounds for a suit. But Judith did not have a litigious nature, and indeed was secretly grateful for having been spared the very worst of the news for so long. Had she known, in the days immediately afterwards, the extent of the horrors that had taken place, she might well not have been able to recover so quickly from her own traumas. However, it helped to have the hospital's director think that she had such legal leverage, since it had allowed her to postpone the date of this meeting these many months, and to set the agenda for what she would and would not discuss. If there were matters that she must be informed of, as the director insisted there were, and if these could not be imparted in a letter or over the phone, she was willing to receive that information, but she felt no answering obligation to satisfy his curiosity. In any case, she had no idea why Judge had done what he had done. It was not even certain that he had done it, at least not with regard to setting the house on fire. At first the police had thought the fire had been set by Ned, until it was pointed out that he had been in a state of coma since childhood. There had been so many horrors, and some of them so inexplicable. The decapitated head that had been identified as that of a northern Minnesota farmer, one Ray Bonner, that at last the prosecutors had given up trying to reconstruct the precise order in which judges' horrors had been perpetrated. As to his motives, what possible motive but total lunacy could there ever be for such actions? The director's office bore a generic resemblance to all such, with decor that served no practical purpose but ritual expense. Walls of never-to-be-read leather-bound books, a single abstract oil, crisp-edged organic forms in soothing earth tones, three-framed diplomas, in case anyone doubted the man's bona fides, and a concealed bar that had already been swung into sight by way of declaring the director's and the hospital's willingness to forget and be forgotten. Dr. Sakovich introduced himself and offered his formal regrets for Judith's treatment by the hospital, speaking with a constraint and stiffness that Judith found more congenial than the smoother maneuvers of a PR expert. He was a short, balding, middle-aged man who tried to remedy his general doubtiness with a bold mustache. After the formalities, Dr. Sakovich asked after the children, and Judith explained, somewhat reluctantly, for she didn't see how they were his concern, that Jason Schechner had agreed to adopt the boy named after him. The other twin, Henry, had been staying with Judith at her deceased father's home in Willowville, and would accompany her when she returned, sometime in October, to Florida. And you feel that their separation at this time? They would certainly have stayed together if that had seemed the better course. She did not elaborate. Yes, I'm sure you would not have. I didn't mean to, um, poke my nose in. And, of course, they've been well provided for. The late Dr. Michaels was unusually, um, well, that's none of my business. The reason I insisted on seeing you, Ms. Winklemeyer, has to do with a letter that was found in the Obstschmecker home after the events of June 17th. It had been written quite some time ago and addressed to Dr. Michaels, though he would not have been a doctor when the letter was written. We believe, that is, the police believe, that it was kept in the possession of Dr. Michaels's grandmother for it was discovered in a dresser in the one room of the house that was not destroyed by the fire. It was the police who found it and who opened it. Dr. Sakovich looked down at his desktop and cleared his throat. But because of the nature of its contents, they thought it better that I be the one... I take it that there's some reason why I should be acquainted with what is in that letter? Dr. Sakovich nodded. 
Yes, you should, as Henry's adoptive mother and the other boy's new parents should as well. I'm sorry I couldn't contact you until Mr. Schechner had returned to Cambridge, but the police wouldn't allow us to discuss this matter until a medical determination had been made in the disposition of your son's case. Your older son, that is. Judge. Judith bit her lip. I thought we had agreed, Doctor, that I would not be discussing my son's case, as you put it. Indeed. Well, here is a Xerox of that letter. The police have the original, but they say the paper is too crumbly to bear much handling. Perhaps you should read the letter now, and then if you have any questions. Judith took the four pages of the Xeroxed letter and read the message that, twenty-three years earlier, Henry Michaels had written to his son. April 3rd, 1976 Dear Billy, I hope you never have to read this letter. I wish even more I didn't have to write it. If you are reading it now, it'll probably mean that I'm dead, and that I've been dead for quite a while, since what I guess this is, is a suicide note. Maybe I'll be stronger than I feel right now. Maybe this will turn out to be a false alarm. I hope so. I love you, that's the basic thing. And if I kill myself, that's my own problem. I do love you, though, Billy. You've got to believe that. One way or another, dead or alive, what I've got to tell you is bad news. For both of us. It seems that I've got a fifty-fifty chance of having about the worst goddamn disease in all creation. And if I've got it, there's an additional fifty-fifty chance that you do too. It's called Huntington's Korea. Korea means having spastic-type fits, and the fits can be extreme. I've done research and seen pictures, and I don't want to go into the details here. But believe me, it's awful, and the spastic fits aren't the worst of it. The best you can hope for is that you get locked up in the loony bin before you do something that gets your picture in the paper. There have been a lot of cases where that's happened, where someone just snaps and goes on a killing spree, someone who'd always been sane till that moment. And the damnedest part of it is, there's no way the doctors can tell you beforehand if you've got Huntington's chorea or not. It's in the genes, and you get it from one or the other of your parents. If one of them has it, then your own odds are fifty-fifty, like I said. But, since it usually doesn't hit you till you're around forty or fifty or even later, you don't necessarily find out that you're at risk till you've already had kids of your own. My own dad died before it got to him, killed in Germany in the war, and I only found out that I'm a candidate two weeks ago from my sister-in-law, Louisa. My brother Ed and I were never that close. He went into the Marines when I was still a kid after a big argument with my mother, which never got made up. We met a couple times later on, but didn't get on any better as grown-ups than as kids. Anyhow, when Ed came down with this disease and was hospitalized, they knew from the way that genes worked that I have got a fifty-fifty chance of inheriting it, too. Those may be good odds for poker, but not for staking your life on. I always thought that if I became blind or had something equally awful happen to me, I would take the easy way out but this was a situation I never made any contingency plans for. I haven't told Madge yet, and don't intend to, since we've already agreed we don't want any more kids. But if I do kill myself, I don't want to put you in the position my dad put me and my brother in. He knew it was in his family. Louisa's looked into it and found out he had an aunt and an uncle who got put into asylums when he was a kid, and his dad, my granddad, went off the deep end when my dad was in high school. So my dad knew, and kept it a secret. The thing is, if I'd known, I don't think I'd have become a father. That's a terrible thing for a man to say to his own son, but think about it. Because you're in the same situation, or you will be when you get this letter. Maybe by then genetic research will have progressed to the point where there's a diagnostic test, but I'm not sure if there were such a test that I'd want to take it. If I knew for certain that one day I would inevitably come down with it, then I don't think I'd hesitate at all. I'd just pull the plug. This way I at least have that fifty-fifty chance, and if time goes by and it looks like my flip of the coin was lucky, 
then that will make your odds look better. So maybe for your sake I'll try and hang on, and if I do, then I guess I'll be explaining all this in person. Anyhow, some time or other you've got to be told, because one day soon, assuming you get this when you turn eighteen, you'll be thinking of having kids, and maybe you should think twice. I wish I could think of a positive note to end this letter on, but there isn't any pony in this shit pile, kid. I'm sorry. I love you. Dad. After Judith had finished reading the letter, she pretended for a while longer still to be reading it in order to avoid having to speak with Dr. Sakovich. At last he took the initiative. I would have spared you having to read that until some time later, but the police insisted that both yourself and the Schechners, as the two boys' new parents, be informed as soon as possible. Because you think they're also at risk? Definitely, yes, they are at risk. But if the information in the letter is correct, essentially it is, yes, quite a good account for a layman to have written. Ordinarily it would not be appropriate to become unduly alarmed. Both Dr. Michaels and his father, the writer of the letter, died without having shown any sign of the disease. However, the doctor swiveled his chair sideways to avoid Judith's questioning gaze. Let me be blunt, Ms. Winklemeyer. Your son judges, um, breakdown. Please hear me out. I realize this is a painful subject. Such bizarre behavior is an almost classic manifestation of a variety of Huntington's chorea that strikes in adolescence rather than later in life. In such cases, dementia can be sudden and acute and violent. Dr. Sakovich forced himself to look directly at Judith. I hate to have to ask you this, Ms. Winklemeyer, and it need not become a part of the official record. But was William Michaels the father of your son? It would be pointless for me to deny it, wouldn't it? I'm not asking this question from mere curiosity, Ms. Winklemeyer. I hope you understand that. But this is a matter that has an important bearing on the future lives of Dr. Michaels' sons. Their chances, then, are, as the letter states, fifty-fifty. Judith closed her eyes and tried to pray, but there were no prayers left. Her heart was like the ruins of that burned house, fenced round with nothing left for flames to consume. I am sorry to have had to tell you this, but I must add, for what little it's worth, that the situation today with regard to medical knowledge is not quite what it was when Dr. Michaels' father wrote that letter. There has been no cure for Huntington's chorea, and no immediate prospect of one, but the genetic mechanism by which it is transmitted is now better understood, and there are diagnostic tests available that can indicate with fair certainty whether an individual at risk does or does not bear the gene for the disease. Do you mean that those two boys, now, at their age, could know with certainty that some day— But that's worse. That's a nightmare. In some ways, yes, I have to agree. Medicine did not create Huntington's chorea, Ms. Winklemeyer. It can only investigate it. We draw the map, you might say. I won't allow it. Dr. Sakovich nodded solemnly. No doubt it would be premature to administer such tests at this point. But when Dr. Michaels's sons are older, they should be told. At what age, precisely, is for you and Mr. and Mrs. Schechner to determine amongst yourselves. Then each boy can decide whether he wishes to be tested. Judith stood up. Doctor, if you don't mind, I'd really rather not continue this discussion. As you choose, Ms. Winklemeyer, the doctor said without any change in his businesslike demeanor. Thank you for having come in. I'll see that your lawyer receives the appropriate papers for you to sign. Again, you have my apologies for having imposed on you at a time of such stress. Judith murmured an apology for her outburst, though she might more candidly have thanked the doctor for having relieved her of the immense burden of the guilt she'd felt as the mother of the monster who committed such unthinkable crimes. The gene had come from William, and so the fault was in no way hers, neither as his biological mother nor for having failed in his upbringing. 
With such an assurance, she might begin to feel a sorrow that was not mere bitterness and enfeeblement. While the doctor hesitated whether to offer his hand for a parting handshake, Judith hurried back into the waiting room and there evaded her lawyer's questions by telling him that Dr. Sakovich was waiting to discuss the papers that had to be signed. Then she excused herself and took Henry by the hand and led him out of the hospital and to the car in the parking lot. "'Did the doctor say you were better?' Henry asked as he was buckled into the seat. "'Yes, he did. I'm fit as a fiddle.' Can we go see the house now? Oh, Henry, you don't want to do that. There's nothing to see. The part that didn't burn down has been torn down. There's nothing but a hole in the ground. You said, with the marvelous facility for tears some six-year-olds still possess, Henry began to cry. When did I say that? When Jason got to go to the funeral and I had to stay home. You said you'd drive me to see where the fire was before we went away to Florida but it's at least an hour's drive from here. You promised. She had, in fact, made such a promise, and it would not be an auspicious way to begin their life together if she were to renege on a matter of such symbolic significance. Besides, she was curious herself to see the result of the fire. During the drive, she played a cassette of Couperin's Leçon de Tenebre that must have been the last piece of music Ben had listened to in the car. Henry continued to work the puzzle cube with what seemed an abnormal attention span for a six-year-old. For the rest of their lives together, she realized she would be assessing everything he did in terms of normality or abnormality, sane and insane. The Couperin and the September weather helped settle her nerves, and by the time they'd reached the corner of Calumet and Ludens, with only one wrong turn as they exited the throughway, Judith was feeling much steadier on her pins. An eight-foot-high cyclone fence had been constructed around the property, and the demolition work on the charred shell of the house had been completed, leaving only the gaping L-shaped cavity of the basement and the stumps of the fireplace and of the backyard elm, also a victim of the fire. Already the front lawn, never well cared for, was thick with waist-high weeds. If the fence wasn't there, we could go over and look right inside the basement, Henry noted respectfully. Yes, but the fence is there, so we can't. How long did it take for the fire to burn down the house? I don't know, but probably not very long, or the people wouldn't have been caught inside. I'll bet there was a big explosion, like when a bomb goes off. Jason says if you turn on the stove but don't light it, the house fills up with the gas, and then if someone lights just one match, boom! Henry seemed to take such satisfaction from this explanation that she did not undermine it by pointing out that the stove in the Obstschmecker kitchen had been electric. Her own imaginings of what had happened that day were no more informed, finally, than his. Jason says they all must have gone to sleep first from breathing in the smoke, and they never felt themselves being burned. That's what Uncle Jason told him but I think he just said that to keep Jason from crying all the time. It's impossible to say exactly what happened, Henry. If Jason wants to think that, there's no point arguing with him. It was Jason who started the argument. I'm glad it's him who's going to live with Mr. Schechner and not me. He treats you like you're a baby. Henry glanced sideways to see if this had registered, as it was intended, as a declaration of loyalty to Judith. She knew that this would be the proper moment to give the boy a hug, a kiss, some better assurance than words that he was loved and protected. But the knowledge was mere administrative reflex from years of social work in crisis management. It sprang from no deeper source. In any case, she didn't have the energy to deal with the seatbelts. It was all she could do to shift from park and steer the car along Ludens. At Brower she turned right and drove the six blocks to Brosner Park. There she parked again. Would you like to play in the park for a bit? She suggested to Henry. I just want to sit and think for a while before we drive back to Willowville, okay? Okay, he agreed sullenly. He popped open his seat belt and took up his knapsack with the puzzle cube and followed the dots book and other time-passing toys. How long? he asked, standing outside the car. Five minutes? He looked at his wristwatch. It was not quite 3.30. Okay, I'll be back in five minutes. 
He set off into the park, steering clear of the area around the swings and teeter-totters, which were securely in the possession of a bunch of older black kids. He looked around for somewhere shady to sit, where he could just go on twisting the puzzle cube till he got at least two sides to be the same color, but all the trees seemed to have disappeared. Then the far-off sound of a chainsaw explained what had happened to the trees. They were being cut down. At the other end of the park was a green truck with a ladder on it, like a fire engine, and a man on the ladder was sawing off the branches of one of the few trees that was still left. Ordinarily Henry would have gone over to watch such a process, but that would have meant walking through the playground area with all the black kids. So instead he went in the other direction, up the hill to where the lopped-off limbs of three other trees had already been piled into big stacks. The tree trunks were still in place, like arms reaching up and the fingers of their hands cut off at the knuckle. Henry considered climbing up one of the stacks of wood, but without Jason or someone daring him to, there didn't seem to be much point. Then something on the ground beside the nearest woodpile caught his attention. A stick. There were a lot of sticks all round the woodpile, of course, but somehow this one seemed different. Partly it must have been its twisty shape. Partly something else he couldn't figure out. He picked it up and looked at it more closely. It was about as long as a ruler and almost as straight, and right where his finger would have felt the trigger, if it were a ray gun, was a knob. Some day, although Henry had never told this to anyone yet, not even to Jason, when he grew up he was going to be a fighter pilot in the Air Force. He'd fly a jet with four laser cannons. Like this one. He pretended the stick was his cannon and the knob its trigger. Then he aimed it, with one hundred percent accuracy, at another fighter jet, actually at a robin that had alighted on top of the woodpile, and pulled the trigger, and made a machine-gun sound, and told the robin it was dead. End of the M.D. A Horror Story by Thomas M. Dish Read by Chuck Benson in the studios of Talking Book Publishers, Incorporated, for the Library of Congress, April 1995. For special distribution as authorized by Act of Congress under Public Law 89-522, with the permission of the copyright holder and the publisher, Alfred A. Knopf, Incorporated, New York. End of book.